steps to tackle challenging intraoperative scenarios, post-operative management, and followed by a wet lab session in which you can try hands-on phaco emulsification and cataract surgery in our skill lab. This session will be headed by Professor Jeevan S. Sethyal, Chief RP Center, who also heads Unit 3, Cornea Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services. From Unit 1, we have faculty Professor Sudarshan Khokhar and Dr. Amar Pujari, and our residents, Dr. Deep. Dr. Ninni, Dr. Tanvir, Dr. Navneet, Dr. Neha, Dr. Kusumitha, Dr. Abhijit, Dr. Manu Malli Krishna, and Dr. Preeti. I now invite Professor Jeevan S. Sethyal, Chief RP Center, to groups and start the workshop. The first surgery would be a near life surgery session on refractive surgery. If you could start them. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manpreet, for a kind introduction. On behalf of uh, RP Center family, the faculty, students, staff, we would like to welcome all of you today for this interactive workshop in FACO and refractive surgery. And as Dr. Manpreet nicely highlighted the uh, program for the day, we could begin with the live surgeries. Refractive, we are doing a near live surgery, which gives us enough opportunity for a discussion of. Redo the entire surgery again and again to look into one particular aspect, which may be difficult sometimes in a live surgery because. And most interestingly, for our beginners, we have a wet lab in the afternoon session where we can uh, give them a hands on training by experts who. and Professor Sudarshan Khokhar and Pro Professor Namrata Sharma. If they are busy, they can sit in their chairs, but uh, one person can sit in the other side, Dr. Radhika. Thank you uh, for being
I think the first uh, session uh, we have devised, as I said, is a near life surgery, which we are going to take it from uh, surface ablation to the uh, smile to a fakey gargle, which is a range of refractive error correction uh, which we have in India, abroad, everywhere. The most interesting part of refractive surgery is it's been there for a, such a long time, since the beginning of uh, 20th century. And it's, it's still going on, except for a, a surgery which has gone into out of practice, that is radial keratotomies or laser-based surgeries. That will be PRK, LASIK or SMILE, they are still on. So nothing has changed much, but the new concepts, softwares have changed. So today I'm going to take you through the uh, near life surgery for a PRK, photorefractive keratectomy, which is still being practiced in a large number across the country. And many people take this as a first line of their refractive correction laser base in their patients. The most important part uh, we can understand is this is a flapless surgery. There's no flap in these cases as compared to elastic patients. And more, it, ha it requires the epithelium to be removed. So there are various ways to remove that. Most importantly, I think mechanical removal will be better because that will not harm the underlying structures, uh, which can be done by a spatula, blade, or a rotatory brush. Alcohol assisted has been there for a long time. Uh, we began to do with uh, procedure like LASIK. And now uh, examine laser base, which is a trans epithelial PRK being practiced world over. So let me take you uh, the important uh, consideration. Whenever we are looking for a trans epithelial PRK, which is uh, the epithelium is removed by the examine laser in the PTK mode. The important thing there is to analyze the epithelium of those patients. That is done by anterior segment OCT. If you see here, this is the thickness profile, which is a uniform, and this is the thickness of cornea, and this is the thickness of epithelium. So you can see it is very nicely all around equal, uh, uh, you can say, thickness of epithelium. This is a very good case for a PRK uh, to be done trans epithelium because laser will ablate the epithelium you know, uniformly all across the entire cornea. So this is a good case for doing a PRK. You can see minus 2.5. Mild to moderate refractive errors are good for PRK, though people do for a higher refractive error also. And we're going to take you through the right eye surgery in this patient. So this is the patient on the table. So first thing is uh, we're going to do a uh, epithelial uh, removal. That is examined as assisted deepithelization. So this takes more time than sometimes the ablation of refractive error because the entire epithelium has to be taken away from the center to periphery all around. So you can see this is a laser being fired to remove the epithelium. And the size also is important because uh, sometimes you have a limitation of making the size of a uh, epithelial removal. So that is very important. It has to be larger than the ablation area. So this you can see, this is around 10.5 millimeter we are removing. You can see the gutter being uh, seen in the periphery area. That means the epithelial has been removed properly. Then take away the epithelium by putting. Now the actual ablation will be done in these cases. So surgery per se is a very, uh, you can say, a fast and limited and small one. Towards the end, we put uh, mitomycin C application. The, uh, normally, I take it 10 seconds per diopter correction in these cases. So this was a 2.25, so I'll put for a 20 second in this patient, 0.02% uh, mitomycin C. Towards the end, we put a contact lens. This contact lens is normally soaked in a, uh, you can say, uh, case where you can again as I said I stress all to doing anti segment OCT of uh, PRK patients to look for an epithelial profile so that is very very important you can see here the epithelium is you know quite grossly deviation from center to periphery you can see it is quite a thicker than a 50 55 which is almost touching the 60 micron thickness so these cases may not be suitable for a trans epithelial PRK because you might leave the islands of epithelium and your ablation profile may not be absolutely correct and that might induce improper correction and induce ablation in the post-op period. Such cases may be uh, mechanical removal of epithelium is better in these cases. So we normally would advise these cases. The classical one is doing a alcohol assisted epithelial uh, debridement. So where we do a little mark in the periphery with the uh, trifand or size you require, it can be 8.5 to 9 millimeter. This gentle mark on the epithelium gives the access for alcohol to seep into the uh, sub-epithelial area. Now we'll put a well, which is larger than the, the mark area. This well will hold the alcohol for 20 seconds. So this is a 20% alcohol for 20 seconds, 20-20. So 
and this will be kept there so that you have a uniform diffusion of alcohol and the other area which is not desirable to be removed is not tackled by the alcohol you can see the periphery is not touched where you have a limbal stem cell so this is very important not to let alcohol spill over to the other area towards the 20 second we'll soak out the uh, alcohol let the epithelium be dry after that we can remove the epithelium gently you can see i'm stroking the epithelium periphery because this is the area which has been loosened the whole epithelium will come out in a one single fashion so this was earlier we thought about retaining the epithelial flap also that was a concept earlier for a epilasic or lasix no longer we retain the epithelium nowadays remove the epithelium because the epithelial growth regrowth is faster if you remove the epithelial flap so this is how gently you remove without damaging the deeper stromal area see how clear is the surface here so this is a advantage of uh, using alcohol where you have a smooth surface for ablations of the cheki now once you remove the 8.5 millimeter area now you can ablate the cornea which is dry the surface ablation can be done so these are two ways you can use a mechanical spatula also to remove there are brushes which can remove the epithelium also but they are costly and they are disposable this is simple alcohol does have an association people talk about apoptosis of cells may be there but whatever we have done in past we have done quite well without any association problems same contact lens we put after the surgery and make sure these patients are seen subsequently in the next day also because they can have pain painkiller may be uh, given to these patients for longer period and the steroid should be given longer than a lasix or a smile patient that is very important maybe the people give steroid for three to six months also in a tapering doses or a light steroid for a long time because uh, surface haze, stromal haze is the major concern for a PRK patient. Thank you for uh, this part and uh, we can shift to the elastic area. In the meantime, any question, we'll answer that. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would be uh, talking to you about the near eye surgery, and that is Centura LASIK. And I would, uh, this was actually a live surgery which was uh, recorded for uh, another meeting. So, uh, this is basically to show that we have this machine in which we do Centura, that is Alcon. Uh, So we do contour on this machine that is uh, Alcon Wavelight FS200 which is used to create the flap and EX500 which is used to uh, actually uh, uh, do the LASIK. The planning is done on a vario topolizer and uh, uh, the planning is done beforehand only for that the patient images have to be captured and this is just to show how we capture the images of the patient. Uh, they should be done in less than four seconds and four to seven images are captured. And then we have to look for the quality of the image. The image should be such that we have encompass at least 6.5 millimeters of optic zone and 90% uh, consistency uh, should be there in all the images. The vario topolizer actually uses the placebo disk based system. And in this, uh, we've already captured these images and we have to look at this image. For instance, in this, you see this red area, which means that there is a data gap here. So we will discard this image, will not be taken. So we take an image in which there are no data gaps present and I think the most important part of Contura is capturing of the images and it may or may not be possible for all cases and so for all cases you may or may not be able to do Contura. Now this is again the uh, second image which is being captured. So we have four to five images which are there for one eye and, and then you have to match this. For instance, you take four images, they should be within 0 0.75 diopters of each other. So these are the four images which have been taken here and which have been imported and they have to be 0 0.75 diopters uh, of each other. So again, we will again match them on the uh, topolizer to see whether uh, they are uh, within 0 0.75 diopters or not. 
So for instance, the one image of this has been now matched with the two second image. And uh, you can see here that there is a red spot area here which is present, which is more than 0.75 diopters. So this is going to be discarded. And uh, we will then take another image and again, uh, likewise, uh, compare one with two, one with three, one with four, then two with three, two with. So likewise, we have to actually, all the four images that we take here should be within 0 0.75 diopters. Now, for instance, now this, if you see, this is within 0 0.75 diopters. So this image will be taken up. Uh, I'm laying a little more stress on this. Now again, notice that this is more than 0.75 diopter. You have a red area also here. So this image will be discarded. Because capturing is the most important thing in contour. And if you're not able to do that, then you may not be able to do the surgery at all. So uh, and Contura is, like, is about the planning. It is not about uh, the LASIK itself, because the procedure is pretty much the same. So once you've taken the images which are similar to each other, uh, and likewise, we also capture for the right and the left eye both, then through the uh, proprietary wave net which is present, this entire data is uh, imported onto the uh, EX500 machine. And this is the FS200, which is being used to make the uh, LASIK flap, which will be made pretty much the same way as you would do a normal LASIK. So the patient interface is uh, put in uh, there. And this is uh, 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 first uh, followed by the application of the suction ring. And then the whole, uh, uh, whole uh, gaventry moves down uh, so that you actually have the suction there. And the femtosecond uh, uh, laser is then activated so that you uh, create a flap with the help of the femtosecond laser. Now, after this flap is created, the suction is released. And uh, after releasing the suction, it, it's a single bed which is there. So the single bed swivels between the uh, uh, FS, uh, uh, the femtosecond laser, and the, uh, uh, the eczema laser. So uh, after doing this, this is just to show the patient lies on the same bed. And this, again, the data is again imported here to see uh, from the uh, uh, wave net. And this is on the EX500. And this particular uh, image is again being discarded because uh, it is uh, not within the uh, accepted uh, realm. And this is how you actually uh, feed the data. Uh, that is to say that you have to feed the sphere, the cylinder, and the pachymetry that is there. And the optic zone uh, also needs to be uh, seen. You can either do at 5.5 or 6.5. We like to do 6.5. So this will be the ablation profile. And notice that this is only a cylinder. So in three dimensions, the ablation profile looks like this. And uh, uh, then uh, subsequently, after this data is confirmed, we uh, go on to do the laser ablation. Now, this is for the other eye. Again, in this particular, uh, in this particular image, the data gaps are, are more. So this image will be discarded. And there is uh, something which is, which is called as the uh, refraction which we feed. Then you have the, uh, the measured, uh, uh, measured cylinder or the measured refraction, which is actually what you get on the topolizer and which takes into consideration the Zernike polymerase. And the third thing is that, again, we have to feed depending upon whether there is a difference between manifest and measured uh, cylinder or not. And that is our uh, modified refraction. And there is a for formula for it, which is given by the manufacturer, depending upon whether it is less or whether it is more the uh, modified uh, refraction would change. So uh, this is to show the second eye. And notice in this, you are only treating the sphere. So the ablation profile will also look spherical. And unlike the previous one, which was looking a little elongated, because there we were treating a pure cylinder. And uh, this is the ablation profile. So uh, after that, there is nothing much to it, except that uh, we uh, move, uh, we uh, uh, get the patient to focus, and uh, there are two these uh, red lights which are present, which cross the center, and they move towards the periphery, and the patient looks at the green light, and you have to get all both the reds and the green um, into uh, a single uh, alignment. Uh, then this is with the help of the uh, flap elevator. The flap is elevated, followed by the uh, laser ablation, uh, which is then done. So. This is the laser ablation which is being done. And the flap is being protected uh, with the help of the flap protractor. Uh, and once you get all of them into position, the laser ablation is done. This is followed by the uh, uh, 
by the flap reposition, which is done at the back. And for this, the fluid may be present, maybe a little bit of fluid is smeared onto the surface, not too much, otherwise everything will come onto the interface. And then uh, with the help of the jet of uh, fluid, you put the flap back. And of course, uh, see, ensure that there is a, a position which is there. Now, uh, just when to avoid contura, these are the uh, guidelines which are given by the manufacturer when you should not, or when you should not do a contour elastic. And uh, this is how the modified refraction is fed, depending upon uh, the disparity between the, um, the refraction, which is done, as well as the measured, uh, uh, measured refraction, which is done on your topolizer. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Namrata. Uh, in the meantime, we'll request uh, Professor Sudarshan to put up his uh, presentation. Uh, you can use this mic, uh, Namrata. You can yes. Uh, I think very nicely highlighted the uh, topo guided treatment, uh, which is uh, in vogue for the last now almost, I know, decade. Uh, and it's been there for a long, long time. And people have now uh, looked into a various aspects of improving the outcome for these cases. So in your experience, uh, Dr. Namrata, you highlighted which are those cases where uh, they'll be suitable for a topo guided treatment and which are those cases may not be suitable as such uh, for a topo guided treatment. And uh, in terms of uh, ultimate outcome wise, it, it does it make a really difference to have this contura treatment for these patients? Uh, for primary eyes, maybe it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect much. But for odd cases like decentered ablations, like we've done three cases of decentered ablations, which are referred from outside, it does help to uh, make the uh, uncorrected visual acuity better, and it does take care of the uh, uh, the uh, the visual problems the patient may have, which includes uh, glares and halos. But uh, otherwise, I think in primary eyes, it 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 really doesn't make too much of a difference. Having said this, people have even done topo guided ablations now for keratoconus, and we have not done contura for keratoconus, but we have also done topo guided uh, ablations for keratoconus, and I think there also again it works well. Yeah, I think that was the initial, you know, uh, purpose of a topo guided treatment when it came for a, you know, irregular corneas to begin with. Now, uh, because the new software they are trying to do in a normal corneas also, is there any software which can increase the people acceptance for a to uh, topo guided treatment? There's another software which has come, which is uh, uh, again proprietary, and that is the Fossilies uh, software, which is supposed to be better than the software which is given by the Icon company. Of course, we've not tried it, but the results of that are uh, supposed to be better. Okay, thank you, Namata. Any questions from the house? I think next uh, talk is also similar, so we can have more questions subsequently. Okay. Thank you, Namrata. Thank you, Professor. We have yeah. now uh, Professor Sudarshan Kokar, who heads the uh, Unit 1, Refractive uh, Pediatric Cataract, and the uh, Retina Services also. Hmm. Maybe a complete uh, unit of itself. It's a full and package. And he's yeah. a master in a refractive surgery, and he'd like to take us through the uh, thin and thinnest flap uh, elastic. Okay, so th thank you, Dr. Titiyal. So when the Contura hits the, hit the market, people want to do get Contura. Right, left, and center, people walk up to you and say Contura, and they don't even know the spelling of Contura, right? So it's basically media-driven thing. So Contura means that do you have to buy this, uh, this machine, Alcon? If you have, a, say, a, a Nidec or a, a Schmidt or any other machine, can you still do a to topo-guided? It's basically a topo-guided method of delivering the, last, uh, the delivering the laser, right, on Eximer. So any Eximer machine which is produced has a FDA-approved data for a limit for which you can do a topo guided. So what are the other ways? You have wavefront guided and wave, wavefront customized. These are the two which everybody uses. I, 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 are you guys with me? Everybody uses wavefront. So for topograph uh, guided thing, you have to buy another machine called topolizer. So each machine will come with a topolizer. So it picks up the errors and the defects on the surface. So you're trying to make the contour smoother. So most of these will have two uh, platforms. One is called a, a topo smooth, in which it won't impart the power to the cornea, but it'll take the corneal smoothness. It'll take all the irregularity away. The second is a topo-guided LASIK surgery, which is what we'll be discussing. So we recently got this machine about a three, four years back, Mel90, which is a Zeiss uh, uh, machine and no, no financial interest. 
So we worked up on that and we realized that why can't we do a Contura on this machine? A Contura, I, I won't want, want to use Contura, the thing is topo guided. Even Contura is, uh, is something you want to go buy something, say you want to buy tea. You don't say give him brook bond. You know, when you say brook bond, it becomes a specific uh, uh, for that company only, right? So a paste is a paste. It could be Colgate, it could be Binaka, whatever. Similarly, this topo guided could be a Contura or any other machine will have it. Even a Bell 90, which is an older model, still has a topo guided. So what do you do in topo guided is what I'm going to be talking about. And we did a comparative study in two, three ways. One, what is the pickup rate on the topolizer? The topolizer of uh, Alcon is a very strict topolizer and it doesn't allow you any image to go through. At the, at the same time, maybe uh, in a good hands, you have an 80% pickup and 20% patients that still you, you can't fit in. Whereas if you use the Atlas, which is used for Zeiss, it can pick up about 99% of these patients. And you can pick up the image which you want and you can actually put a manifest refraction along with that and get good results. And that's what we're doing for the last six months and got good results. Okay, so let's go. This is a 24 year male and he wanted a refractive surgery and he came with this contour in his mind. So we talked to him that we'll do the same procedure but on a different mach machine and he gave us a consent, okay. Six, it was minus six is a little higher refraction, minus six to the point, uh, point six, and the PTA was coming to be within normal range, so we went for the surgery. These are the pre-op maps, you can see they're looking healthy. So it could have gone to any of them, and this uh, Ben and Ambrosio also looks pretty good in this one. Other thing we do in all these patients at RP Center is we do a corvus in these one. A corvus is in which a puff of air comes and distorts your cornea, and the cornea bounces back. So this is called the corvus index, okay, CBI. Corvus biomechanical index. It's not the CBI which the government uses to put the black money out from your houses. It is a, not the, that CBI, this is other CBI. And the other is a TBI which is a, to, a topography. So what are the changes of topography when the air puff hits the cornea and recoils back? So these two parameters will tell you how strong your cornea is. Okay, you remember there was a system called Aura earlier which used to check the corneal hysteresis. So this is act actually I think 10, 20 times better than that and it's more specific. So we do that in all the refractive surgeries at the center. So if you want to see the machine, you can come to the lab and use it, and you can see how it works, okay. So other thing we do is uh, eye trace in these patients to find out what is the total uh, error versus what is the corneal problem which you're having. So if you notice, do I have a marker here? This is the corneal astigmatism, uh, this is the total astigmatism, and this is the corneal astigmatism. So see right and left eye, there's a difference in both. So this was a patient in which we actually went ahead and did a contura because there was a, a corneal, cornea was not very smooth in this patient. So this is how we do. Now, that since Dr. Namrata showed you the uh, the capture of that, I like to show this capture also. This is much easier, and this is how you do, you do it. You see the sixth and the seventh ring, seventh, eighth, and eighth, ninth ring. Once the distance is equal, it will capture. So now this image, once the distance between the seventh and the eighth ring and eighth and ninth, ninth ring, they become equal, it will capture on its own. So that it's got it now. And it gives you four images immediately, and all are high quality, and all are passing the eligibility. So that's the beauty of this system. Have you used the, uh, both the topolizer, any topolizer, anybody, hands up? The delegates, please. Okay, you see, which one are you using? Okay, the so same one, which is wrong. So could you get, get capture on all the machines, all, all cases, for topo? You're lucky. We can't do that on all. You have to put spacer in the front and the back on the side. Even world over, they say it, the pickup rate is never going to be more than 80%, with the best of the hands. So if you're picking up, are you you're very good? Are you very lucky? Okay, so you got four images and all are looking similar. If you see the data, there's hardly an error from one to another to third or fourth, so you can pick up any of these, they all are good. Then it goes to the planning system, and that's the system still outside. So this tells you that, can I have a pointer, please? It tells you that this is kind of ablation which will happen in these patients. Can you put a pointer here, please? So this is what is there till the patient is gone in. Now, once the patient goes in, and this is you, and we don't have online, we take it on a pen drive and put a pen drive onto the machine, it works the same way. So, but make sure that if you have too many patients, you don't jumble the data from one to another. And this is now on the system. On the system, the patient, this was done a day before. It wasn't live, so that's why the recording is not 4K. Like Dr. Namrata's recording was live, so it was very high quality. So this is what, now you've seen that this, the same data has come onto the machine here. Can I have a pointer, please? Is it lying somewhere here? I know, but oh, then the machine <laughs> goes away, I know. Okay, so it's giving you 24 seconds. Now the only problem with this machine is that it works on 250 hertz, so it's slower to go. Whereas the elastic uh, Alcon machine runs at 500 hertz, so it's faster. So it's taking 24 seconds, 21, 24 seconds for six diopters. 
meaning that the patient has to be looking into the center and you have to talk to the patient. That's the only time we just feel if it's not good, it's not going to work. It might have a little error. So if you can get over with that one, now this is the data which in the PDF format it tells you what is the, so first I'm going to put the patient on, on Visimax to make a flap. We don't use bla blades here at all. I'm sure 90% of you are using blades. If you're using blades, you're not doing anything wrong. The only thing if you want to be more precise, it's best to switch over to Tempto if you can afford it. So this is what a Visimax machine is and the, uh, I'm going to center it and you check the centering by going on infrared, which is the advantage here. So you know that you're centered properly. So once you're centered properly, okay, thank you. Okay. So once it's centered properly, it starts. Now this was 80 micron, I think, 80, 100. This was 100, otherwise you're routinely doing 80 micron. So you can actually see the, the pattern here of the cut and you have a side cut. Okay, so that's how it goes. And then we switch over the patient to the other machine, which is Mel90, which is Eximer now. And on that, we raise this flap. And once you raise this flap, I'll go a little fast, my time is going up. Okay, the second thing we notice is when you're doing it on, on a Visimax versus a, a FS200, which is an Alcon machine, the cut is very smoother and you can easily pick up on Alcon, Alcon, on Alcon uh, machine. But then the chance of dislodgement is also higher. This one is a little difficult to pick up, but it sticks much better. And that's what I think anybody can do a comparison and see. So once you dry the surface, so you cut it when it's wet and you zap it when it's dry. So fry when it's dry and cut when it's wet, okay? So the cornea has to be cut, femto has to be has to be moist. If it's dry, you'll get dark patches and the laser will not fire there. And one, once you want to do the zap, now this is what we're using, a topo-guided one. How do you make a topo-guided? Because the spots go actually beyond the central zone, whereas if you do a customized, it'll stick around to the central about 6, 6.5 millimeter. So that's why uh, when Namrata is showing you that protection of the flap, which is important, if you're doing a cultura or a surf topo-guided, because it can go to the periphery and come back also, all right? So that's the difference. Otherwise, in most of the cases, when the flap is 8.1, you don't have to protect the flap as such. And once you put it back, and that's about it. And there's nothing, no difference in this one. The rest procedure is same. So this is a poster pentag, which was done yesterday because surgery was done day before. And this is what it looks now in the post-op. And the patient is six by six, unaided, both eyes. And this is not the first patient. We must have done around 40, 45 patients. On this machine, with a topo guided, and I believe I talked to people outside, even the Schmidt, other machines also have the same platform. People are working on that, but they're not able to counter the patient by telling them that the same procedure as uh, you buy a Brook or a, a, a maybe a Colgate or a Contura for that matter. Thank you very much. Any questions we have, I'm willing to answer that. Thank you, uh, Professor Sudarshan. Uh, very nice presentation. I think he nicely pointed out that uh, we do have uh, systems where you can do a topo guided treatment. Uh, apart from the uh, wave light uh, from Alcon, we do have uh, strand, which also gives you a nice topo guided treatment. Similarly, MEL 90 can also be used for a topo guided treatment also. It all depends uh, what type of patient we are dealing with and what we want to achieve. Which, uh, now with the, both the presentation, we realize we need to really assess the surface in terms of uh, irregularities, in terms of uh, aberrations, then you plan, and most importantly, the refractive manifest refraction, as well as the refraction coming from the topolizer should be matching. If that matches, that's a very nice case for our topo added treatment also. But classically, yes, uh, we have been doing earlier before all these, you know, uh, refractive correction, topo added surface irregularity treatment was there. That was termed as the T-CAT in those days. And we did, uh, uh, you know, some uh, work in those areas also. Dr. Sudarshan has done a comparative studies also. Uh, we would like to know if we can highlight uh, the results yeah, of sure. those cases. I think the both the groups were, uh, it was non-inferior inferior, uh, study, so there was no difference at all. Actually, we found out that the higher order abrasion which were induced were more on a, a, on a, a Alcon platform as compared to the Zeiss one. So that's what we realized. Although they were borderline, but they were higher, the other ones were more, much smoother. The second thing, what uh, Dr. Chityal mentioned is, if your cornea is a borderline, it's best to go for a wave front guided or optimized rather than going for topo. Topo might take a little more. If you cut more, then the depth of the ablation goes a little higher. If you stay in the center, it cuts less. I think all of you should know the Mullins equation, which was used for the eczema. So that holds true here also. Although it's become a little, uh, it's not point to point you can add put on to this uh, procedure, not topo, but it still does make a difference. The more periphery you cut, you cut deeper. That's why when the eczema started, when the PRK started, they used to take minus 12, minus 10 out of the cornea. 
right in the center, 4 millimeter, 5 millimeter. So once the pupil is mid-dilated, there could be a sunburst and patients are literally blind, needing pilocarpine in the, in the nighttime when they were driving. So once you've gone bigger, ablation zone and you have a knuck, you have a knee and the normal tissue to the ablated tissue, you have to have a, a smooth transition. So that's what we're trying to do. So the more you go to the periphery, you cut more tissue. So when you, whenever you're planning to do these topo guided things, make sure that your uh, PTA is good. It should be less than 40, uh, 35, 40. Don't go for ones which are close to 40, where it might cro cross over. So your RBT might become a little less. You might lose more tissue each diopter for a topo as compared to a wave guided or, or optimized. Is that clear? Okay. Thank you. Any comments, uh, Dr. Rajkin? Yamu sir? Who can have your mic? Uh, because there would be, because you can't capture contura for all, but but yeah, this yeah. you can capture for yeah, all. Yeah, and all of them we did it. So what the, I mean, I can't say how much exactly, it takes more time first, because it's a lower, spe lower frequency, it's a 7250 megahertz. But the end results, one day, one week, and one month, they all are same. So it's the same, and the better, uh, you can see it better from, uh, I think the, our machines, the microscope is better than the MEN90 as compared to the, uh, I don't know, maybe it's gone older, that's why the, EX500 is not that clear, but yes, whatever we got results, we it was at compared comparable. I mean, we can't say which one is superior. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Sudarshan and Namrata. Indeed, uh, we all understand we have to move uh, towards advancement. Maybe uh, these, you uh, know, topo guided wavefront guided treatment may be a, a futuristic point of view if we have some sort of artificial intelligence also attached to this to give you a nice correction for these difficult cases. The other area of uh, interest for a laser refractive procedure has been uh, for last one decade is uh, small incision lenticular extraction, where we don't make the flap and just the, you know, uh, we raise the cap in fact and take out the lenticule from inside. And this is uh, another, you know, we can say, uh, armamentarium in your refractive procedures where you feel you have advantage over the uh, surface ablation or the uh, uh, LASIK, which has been the, uh, you can say, mainstay of treatment for examine laser as such. Less dry eyes, which has uh, been propagated, and more stability in terms of corneal strength wise because you are not raising the flap in this case. But the amount of uh, refractive correction Amount of a tissue which has been, uh, which is lost uh, because of ablation or a lenticule is almost similar. The indication, contraindication remains similar to elastic patients. No financial disclosure from my side in this particular uh, presentation. And as we talked about the initial two presentation or topo guided treatment, the, the uh, profile of a patient has to be nicely assessed for any refractive surgery. Same holds true for our smile also as I talked about. This is a patient. 24-year-old uh, male patient with refractive error, a uh, nice one, 2.25 with 0.5 cell, and uh, corneal thickness is normal, and uh, both right and left eye. We are going to show your right eye surgery to begin with first, and topography is absolutely normal in these cases. So this is surgery which we have been rec uh, re we recorded earlier and uh, presented in our various forums. So I'll just show you these two important things. So it has two, uh, you can say, a system. This is the older version. This is uh, 500. Now, Giles has come up with the 800, uh, where we have a, a device which is fixed. In fact, the bed is fixed. Here, the bed has to move towards the, uh, the entire uh, laser uh, system. So you can see the bed is move, being moved to the laser system. So this bed will uh, has to be moved uh, here, from here to here, so that patient is placed here, then subsequently taken here. Next important thing is feeding the appropriate data into the machine, uh, which you have the monitor here, where you will feed the refractive error patient's uh, characterometry profile. This is a thing which we feed in these cases. You can see this patient, uh, the corneal vertex section is 12, and uh, this is a refractive we talked about. The diameter of, uh, you know, uh, corneal radius is 7.4. The mean K has to be, and pachymetry has to be attached. This is a routine profile which we will be seeing in these patients. So normally it is 7.3 is the uh, diameter of the cap, and this is the uh, optical zone, 6.3 and the energy which we use and the flap thickness, that is the cap thickness, can be 120, 100 also. So this all has to be feeded very appropriately and you re recheck before you initiate the surgery in these patients. So this feeding is very, very important and make sure it is the right patient. 
So this is also an important parameter. I will just go back a little bit because uh, I think uh, it, these are very, very important. Now, this energy setting is also uh, different in a different setup sometimes. We started with 30, 31 energy setting. I came down to 29. Some of my colleagues may be using a different uh, energy setting depending on the case scenarios. So you need to really assess your uh, environment, your machine, and adjust your uh, energy level in these cases. Otherwise, these track distance and spot distance are normally constant. We don't change that much because these are uh, almost similarly placed in almost all systems. So this is what we can change and in the expert mode. So uh, if you see into our surgery wise, it is simpler. Only thing learning curve may be there. This is the interface which is required. Small, medium, and larger size, three size uh, interface is seen. You can see it is attached to the device. And this patient contact lens is uh, attached to the laser head. And in a little jerk, this will initiate the calibration. And just wait for a calibration to complete. In the meantime, you can get the patient uh, bed up towards the contact lens interface. The cornea should be moist, you can see, and the sac should be dry. As Lotion talked about wet and dry, same here, the cornea should be nicely moist throughout the cornea, and the sac should be dry. Otherwise, you'll have a wet uh, interface coming and you can have a suction loss. Make sure you have a two-third applination before you start the suction. You can see around two-third application has come up and it's nicely centered. I'll press the button suction and suction will come. So to have a proper section, all these uh, lights should be, uh, four lights should be, you know, visible in these cases. Infrared will give you a nice centration profile. As I talked about, the suction pressure in the spinal is very, very less compared to elastic patients. And you have a high chances of suction loss. And that can only be avoided by a good counseling to your patient and the keeping the sag absolutely dry. So once you have good section, now we'll have a laser application. You can see how laser goes in a diagrammatic representation. This is the lenticule being cut, periphery to center in a spiraling manner. Once it is complete, then you have a side cut. Then will come center to periphery for a cap cut. You can see this is coming now, cent center to periphery in a spiraling manner. And towards the end, we'll have the, the incision side cut here. So these are three or four important laser application which you see quite comfortably. Make sure patient is stable. Don't disturb the patient because little jerk can uh, release the suction and you can have a suction loss in these cases. You release the suction and shift the patient towards the microscope view also now. So this, this is very simple way to look into and it, at this time, you make sure the cornea is uh, wet. Open the incision first, then go to anterior plane. So this is the anterior plane dissection. You can see here very nicely. So this is anterior. Now we are going to posterior plane dissection here. So this is where you can see a little bit of a area. Then we dissect the anterior plane, go smoothly, make sure the central visual axis is first dissected very nicely, then go to periphery. The central dissection has to be absolutely smooth because that's a refractive area. So we are completing the entire uh, dissection all around. Now go to posterior plane, then again dissect the central area. Don't go to periphery too much. Now I'll dissect this six o'clock area first. You can see a meniscus there. That means I have detached the you know lenticule from there. Then come to three o'clock area, create a meniscus there also. The idea here is to have an attachment to a peripheral area so the flap doesn't move to one side. If you dissect one side completely, the flap shifts to one side, then very difficult to dissect out. So this is another area of dissection. For a beginners, this is a good way to learn. Now I'll dissect out the entire periphery ni nicely without fearing the flap going to one side. And you can take out this with the you know uh, movement and take out the entire lenticle out. So most of the time you don't require a faucet to take out also if you have a dissection appropriately. So this is the immediate day one poster. See how clear is the cornea and see the section here. And if you see anterior segment OCT also, your entire uh, cornea will be absolutely clear in these cases. So that's the advantage of doing a uh, you know uh, smile in these patients. This is another patient of uh, same patient the other eye. So we are dissecting the incision again. You can see, don't go too much anterior. This is the anterior dissection, and this is the posterior dissection. So you can see this meniscus sign tells you that you are, you are in the two planes. So this is very important to realize you already have a two planes. Now this dissection, you can see again, I'm doing central dissection first, then go to periphery. And see this movement of my blade. It is towards the, you know, uh, not like this. It is up and down, so that you don't tear the incision. 
if you have, if you want to go to periphery, don't move your hand like this. It has to move like this. Otherwise, you will tear the incision area. This area will get torn. So this is very, very important to realize the how you just see this. I'm doing a just movement up and down and going little peripherally so that don't put a stress onto the incision area. So there's a little bit of fluid in collection here. Sometimes people do a you know, fluid extraction here. So I'm what I'm doing, I'm just stretching the lenticule here. So these can be done easily. After you dissect out, you can inject little fluid. If you have fluid, you can stretch the entire lenticle out also. The same patient next day, absolutely clear. So I showed you two techniques of uh, you know removal of a lenticule. I didn't show the forceps one. Forceps has you know sometimes very difficult uh, bulky area. Go inside. You can catch the incision edge with the forceps uh, nudge, and you tear the entire incision also. It is better to dissect out cleanly and co correctly in these cases as such. Thank you, and uh, I think I, we can take some questions. And uh, because we have uh, finished the uh, laser part in a refractive correction before we shift to the fakie gyals. In the meantime, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Radhika Tandon. Will be showing us the uh, posterior chamber fakigyal implantation. Okay, I think we finished the you know three important areas. One was surface ablation. Second was the topo guided uh, LASIK procedures, both in uh, the most prominent uh, laser systems, that is wave light and the Mel ninety. And we showed you the examined laser uh, uh, smile in a uh, UGMX 500. Before we shift to things, I'd like to have, you know, how many people have access to a, a refractive surgery practice? Sri Lata has, I know that. <laughs> Only three people have access to refractive surgery practice. But I see young people are sitting. They all will have, you know, in future, they'll be doing refractive surgery. Because refractive error, is the largest component of a visual impairment. Refractive surgery is the largest <laughs> surgery done in a normal uh, human tissue for any surgery. And this will be a part and parcel of a practice throughout the, you know, uh, till the earth survives. So people have to learn refractive procedure in future also. And lasers are going to be there. As I said in the beginning, when the lasers started, early, you know, uh, it started in, uh, I think 80 and 90s it started. It's still the same procedure going on with a little modification. That means it is, this procedure is going to be there for a future also. Not like RK. RK came with a bang and by 70s it was off. 90s people started avoiding RK surgery. But laser surgery is still on with little modification. So we have to learn these techniques. Okay? Okay, Professor Radhika. Uh, thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give you um, uh, insight into the surgical steps for uh, uh, fakic IOL for patients where uh, surface ablative procedures are not suitable. So this is uh, one case of a lady, 26 year old, who presented uh, in August 2021 and um, gave a history of using spectacles for past six years. So this should automatically set up a red flag in your mind. Because here's a person who started with a refractive error at the age of 20. So this is something you should always keep in mind uh, as you, you know, work up the case. The refraction was stable for two for the far past four years, no history of contact lens use. She was seeking refractive surgery for cosmetic re uh, reason and she was healthy. So her uncorrected visual acuity was 6 by 60 in both eyes. She had a spherical as well as a cylindrical uh, error. Her BCVA was 6 by 6, near vision was fine. There were a few papillae present. And uh, on screening, there was a, a definite corneal thinning with ectasia. Her intraocular pressures were normal, and her fundus was healthy. So here you have a look at her um, maps. Uh, she had a K2, which is 46.9, again, um, very close to 47, which is what we take as a cutoff. K max was over the limit. And the thinnest pachymetry was 448. And if you see her uh, Berlin uh, uh, Ambrosio enhanced ectasia display, this was also clearly abnormal. Um, and uh, when, uh, so therefore, she was put on treatment. She was believed to be a borderline case of VKC, a borderline keratoconus or formful keratoconus. She was put on lubricants and lifestyle modification. And she was followed up for a whole year. Subsequently, it was confirmed that her refractive error was indeed stable. 
And similarly with the other eye, her left eye was a little worse. K2 was 48, K max was 49.8, sinus pachy was 445. This eye, the Bellin amrosa is clearly abnormal. And um, similarly, the, she was watched for a whole uh, one year and uh, uh, the Corvus um, values also were clearly de de deranged. And therefore, it was confirmed that she was not a suitable case for a corneal refractive procedure. She was given the option of continuing with spectacles, but that was not suitable for her as well. She had poor quality of life. So she was very keen for any option to get rid of glasses. So we worked her up for an ICL. Um, and um, th this is the, uh, for, so additional investigations that have to be done is you will measure the white to white and you will also look at the endo AC depth and the specular count. And she was a suitable case for ICL and a toric lens was planned. For this, the lens is pre-ordered and uh, then the patient, it comes come through the RPC um, purchase process and the patient comes with a customized lens and we, uh, the surgery is done under daycare. Um, I have selected the left eye for this live surgical demonstration because I have used the um, um, heads up display and the way the microscope is uh, in my OT, I can only use it when I use the left eye. So this is the left eye surgery which is being done. This is the lens being primed. Always verify the patient, verify the lens power, verify your records and confirm that the lens uh, is the correct one. And then there is a sheet which I had shown you before. That also should be put up near the microscope to make sure not making any error when putting the lens. So also check that the lens is clear, that there are no particles, etc. We've never had this problem, but never, uh, never, uh, for, um, uh, you know, um, compromise on this step. And if you see, there is a leading haptic has a little dimple, and the trailing haptic has a little dimple. And uh, when you're loading it on the platform, just be a little careful. Sometimes in the process, if you take too long, it dries up a bit and tends to stick. Then you can put a drop of BSS. You, if you're having trouble and struggling, you can even use um, a, a metallic instrument, the lens manipulator. I prefer to just use the sponge. And when you're loading it, load it on the sort of rear end of the platform where it is a little wider. If you start trying to load it in the narrower end and you again may struggle, and then confirm the alignment of the three central holes as well as the foot plate. Make sure it is uniform, it is not tilted. And then from the other side, gently pull. Here again, try not to lens, let the lens rotate. But sometimes, depending upon how well you primed it, sometimes the lens does rotate inside. So be aware of where are those three central holes because that is showing you the proper alignment. And when injecting the lens also, you have to adjust that orientation. And then the um, cartridge is put into the inserter and uh, the, uh, the, um, you just confirm, you push that uh, plunger forward, confirm that the lens is moving comfortably, as I'll show you now. And then now we go for the surgery. So this is under topical anesthesia. The patient uh, has been nicely counseled before about the steps of surgery. And then you make a mark as to the uh, target alignment. In this case, it was supposed to be 18 degrees, and the lens has to be rotated slightly count counterclockwise after insertion. Um, here, just putting an extra mark just to verify the, uh, the axis. One could even use a digital marker for such cases. And then you have to make a side port. You may have to vary the location of your side ports depending upon how the eye is exposed. In this particular case, the lower fornix was better exposed than the upper fornix. We therefore, made two side ports inferiorly, but I've also made one superiorly because you have to be ma make sure that you have good access to the uh, uh, haptics all around. And therefore, I had to pull the eye down a little bit and be very careful when you're entering. You don't want to accidentally go with a sudden sharp entry and, and puncture the lens. Then put a little bit of visco dispersive, visco elastic from the side port itself, and then um, you make the main entry. This is a 3.2 millimeter blade. It's a little larger than what we use for our micro incision phaco, so 3.2 millimeter. You make a little longer tunnel parallel with the iris. Again, very, very careful because if it's under topical, sometimes the patient may suddenly jerk at any step and uh, you don't want to hit the lens. Um, so then you put a little bit more visco dispersive. You should see the cords of, visco, of the visco elastic inside. It should not be overfilled because there will be too much of resistance to the lens. The lens is very soft and very delicate, and if there's too much of pressure inside the eye, it won't go in. Now, be very careful. Dock it and very gently open and do not be in a hurry. 
as you can see i'm monitoring those three central holes and you may have to rotate your hand a little bit um, just to make sure that it is absolutely aligned because accidentally sometimes the lens may come to completely flip if you're not careful about that so make sure the lens is opening in the correct orientation of course keeping uh, in mind the leading and the trailing haptics indicators now this is a step which i do a little differently i use a little visco cohesive visco elastic anterior to the lens because now i want the good deeper anterior chamber and it stays better so i use uh, um, um, a visco cohesive anteriorly not too much just a little bit and then i rotate and uh, um, trying to rotate the lens to get it to the proper alignment at this step, step itself uh, so i don't have to put too much of uh, manipulation later on but in this case actually the leading the trailing haptic had gone in automatically and uh, you, then i've confirmed the orientation you can see there's an orientation line which is aligned with my anterior marker and then um, i go in and here the faco probe will have the blue sleeve uh, with the Al if you're using the alcon system because you, it's a larger incision the pink sleeve is you know, will be so you don't want to col chamber collapse and you go in uh, gently wait for the visco elastic to come out and then i used to notice i realized that the tra tra leading haptic is actually still anterior um, i'll just show you because if you see here it actually seems to be still anterior so fortunately i had not removed all the visco elastic from behind i put another little bit more more heel on anteriorly just wanted to show that sometimes little steps may go a little different from what you planned and you need to be calm and uh, you know assess carefully and go ahead with taking corrective measures as required and then here again it's being gently and if the pupil is very very dilated sometimes this can happen as it was in this case and then gently and I, I was conscious that if my viscoelastic has come out from be, from behind then there is a likely to be a little bit of lens touch happening here so i put in a little bit more viscoelastic and then realigned it making gentle movements and it uh, trying not to push posteriorly it's sort of a horizontal movement to just align the lens in and just push it into place taking care only to touch the haptic and not the optic uh, because the optic is very delicate and it shouldn't uh, be damaged at any cost and never try to cross the lens at any position always stay away from the central optic zone after this now the lens is well in position again go in and remove the viscoelastic keeping the aspiration port posteriorly encouraging the uh, viscoelastic behind the lens to come out through the aqua port the central opening and you can see the viscoelastic coming take your time fortunately the patient was very cooperative and then after that one uh, can put in a little um, one will hydrate the wounds if if one is concerned sometimes you can put a, a you can inject a pupil constrictor such as either pilocarpin or myocol or carbocol and then hydrate the wound nicely make sure the ac is well formed and the wound is well hydrated everything is stable and then one can use ioct to confirm the uh, align alignment and the vault and then check the that the wound is secure the ioct image i seems to have skipped i think with the ioct you can see the vault i'm just checking if i skipped it possibly be in sort of uh, just check doesn't matter but with the ioct one can confirm that the lens is uh, well um, the vault is adequate and then uh, post operatively the patient was six six the other eye was done uh, in another ot different surgeon after uh, two hours and uh, two to three hours uh, post operatively the patient was happy with the six six vision the vault is a little bit higher 
um, may, but uh, we, we will watch it. Ideally, would be about 500 to seven to 500 to 800, but it's, we're a little bit concerned about the left eye vaulting. But the patient's uh, pre pressure was normal and the AC was well formed. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Radhika. Yes. Beautifully managed the case. You know, yes. but idea is to show the you know the actual uh, what happens in the operation theater, and. Uh, she rightly pointed out very, very important uh, points. I, I hope you know people will understand those things. Once she talked about guru, a good uh, pre-op examination so that we can assess the sizing of uh, ICL in a proper manner. And anything between uh, 200 to 800 is acceptable nowadays, the uh, vault is concerned, depending on the AC depth of a patient. Sometimes you have AC depth more than three, so higher vault is acceptable in those cases also. Sometimes you have a little shallow uh, Three or two point nine, there uh, it can be difficult. In terms of loading wise, she showed beautifully how it has to be appreciated, and to know the correct orientation, you do have a little, you know, convexity in these lenses. But your leading uh, haptic should have the diamond mark, and the trailing haptic should, should be towards the left hand side, leading towards the right hand side. If that is there, you are sure that you are in the proper position. So one mark in the the leading one in the right hand side and uh, trailing one in the left hand side. And she pulled the lens very nicely and the S should be away from, it should be in the nozzle. So that it doesn't get stuck with the you know injector, uh, the, uh, the you know, cotton uh, applicator and you can have a chipping of the lens also. Make sure when you're pulling the lens, it should be totally into the nozzle. It should not be inside the cartridge. That is very important part. And she injected very, very gently which is very, very important because sometimes you do hit the you know, lens capsule with the you know, rapid injection and it unfolds abruptly in a different side also. So gentle rotation, don't try to push immediately entire lens. If you feel that your lens is moving in a different direction, unfolding different, you can still pull it out. That is very, very important. Sometimes I leave the trailing area on the own itself so that I still have access to pull it out, it, it slips. It, it suppose it flips inside the anterior chamber, never try to reflip it inside. You take out the lens, re, uh, you know, put into your cartridge and re-inject it. Never try to flip inside the anterior chamber, the inverse opening of the lens is concerned. And viscal acid removal, Dr. Radhika showed it has to be done very completely. And in a post-op, you know, you must see your patients within a first few hours, maybe two hours after surgery, check intraocular pressure, bolt. Then uh, if you are doing the uh, same day simultaneous surgeries. You can take the patient after a you know, gap of a few hours. And Dr. Sudarshan does very, very you know, meticulously. He takes two different operation theaters for two eyes. So that is what uh, a precaution should be taken, which is very important also. Yeah, Sudarshan would like to highlight. Thank you, Radhika, please. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. She does yeah. more than that. Two she has two surgeons. surgeons. Two different surgeons also. So that's good. I think what used to happen, the patient with a minus 12 in one eye and uh, you operate one eye both eyes and uh, one eye you've done and the other is minus 12. The patient comes after three days, four days. This guy is not comfortable. The orientation and esokinia is so much that he can't work, so he has to be home only. Now we, what we realize is the same day we do, the trick is to use different machines, different staff, everything is different. So first in the morning you do one eye on, in one OT, all the patients, three, four, whatever you have, one eye. And the patient goes out, you do your routine cataract surgery in the other OT. And in that OT, you get this patient walked in one by one because the milieu has changed. Don't operate if there are two tables in the same OT. Even that's not correct because the milieu which is the same and you might have an instrument coming from the other table. So change everything, give two hours. I think that's good enough. And what she's shown is absolutely fine. And the most important thing is the loading of the lens. If you can load the lens, the way it loads is the way it unloads inside the eye. If you can do that properly, I think 90% work is done. Rest, any cataract surgeon can manage the things, but loading, I think, is the most important thing in this one. Okay, uh, Radhika, anything else you want to add? And what she used for pilocarpine, she used in this case. See, in case you think the pupil is large and your chamber is not forming, the two things, either you can keep doing hydration or you can put a dash of pilocarpine. So what happens is the pupil goes small. Even if the pupil you think is going to get stuck onto the ICL, it never stuck, gets stuck because it's called shelving margins and very smooth edges. So with the pilocarpine, if the, even the vault is high, if the vault is say around 900,000 on the table and you're not happy, put a dash of pilocarpine and let the chamber, uh, chamber will start going deep once the pupil goes small. And we have some videos in which we've seen that uh, vault reducing with the effect of the pilocarpine, which pushes onto the iris, onto the lens and pushes the lens back. So.
Yeah, but the thing is that vault, whatever you get there is, if a chamber is, it's not formed and you're losing the fluid from there, there's no shortcut. You have to take care of that. If your lens sizing is big, you can still give it a chance with the phylocarpine. But once it stabilizes, if your lens size is big, it will always have high vault and stay high only. And these lenses that come in BSS. Earlier model used to come in NSCL. So the lens used to swell up after some time because since they were in NSCL, they were thinner lenses because the fluid outside was hyperosmotic. So now they're coming in BSS. So this is not going to change the vault. So whatever vault you see at one hour after the surgery is going to be the same next day or the next day. Okay? We did a good CPR. Yeah. We could feel the pulse, the pulse because it's a live surgery. It's almost live, you know. Oh uh, yeah, it's live now. It's almost live. So we did a good CPR to bring the patient back. I mean the procedure, sorry, not the patient. Okay, so the live surgery is going to start. Uh, I think once they get started, it will take some time. So I'll just cover up in between. So I've been asked by Professor Titiar to keep you guys occupied. How many of you have actually uh, operating subluxated lenses? Can I raise a hand? Uh, only the delegates, RP center guys are all. It's, uh, it's not dead now, it's almost live. So it's just, just there, a feeble pulse. Okay, so this patient came to us from UP. He has both eyes diminution of vision and uh, frequent change of glasses. Okay, so what we found in this was, vision was one by 16 first one eye, the other was six by 12. A fake zone, fake zone. It's a subluxated case. So both the lenses are actually clear, but they are not in the center. And with a round pupil, it's actually making it difficult for patient to see through. So basically, always try to see from the fake a fake zone both, and always check the near vision. In case your lens is riding up. So what happens first, they become globular, they become myope. So once they're myope, their near vision has to improve in these patients, majority of them. So this is what happens. So best corrected was not improving behind N10, he was not happy. 160 is not a good vision to com compare with other ones. Okay, so we went ahead. Uh, we s clinical picture is this one. Uh, so you can see the nose or nules intact anywhere. And the good thing was we could see the Berger space. There was a pigmentation here. I think we can discuss that later if people want to. And then we went ahead and did a UBM this patient. Now, this is what you see. See the lens coming anterior and it's broken off all over. Uh, UBM, I think, is one of the uh, good appliances which one should procure if you can do early in your life, in your practice. And we did an IOM master and we got the lenses. Now, what lenses we use? Earlier, we used to use uh, all these lenses which are coming imported and which they've stopped importing now. And the other thing was they were having fixed powers only. We didn't have the range of powers, so we started using Indian variety, which works well in these patients. So this is the patient on the table now. That's called the near life surgery now. So I'm going to start this. So what, what is the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to go with my MVR from side and go all the way into the lens because I want to put my irrigation fluid uh, from that side. So that's it. Then I come from the other side and make another tap. This one we published about 10 years back uh, in Eye Journal in London. So this was published uh, thing and you can try this uh, technique. It works very well. It's very safe technique. So you go inside and you go all the way back in, into, the, into the opening you made. And there you go. So now what you've done is you got your position onto the lens. You got the lens under your grip. <laughs> and this was done yesterday. This was yesterday's surgery. And then I come with a probe also inside, all the way inside, and I start aspirating inside the bag. You can cut the bag anytime you want by flipping over your parameters from IA cut. This is IA cut mode. So my aspiration is about 500, and cut rate is 100, because I can't go lower than that. That's the minimum my machine has. Otherwise, I'll avoid the cutter in this one. But I'm on a vitrectomy machine of, of the, I think all the machines, all the FACO machines have a good cut, cutters these days, so you can use that. So first I go IA cut and take out all the cortex. Since it's not a rex is done, this incision will enlarge a bit. 
so that's okay. So you stay ready. If you think the piece is coming anterior, getting swollen up, you can put your aspirator close to that and suck it off. And slowly, gently, you can just remove it from all over the place. And this has not been edited. This is a real time. You need some water? That will help you. All right, so you see the anterior capsule is coming into my, into my tip. So it's okay. So if you want to deroof, you can deroof the anterior one, but don't open the posterior till you want it to open. Otherwise, this cort the cortex may go down. And in this case, the good thing was because the Burgess space, you can see the pigmentation, the entire vitreous phase was intact. So this was a much easier case for us to do. And you see that nothing is falling down because I, I don't want to take the credit. It was because the anatomy was such that the anterior highlight was all intact in this patient. OK, so now I've gone to the cut IA mode. I'm cutting. And I'm eating everything which is gone, and that's about it. No, one, two, three, and it, there it goes. All right, so now I'm going to turn my tip downwards and change from IA cut to cut IA mode. So my cut goes to 4,000. I'm using a Centurion machine. You can do the same with any machine. You can use the upper machine also for that purpose, depending on which cutter you use. And if it's compatible with the machine, you'll get good results. So see, I'm removing all the as much uh, haloid as possible, but I go two millimeter down and about four or five millimeters in the periphery. But if there's a rim in the periphery, I'll cut it. Now, this one had a hyaloid which was formed here, which I cut later. Otherwise, majority of them, if, if the vitreous is uh, liquefied, you don't have to actually cut that much also. Just stay in the center, 2.5 to 3 millimeter, and your work is done. OK, now the pupil is too much dilated. You can't put iris claw in this one. So this patient, you have to put a, a little uh, pilocarpine to constrict to this one. If you're doing a patient in which the pupil is normal size, and you're doing this procedure, you don't have to put pilocarpine in those patients. Because when you're putting iris claw anterior to the iris, you wanted pupil very small. Whereas when you're putting it posterior, you actually don't want the pupil to be too small because your lens has to be pushed behind the pupillary margin. So you don't want to destroy the sphincter of the lens. So what I'm doing is I'm putting, uh, I'm just scrolling it down and see the little vitreous there. Again, I go with the cut. So you can just check it. Don't be too aggressive on that uh, pushing. Just see or you can actually use a, a tricot if you want to check it out. And every time you go, use the cutter at the high speed and cut off all the, and this is not edited. I was supposed to perform today because there's a OT time is less because Dr. Titial has three cases and Manpreet has, I think, one or two. So I thought it's best that by, by, by the time they change, I can show something. OK, I'll go a little forward. Now see, this is what you have. Vitreous once it's get hydrated is the problem. You see, earlier it was not moving at all. Now, it's like a slinky game. You know the slinky spring game? If you pull one end, it will follow, everything follows. So once the vitreous is hydrated, that is the biggest enemy you have. Hydrated tenons and hydrated vitreous are the two things which you have to be careful because they can get stuck anywhere and distort your, your vision and things later on and can cause infection also. If they come into the wound, they might have a conduit for the things to come from outside to in. So vitreous you have to handle properly. So that's why it's better to have a good vitrectomy, a cutter machine. So I use a pilocarp in this, I'm waiting now. And then on the other side also, I put in pilocarp in and I wait. Oh, I think that we are not edited at all, actually. Good. OK. So the pilo, and most of these will take its own time to constrict. Morphins, beals, spherophakias, if they dilate well, they'll take their own sweet time to come back. So no hurry there. Okay, now they started coming down. I put some viscoelastic. In this case, we put a helon. Now I'm making two stab incisions on the side. Now see, these are very important because that's what you're going to use to tuck the lens in. You can't tuck the lens from the edges because you have to go quite away to the periphery. So if you want to come behind the incision, incision is about 1.5, you will be almost reaching the sphincter. So I make two side ports. I think the side ports which I made stab are the one which you should learn how to do properly because those are the most critical things in this entire surgery. OK, then I put helon inside onto the iris, and then I enlarge this section. So you can use a 2.2 to start with, and then 5.2. Uh, these are all PMMA lenses. You need a, a 5.2 opening in these patients. No shortcuts. So since uh, it's a local blade uh, 5.2, I actually enlarged with my uh, Imported blade only, and this I just showed you to tell that it's work. I didn't use that for cutting because the edges are not too sharp. I'm telling you as it happened. Okay, <laughs> number the. Now that's not. In the meantime, the pupil has also become more comfortable now, right? This is what I would need. 
So I put my car inside, I go on to the top of the IRS and rotate it to the position where I want to park finally behind the IRS, but first on the top. Okay, so this is a cannula, uh, this is an instrument which has got a actually hook, so you can actually rotate the lens very well. And of course, there's a uh, helon inside the chamber. You can use methyl cellulose or helon, whatever you fancy. Now, this becomes important. You have to have a firm grip on this one. Lens has to be held very firmly. So I'm, I'm going to put the left first. Now, see this instrument going from here? And it's right ready to be uh, uh, enclaved. So I go inside. You can see the iris pattern. And you saw that? It just went in and this is enclaved. You can see the enclavation here. And similarly to the other side, I lift it up with my right side port instrument. It becomes more amenable. Otherwise, you'll be touching the iris. So I lift up the lens with the right instrument and lift it up. Tushar, I want you to do this more. Now, once I go inside, I push this lens again upwards. I rotate it and the impression comes here. And once the impression comes, I'm going to just put the lens and it's gone. So both done well with the Indian lens, which costs about a 1200 to 1500 rupees. And then you put the sutures and get away. You don't have to do a PI because the lens is put upside down. When you put anterior, you go with the convexity towards the cornea. When you go posterior, it's up, upside down. So it's upside down. It's not going to get pupillary captured. Okay. The earlier one, anterior one, always have a chance of pupillary capture. And my cornea colleagues always throw a fit when they see that. So I'm so happy I got a technique in which I don't have to go to the scleral fixated. I don't have to take out anything which is not supposed to be outside the eye. Like a, in a SFIOL, those haptic are supposed to be inside. And you're pushing them out. I, I don't think that's a physiological thing to do. Uh, that's my uh, point of view. But this one is at the back, and you can actually do it, and the pupil can dilate very well. So we've done a study in which we dilated the pupil and tried to see the periphery. We asked Dr. Pradeep to have a look, and he said he, he didn't have any problem in dilatation of the pupil. So be it, because all these Marfan's beals, because the uh, sclera is stretched, they have a chances, high chances of detachments and uh, uh, lattices in the periphery. We need to follow these patients up. All these funny patients, when they come to you and done a vitrectomy, it becomes mandatory for you to follow these patients every six monthly, at least for the first three to four years. Because we have two or three RDs happening, and they happen in the first six months. So if you can follow this patient and you can pick up them early, you can do it. It's not always the procedure technique is wrong, but sometimes if the cutter is not good and you're actually causing two traction, or there are lattices in the periphery which you missed out, you can have detachments. So that's what you have to see. And uh, this one, I think uh, we put uh, three sutures in this one, and uh, that's the end of the surgery. And then you go for the side, take viscoelastic out. Okay? Clean eye, you're doing a Fake, you doing an IOL uh, in, the, in the surgery, in the OT, and you have a problem there, you have a backup lens up like this. If so, it's so cheap lens that you can actually have two, three powers in your OT always. And instruments there, you can just go ahead and turn yourself into this and do it uh, without getting any, any of the hassles. Okay? Uh, are they ready downstairs? They wash very quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's what. So, yes. It's also scleral thinning. So, in cases of scleral yes, thinning, again, it's yeah. it's not good to do a glue dial, but this is... Yeah, uh, yeah she's right, because we had a uh, three, four patient falling up by uh, SFI was done outside somewhere. And we realized that the sclera was so thin that they were extruding outwards. And we had a patient in, in which the haptic was extruding inside towards the... And that was, in fact, very dangerous. So, what Dr. Namrata said is absolutely right. Because they are uh, marfans, they're stretched out lobes, sclera is not normal. So, if you haven't checked the sclera on SWEPs or OCTs, please do not do SFIOLs if you're not clear. And anyway, smaller kids, the sclera is going to be thin, so don't do that. After 10, 15, 20 years, if it's adult, whatever you do is your fancy. But even in the adults, we are still doing this one. It's a safer technique as per what we've done the work now. Thank you very much. Any other questions we have? Sure. Is it possible to do it without doing the vitrectomy? I'm just asking because if it was intact and yeah, yeah, nah, yeah, yeah. The, the thing is that the uh, hyaloid it will be sitting on the hyaloid and hyaloid in this patient as such has has a little pigmentation all around. So what happens if it's intact? The lens will actually give a curvature for the pigmentation to form behind it. So it's something like putting two lenses. Uh, there was a thing called uh, red rock syndrome by John Stewick. He's Australian who made it. So if you have two rocks on one another, it, if both are intact, the chances of the fibrosis can go for one and go to another one. So that can be avoided, yes. But yes, if you do a little bit trick me, I think it makes life easier. Most of the patient, it's not intact. This is the only patient which was intact. Actually, you don't get this intact. That's why I'll try to tell you that this is intact. Another is uh, this lady. If we do it with intact, I'm just thinking that and then do a PI. So, yeah, I don't know. I haven't tried it. Maybe next time I'll do it. The 
configuration is going to be concave. Yeah. And this is going to be certain in that concavity. So concave on concave actually is, is can have more chance of uh, fibers growing on top of that pigmentation. That's what uh, John Streak has actually found out that if you do both, chances of it is higher. So well, I haven't done it, but uh, he's put so a food for we, thought. <laughs> Let's see. Are we ready for the live surgery? Any? Are they properly okay. washed? Yeah. Because sometimes so, they never used to wash hands and used to get endothelitis. <laughs> so and Dr. Manjreet is going to be operating on white cataract. Okay, are we done? So can we have the, no we can't hear you Manpreet and we need the operating microscope feed. No, we can't hear you. Audio, visual, can you please check? No audio from the other side. Manpreet's mic is not working I think. Anushka? No, you, Karan is there? Karan? Yeah. Now ma'am. Now, now, now you can hear. Now okay ma'am. Good morning ma'am, good morning everyone. So this is a case of intumescent white cataract. So we'll just give you a brief case summary. Dr. Akshara will apprise you about the case. And meanwhile you can see the OCT as well, the intra-op OCT. So I'm expecting intumescence and fluid release. Uh, Akshara, can you just briefly summarize the case? Are you expecting fluid release? Yes ma'am, because uh, as per our own classification, there is a uh, homogeneous appearance on the IOCT just beneath the anterior capsule and it is going to lead to some fluid release and intumescence is there, there is a shallowing of AC. So Akshara will just tell you the demographic details of the case. Good morning everyone, we have 56 years. No Akshara, we can't hear you. Good morning everyone. Louder. Louder, good morning. Good morning everyone. We yeah. have 56 year old female with right eye hypermature senile cataract with left eye immature senile cataract. Plan for right eye PECO emulsification with monofocal IOL of power 22.5 diopter. Six. Carry on, carry on. Okay, we'll go to the, the operating microscope feed. So I'll just begin the case. So a 2.2 mm incision yeah. first as is conventional. Can I have the MBR? Since this is a case of white cataract, we are going to stain. Are they seeing the live uh, view? Wait, okay, Jali, that was. No, no, it is coming, sir. We can see the operating microscope is there. The only thing is the surgeon is not seen in the inset. Okay, doesn't matter. Sir. <coughs> so, air. So air bubble has been put to yeah. stain the capsule. And I'll stain with a tripen blue dye underneath the air bubble. So the main challenge with white cataract usually is rexis because there is intumescence in a lot of cases and a variety of techniques have been described to take care of the, to help achieve a continuous curvilinear capsular rexis. And what I prefer is initial nick. Now we have IOCT also to help see if it's going to be intumescence, if there's going to be fluid release. So, so what with viscoelastic are you injecting? I'm it? using a visco cohesive OVD, uh, Helon. So I'll just center the OCT right now. So as you can see, the anterior capsule has flattened slightly beneath the visco cohesive OVD. So I'll just make the initial nick, as you can see a fluid release is there. So though the rexis is challenging in white, fluid release is good because it is releasing the intralenticular pressure. And though there is still a chance of rexis extension, if the pressure is released, then the chances go down. So I prefer a spiraling technique of capsular rexis. Of course, I am very comfortable with the needle cystotome, but whenever you get uncomfortable, shift to a forceps. Or if it's your primary method of choice, a lot of people prefer forceps only at least in the white cataracts, if not all cases. So spiraling rex is because the moment it starts to go out, I have a chance of taking it in. And it's more controlled, of course. Because the tendency is to go with a smaller rex in complicated cases and smaller rex is hampered the surgery after that. So it's always better to go in a more controlled fashion. So 
at this stage, I'll continue right now with the cystotome, but you can take a fourth list. And as you can see, there is not that much intumescence that the excess is running out as of now. So, so because those whitish areas can be seen yeah. on the on the on the nucleus, so the fluid is not that much. Yeah. And these also were seen on the intraopositive microscope as black areas. So when it is when there is absolutely no visualization, then you know that classical fluid will come out, but beautiful spiraling of the rexes, especially when it is becoming, it becomes difficult to spiral when it gets bigger. It's easier yeah. to spiral when it is smaller, but very nicely done. So I think Manpreet, we have to, uh, <coughs> we can't keep on spiraling, we have to come to a logical conclusion now. Of course, I would, there is a, uh, there are two options, either I go with the smaller axis now, and the size I want, I can do it after I insertion or I can keep on spiraling <laughs> to achieve an adequate size now. So I'd rather do it in one go and not extend it, uh, enlarge it again after I insertion. I'm almost there, ma'am. So I'll just join this. We can join this with the cystotome or we can alternatively yeah. use a forceps so because that, that gives a better control. So what I'm using is a 23 gauge ILM peeling forceps. I'll go by the main incision only. Okay, so forceps always gives a better control and the whole spiral is out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is roughly the size that I keep in my surgeries. So now I will not have to enlarge it again after implanting the IOL. So I'm not doing a vigorous hydro dissection. I'm just trying to rotate the nucleus because you don't do hydro dissection in white cataracts and it's freely mobile. So just gently rotate. So I was not injecting fluid per se while the hydro maneuvers. So this is a dispersive OVD, beneath that a cohesive OVD, just for endothelium protection. And the more intumescent the cataract, generally the softer the nucleus. The harder ones have an easier excess. So your challenge in white will be either the rexis and the nucleus is easier to manage or if the nucleus is very hard sclerotic then the rexis usually is easier. So can somebody tell us the parameters as you begin to do the surgery? So Akshara are you there? Uh, so okay I will tell. Uh, so I have kept a torsional okay, fake of 55. Yeah, the intraocular pressure is 55, <coughs> I think the overlay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, overlay is there, so now we can see so the So it's parameters. softer only. The only challenge in white is that there is a lack of epicortical cushions. So you cannot do conventional vertical chops. And you have to come more from the equator. Sorry. Is it centered and focused? I don't think so. It is very well centered and very well focused. So I go towards the periphery and, and then wonderful it. job we could see the little crater like thing that you made that was good and then yeah. I think one piece is out so I do not prefer to eat the pieces as I go because in white as it is there is no support and once you start eating the pieces then the rest of the chopping becomes difficult so I'd rather make small pieces first and then chop. So since it's a softer one, I have not as of now kept my longitudinal FACO, intelligent FACO on. So this central disc, the moment it comes out, the pieces are easier to aspirate. Then you can just remain in the center and press your foot pedal down. So the central nucleus is out. Yeah, the central disc. Yeah, so, so now there's a lot more space for other yeah. elements to move. So after this, this is more or less okay. So we have very controlled fluidics with the this FACO machine, Centurion Active Fluidix. So I'm less worried about the PC than I would maybe in the gravity fluidics. So I just bring them to the center and I know that my PC will remain stable. Can I have the lens ready? Okay, that 
was very nicely done. So there is minimal cortex, if any. Just generally, I do not go in with the IA. I would go in after the lens because it comes in easily even after you put in the lens. Manpreet, this is Dr. Tritial's technique. Uh, I have so learned from technique. him only, so ma'am. Learned from him. So, <laughs> so yeah. The cortical aspiration partly to be done by probe, phaco probe, but I, I'm sure all the novice people should not attempt to do it. Only uh, expert surgeons can do this. Alternatively, if you have uh, this, you can even uh, you can you can use a coaxial or you can use a bimanual. This is the acris of IQ lens which is being put. And auto cert, auto cert was used to uh, do the implantation. And now the viscoelastic aspiration yeah. as well as the remaining cortical yeah. fragments. Excellent, I think. So the one more challenge with white cataract is of course, uh, often the zonules are weak. So while doing cortical aspiration, especially in older patients, don't be too aggressive because the back can come in. So I still have a layer of cortex left. So either we can do it coaxially or we can use bimanually. Bi also. Yeah. But obviously the coaxial is faster than bimanual. Yeah. So the lens edge itself can be used to polish and generally we do not polish the anterior capsular room too much but at least in the nasal area I prefer to polish slightly. So by the movement of lens itself the fibers that are left in the posterior capsule will be loosened and then you can just go beneath and take out any remaining viscoelastic as well as fiber. So I'm almost, so this was the, either you give time in the starting or in the end. So my rexis is what I wanted it to be. So slow and steady, just going on spiraling and not losing patience helps you save time in the end and your outcomes are good. Because the main challenge, is, challenge in white is achieving a continuous curvilinear capsular rexis only. So very nice rexes with a perfect overlap uh, on the optic, 0.5 millimeter on all sides. I'll just hydrate the wounds. So the hydration of the wounds is being done. Would you put intracameral moxifloxacin? Yes, ma'am. After hydrating the wound, okay. I'll put intracameral moxifloxacin. If anybody wants to ask anything or any comments, Prakul? Thank you, Manpreet. That was a wonderful surgery and you highlighted a few important points. One of them is probably don't try to pull all the cortical fiber. If you feel this is fibrous, then don't pull it. You are going to do a back dialysis with that. Any question from the audience? Excellent surgery. I think a big round of applause for Dr. Manpreet. First PECO live surgery. Thank Did very you, well in a very difficult uh, in a case of white cataract. So there is this little fiber. Yeah, yeah. I am thinking whether to take it out or not. I so I think that. you take it out, Manpreet. Yes, ma'am. Is the next case ready, meantime? Yeah, it's out now. Okay, so yeah. Good. Yes. Prabhul? Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can we have the patient details? Yeah, good good morning, sir. Can Prabhul. you hear me? It's still morning. Huh? Yeah, good, good morning. Yes, sir, we can hear you, but the sound has to be a little louder. Okay. Oh, no, we can't hear at all. No, no. Background no, OT noise we can see, but we can hear, but we cannot hear the patient details. We can't hear at all. Can somebody speak louder? 
We have to take uh, first myopic power, that is uh, 0.1, which is nearer to the emetropia. And this is the axis of uh, uh, zero vanity. This is my incision axis, which is uh, five degree away from the central area. The important thing here is uh, you have to keep your incision always in the same area so that you can have a better SIA calculation or a uh, not positive deviation from the SIA. So this is a 2.2, uh, which I'm going to do here. So make sure you do a nice incision without leaking the uh, aqueous. And two side ports I do. And side ports are always handy for uh, not only for uh, doing manipulation for excess, but subsequent uh, manipulation for uh, aspiration of cortex or a manipulation of intraocular lens is very, very handy, especially for toric uh, manipulation. You need to have a two side ports. So we have a very nice uh, glow coming out. So don't require the uh, dye to enhance the visibility. So this is a 1% sodium hyaluronate, uh, which I'm going to use, cohesive viscoelastic. Go from the periphery, exchange the entire aqueous. So this is basically aqueous exchange with the viscoelastic. So the capsule gets taut all around, center to periphery, and is maintained uh, throughout the surgery, that means throughout the rexus. You can see the rexus uh, orientation is uh, as per the uh, image gadget system, which is around, I have two lines, that is 5 and 5.5. 5. So I'll be in between those. So center to periphery is my linear cut. Then raise the flap. Once you have flap, gently keep rotating that. Don't go too large because this is a critical area. Any towards the uh, apex or towards the Difficult uh, rotation area, it should not rotate too much. This is a good area, I'll rotate a little bigger. And once I have a good curvature, you can see how beautifully the chamber is well maintained. This is because of two reasons. One is the use of side port with needle cystitome. Second is a good viscoelastic which, retain, which is retained inside. The side port manipulation for excess time is better because you want the viscoelastic to be retained. If you do from the main port, then you have a very high chances of, you know, uh, viscoelastic uh, coming out and this, things become very difficult. So I am already through with my rexus. At this time, I'll take out a little viscoelastic, which is very important because we don't want pressure to rise during your hydro procedure. There's also a little depression on the wound. You must appreciate I am doing my hydro procedure from the main port. Go inside, lift the rexus edge so that I get a, you know, cortical cleavage hydro dissection. Then little pressure, the fluid will come out from all sides. The nucleus will be uh, almost free. You can see here the nucleus is free. So I might do another uh, wave of fluid which to soften the cortical fibers, the attachments. Again, depress from other side. Because this step makes uh, things simpler for you, for patient and for us also. This, uh, as uh, Dr. Manpreet talking about, the saving the endothelium. First, the dispersive viscoelastic towards the endothelium. 
And then the cohesive viscoelastic underneath that, I go deeper and keep injecting so that it is pushed against the endothelium. So this is a soft cataract. You can see my uh, ozone amplitude will be 40. The rest of the parameters are similar. So my vacuum is uh, 370 and uh, aspiration flow is uh, 34 to 37. So my side port will go, uh, in proper will go first. Then go with the handpiece. Light me the Ekna should be. To make sure, first we take out the uh, loose cortex. Here also, I like to do a little trench so that I know how soft is, how hard is my nucleus. So it's a very, very soft. So I'll go down to uh, 20 uh, ozil amplitude. Because otherwise, I'll, it will be difficult to chop. Can you? Done. I'll just hold the nucleus here lightly and chop it. So normally it's very difficult to chop such a soft nucleus. You can do a chip and flick technique. Little bit of uh, you know chop or a separation uh, gives you a very nice way to you know handle uh, subsequently. So this is the important part to titrate the. Uh, the power of a FACO during my chopping pattern. So normally for a soft, we'll be doing a sculpt technique, which can also be done. This is central core nucleus, which is there. Now we'll take our periphery, which may not be separate. Now I'll separate that this part also. Now things will be simpler to take it out. Very softly, you can play right in the middle. Don't have to move your handpiece too much. Things will keep coming to your port. So this is the advantage of using a Centurion system, which has a very nice uh, active flow system, which is, which is going to maintain the anti-chamber dynamics in a very, very comfortable way. So this is apicortex which is being removed. So just be a little careful uh, removing the apicortex because it depends how uh, deep or how buried uh, you know your hydro procedure was. If your delineation was incomplete, so this is what uh, going to happen sometimes. Difficult to remove these cortical fiber. Sir, uh, do you change to the mode or you are controlling it on your Sorry? pedal? Your yeah, it is controlled by foot pedal only. Okay. So, FACO will not come because I am in a, a vacuum mode only. So, this is what is important to have a very nice uh, controlled foot switch. So, FACO is not only the power, it is your hand-eye-foot coordination which is so important. So, I almost through. So, I will use the viscoelastic to maintain the chamber. Slowly come out, so the chamber shallows slowly. There is no sudden decompression. So, it is so important to realize. Now I will use a cohesive viscoelastic, then fill the entire bag. You can see the viscoelastic going all around, right up to the periphery. Now fill a little bit towards the wound area. At this time, you might put a, some you know, methyl cellulose onto the cornea, which will highlight the things better. Like me deck now. Stabilize your eye and use your uh, auto search to go inside. Speed you can manage because it has a speed uh, monitoring also. You can decrease or increase the speed in every stage. One is the uh, initial uh, injection of a lens up to the cartridge S. Then subsequent implantation speed can be also moderated. So that's the advantage of uh, auto search. Now I'll take out the viscoelastic. <coughs> Two things are very important for uh, these uh, newer generation trifocals. This is basically a quadrifocal lens, which has been made to a trifocal, so that we have a better distribution of uh, light 
both for a distance near intermediate. I think this is one intraocular lens which has a best uh, light distribution for all three segments. In fact, uh, light transmission wise, this is the lens which gives you more than, you know, 88% light transmission in multifocal range. Can we see the Callisto axis? Uh, I'll come to that. It should not be brought because this sometimes take, takes away your stereopsis. Okay. All these overlay systems. Okay. okay. Not like you, you have a terrific stereopsis. <laughs> Especially when you are doing a minor manipulation, like I'm doing a little bit of posterior capsular, uh, you can say, uh, rubbing off. So it's better to have a, you know, like this is an area which a little bit of fluid also collection that will take away your uh, you know stereopsis. I normally don't uh, you know uh, do a too much of epithelial cleaning at this axis, 0180 degree, because that's the area you can block uh, the light uh, scattering. Now we can have the overlay. So it is a absolutely you know almost what's what's the uh, degree? 174 degree. So. I'll just keep little, you know, a few degrees anti-clockwise, then come out slowly. You can see wound is very nicely managed, hardly any edema. So now I'm going to slowly hydrate. Hydration has to be stromal, not deeper. You can see gentle hydration, chamber should be shallow at this time, so that you can uh, fastly, smoothly hydrate the stromal area. So once I have hydrated the India, the chamber will get deeper. Now I'll go to side port to get the flap attached in the main area. So this pressure from inside will cause the attachment of flap, the posterior lip or the main wound. This is complete. Now I'll inject uh, intracameral Nigamox. That will again give some time for a uh, hydration to be effective. Little bit onto the side port. Now, two things are important. One is centration of the central uh, part of this IOL. Light with the Ah, good. And the rexis orientation. The rexis is almost similar. I'm getting my disc to be central. It's right in the center now. And now I'll shift this, tuck this lens a little bit towards the axis. So leave these uh, open loop haptic lenses little anti-clockwise to begin with. Then you can ro rotate clockwise. I think it's almost there, little one degree away from the main area, which I'll again do it. So this last manipulation has to be done under the good hydration of wound or maintained intraocular pressure. So little tuck will be required here. Now it's right in the middle. So this movement should be lighter. You can see the three dots are right in the middle of a central disc, which is important here. And the, my three dots of uh, toric lenses are aligned to my callisto marker. So that's entrance surgery and my rexis covers the almost 0.5 millimeter of uh, intraocular lens in the periphery. The effective lens power is going to be better now and subsequently in the future also. Thank you for kind listening and appreciate the help from a patient. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Wonderful surgery. Any question from the audience? Any comment or question from the audience? We have time because we want to shift to another patient. Uh, that's a lovely surgery, Dr. Titial. And uh, my question is, do you prefer using Aura for these system? Because Aura can tell you uh, if the orientation is good because Callisto sometimes because of the parallax uh, might not be at the right axis. Okay. Sorry, you're saying something? Okay. Aura, Aura, I said, sir. can you use Aura, which gives you the lower order abrasions, and you can check out the actual position of the lens, depending on what you're getting abrasion. Because uh, cholesterol, cholesterol might be, have a parallax and might not be at the axis. Uh, as you said, one degree, two degrees can have. Whereas the Aura, if it gives you NRR, tells you that you're right at the axis. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Sudarshan, uh, uh, Aura can be helpful in all these uh, premium IOs, especially toric uh, lenses. There, once you have a good, uh, you know, inventory, it is a good, uh, uh, you can say, device. Because you do require, a, for an IOL power calculation also, you require the inventory, you require a, a three to four lenses. Yeah. Because your power calculation may be 
deviated from the which been calculated from the IL master. As far as axis orientation is concerned, ORA will uh, further enhance the you know uh, its uh, orientation. Yeah. But whatever studies uh, we have also done and people have published, it's not going to make a huge difference in terms of a actual outcome in uh, these cases are concerned. Yes, in difficult situation, as you are saying, like post refractory surgery patient, post RK patient, sometimes this is really helpful in getting a good orientation of lens as per the new axis which is given by the aura. Yeah, I just want to tell the delegates that in case you don't have these high tech machines, even if you're marking on the slit lamp outside, your result is going to be as good as this one. If you can have these machines because this microscope has a built in thing, so that's fine. Otherwise, don't. Uh, lose your sleep if you don't have all these calistos and auras with you. Okay. Our next case is 63 year old gentleman with left eye immature senile cataract, nuclear sclerosis grade 2 with posterior polar cataract, planned for left eye phaco emulsification with monofocal IOL of power 19.5 diopters. So, OCT G. I think intraoperative OCT is a very useful tool, especially for Upa posterior dekana. polar cataracts. And uh, this is, I think, going to be IOCT guided uh, surgery yeah. because it helps you to know whether there is a breach in the PC or not. And yeah. as you do nuclear emulsification, then you still do not get I think area to focus on. What Dr. Nabata is saying that uh, to make the surgery safer, you can buy technologies which can pick up these uh, posterior openings if you have access to. Otherwise, if you have a doubt, always treat them like a posterior polar cataract. For people coming from the PHCs and smaller places, please do what you're doing. You can learn the te techniques from Sir, how, how he's doing the surgery so well. Technologies, if you can afford, yes, but yes, that doesn't mean that you should stop operating these patients. You'll still be operating the posterior polar. So take them as a posterior polar for granted. If it doesn't done. open up, you should feel happy. If it opens, you're ready with that, whether it direct means or not. So always, it all the steps which you're going to tell you, you should follow those ones. Okay. So all yours, Dr. Titiya. Okay, thank you, uh, Sudarshan and Namrata, for a kind input. This uh, has a small uh, posterior uh, capsular opacity, which may be polar. So we'll just do a OCT and see if uh, that is correct. But in the in the head safe device. Uh, you have to fix your focus with a full magnification. Then, a magn then your focus remains sharper in these cases. So let's go a little posterior. So this is a disc which we have. And this is a you know, high definition OCT picture going to come in this particular case. So you have to focus on the yeah, I'll go lens, ahead. I think. Yeah. You can see uh, the, the PC is clear. Yeah, the PC so looks the, quite intense. Only two areas of attachment. One is, you know, uh, peripherally. Center seems to be clear. The disc is not larger. It is uh, around two millimeter. And thickness is also not uh, significant. So size and thickness is also important, apart from the posterior capsular orientation. So, so this case, we have done an anti-segment OCT in our OPD also. That also showed that there is a clear, you know, uh, Space between the capsule and the uh, disc which we are seeing. So in this case, as per our understanding, this is like a posterior subcapsular cataract, like posterior polar. Yeah. Other eye examination very important. Other eye is uh, again a similar picture, not been operated yet. Like me, dekho beta. So all right. difficult cases you must examine the other eye. That is important, especially why total cataract. So we are going to do a similar steps as you have seen for other case. These side ports are, you know, uh, one millimeter side ports so that you can maintain the entry chamber uh, dynamics during your uh, FACO procedure. So the excess size should be again around five millimeter. It should not be too small or too big. If it is too big, sometimes. In a posterior polar, when you have a difficult scenario when capsule cannot be 
Koshik acid cannot be maintained, then you may have to do a either sulcal fixation with anterior capture, or you may have to do a you know a reverse optic capture in some cases. So we have a nicely filled antechamber now. So you have to fix your glow with your left hand. In fact, this left hand fixation gives you a very nice, you know, uh, you can see it, uh, analysis of how you're going to uh, manipulate your patient. It can lift the eye up, down, uh, anyway. So that's a good area. This is my comfortable axis also if I'm working. The working axis should be comfortable for you, especially the left hand. And your side foot should be also in a similar position where I'm holding. Because that is my axis which is comfortable for you. See, this is a small strip coming out. So to make it a bigger, you may have to make a larger flap so that it doesn't get uh, no, terminated. So now I'll just rotate. So this is very important aspect of uh, no, making your axis, which gives you an easy you know, uh, rotation. Yeah, Mooni Hilao. Give me just one minute. I'm going nearer to the tearing edge so that I can do a good rotation. As uh, Dr. Manpri talked about uh, spiraling, in all my cases normally I do spiraling at this area because I normally initiate with a smaller area, subsequently rotate to a size which is convenient. So this is around 4.5 millimeter axis. Light me the It's important to now take out the uh, viscoelastic. I don't want pressure to be higher in these cases. And the indication will be that when the flap comes out, that is the two-third removal of viscoelastic. So here first I'm going to do a delineation. Okay. So I'll go a little deeper and do a delineation. It's not happening because nucleus sclerosis is slightly higher. People have a different you know, devices for doing this also. So it's gone deeper here. So I'll just might do a hydro wave, which you have seen there. Multiple pockets have been created in the posterior plane because the high defi definition uh, HD doesn't give you a full uh, length of a uh, uh, you can see uh, of a lens. I'll not rotate, I'll just make a wave, inject the dispersive again. And put the cohesive underneath that. So you have anterior free flow cornea, you can see reverse, then you have anterior floating uh, uh, fibers, and they have multi-layer dissection haps, you can see there. So we can see almost four multi-layers. And like the older uh, generation microscope, we had a beautiful OCT uh, images which uh, Dr. Manpri showed. The problem is now I, can, uh, I can't use XY of this microscope, so I'll have to close this for some time, because I want my axis to be proper. Now I can move this. Again, I'll take out the cortex first. And see how soft or hard it is. So this is around grade uh, three nucleus. You can see little trench coming up. Like me, dekho niche halka sir. Good. And chop this piece. So rotation may be difficult because I have not done a complete uh, delineation. So I'll take out one more pi from here. So this technique we have uh, recently getting published in IGO, how to do surgery in a, when you don't have a hydro procedure. So I'll take another piece from here. So in the meantime, this cavity which I have created will allow the fluid to seep through the partially delineated areas, which we do for lasers also, the uh, laser delimination. 
So you can see this is safe space is there. That this would have allowed fluid to seep in. So I'll do one more. This and separate this. So maybe this piece will come out now. You can see it has rotated now. Not very focused. I'll rotate further and take this piece. So multi piece I'm doing so that I can take out later with you know faster. Now I'll take piece by piece. So this is the one piece I've taken out. Second piece. So you have to maintain the epinuclear uh, cortex cushion till the end. I'm taking out the nucleus to the center. You can just tuck this nucleus to the center like this and eat that. Take this to the center and eat this. Now I have an epicortical cushion. So that time I can see the OCT, how the posterior capsule, you can see a thick layer of epicortex still there. I'll take out this epicortex first now. Because my hydro was not complete, it won't come. Now I can take out in the one piece now. So this is the time we should see the disc is there, still there. That means one more layer of epicortex will be there, which is visible in a OCT also. Now I'll take out this cushion now. This is the second layer of epicortex. So you can see the classical description of uh, uh, the pseudo hole or which we described the cortical disc defect uh, last to last year in a JCRS. You can see the defect is not actually a defect. It is the cortical defect, not the posterior capsular defect. You can see posterior capsule clear in the OCT. So I'll take out this cortex now. I'm using this handpiece because I am not going to shallow the chamber, which can happen when I'm trying to take out the you know uh, handpiece out. I'll just do this. So maybe I can stop my OCT at this stage so that I can manipulate my fixation better. So this uh, this time I can use the Sudarshan Khokar and Tushar technique. Of using a bimineral uh, hybrid technique. So, without taking out the FACO handpiece, I mean, no IA, that will maintain the anti chamber because that's the classical teaching for a you know, PCR or a postipolar cataract. We should not be you know, disturbing the chamber pressure that much. This coat, this coat. So before I come out with the handpiece, I like to save this posterior capsule if possible. Now I'll inject the quasi viscoelastic. Idea is to you know not to let chamber collapse faster. Now weak capsule sometimes it can open up. Posterior polar cataract or posterior type of cataract can be difficult sometimes unless the you know completion of surgery it can open any time. I've seen a video where you know, during the end stage hydration of wound the capsule opening up. Can you withdraw the handpiece? Okay, redo it now. So um, again, you light with the cover here. Okay, operation very nice. So we'll again inject with the water surge. Make sure the lens goes underneath the rex. The beauty of these lenses, they open very, very slowly. 
you know, difficult situation, subluxated, postnacular deficiencies. This, these lenses are very good and they have a little softer haptic also, doesn't really get stuck like other hydrophobic lenses where haptic can be really tough and that can disrupt the entire uh, poster castle sometimes. So I'll go underneath to remove this uh, viscoelastic because we have a combination of viscoelastic here. It might take slightly more time to remove. A little bit of a cleaning of edges. I normally like to clean the edges only. Okay, any questions? We are through with the surgery. The audience wanted to know that when you made the pie there, yeah. so uh, did you try to put visco dispersive behind it? Because that People way it do would... that also, yeah. but for that I'll have to come out and inject visco elastic. This pie is you know, a very good idea, it really gives an easy seeping of fluid. And this is useful solution for yeah. uh, cases where you have a grade 3 or a grade 4 nucleus. That's right. Because hydro delineation becomes very difficult in those cases. True. Like you saw in this case, I could not do hydro delineation, you know. Yeah. So but this, this technique is very handy. Yeah. But this case was not a posterior polar per se. Yeah. But if you have a posterior polar, I think uh, it's a word of advice that you should use viscoat behind that so that they can actually make a compartment there uh, to support the posterior capsule, even if it's open. And you can get away with that. Yeah, absolutely true. Yeah. But that technique I've showed should be used for uh, all those cases. That's right. So we typically around, that should be followed. We have around 70 participants who have joined through Webex. So there is a similar question related to what Professor just said. If it is an NS4 with posterior polar, is it a good idea to go for phaco falsification or ECC? Definition of it. Okay. Oh, it's always phaco for us. Yeah. Whatever. If it is NS4 with posterior polar, is Num it a good idea NS4 to go for means Namrata Sharma of Unit 4. <laughs> She'll always do a phaco only. NS4 is always phaco. So she said it, right? <laughs> See, it all depends what is the comfort zone. If your comfort zone is uh, making the section bigger and uh, putting suture and doing the surgery, you should do that, whatever you're comfortable with, with your machine. But in the RP center, since we have all these equipments and we have uh, good backups, Mankaram. we still prefer doing phaco emulsification as uh, NS4 said for NS4. And uh, so there are two questions related to your previous surgery, first surgery. One is, uh, do you make any, is there any difference in your exercise when you're planning toric multifocal? Uh, compared to a routine monofocal IOL and the second is uh, do you use trifocal lenses only or EDOF lenses also when uh, the so patient sir, asks I think for sir multiple. can answer that sir is, uh, sir, is, is uh, there a change in your exercise if you are using trifocals vis-a-vis -vis monofocal trifocal toric vis-a-vis -vis monofocal in terms of exercise Yes, rexis rexis size. size. No, no, rexis size remains similar because ideally rexis, uh, we all know, should be around 5, 5.5. And only concern is, you know, uh, in toric lenses because you have to rotate the lens to a proper axis. So sometimes whatever rexis you have made may not be, you know, uh, may not suffice to cover the entire optic area, periphery 0.5 millimeter. If it is a spherical lens, we can move the lens so that rexis covers. Toric, you have to move in the axis only. Yeah. If your axis is not regularly centered with the axis, then you have a difficulty. This difficulty normally comes in a vertically oriented uh, toric eyewells. Horizontally, uh, is a lot easier to manipulate and fix the lens in a proper axis. Mm -hmm. Vertical always have a difficulty. The axis normally there I do is a 4.5 millimeter. If I feel the axis is smaller after implantation, I make a multiple small relaxing nicks to make sure this doesn't have a phimosis happening in the future or a, doesn't contract that much. So I'm very, very careful if my axis orientation is vertical because there your axis can be real challenging. Otherwise, size-wise, this should be similar. Yeah. So, <coughs> if you have a PCOs in these lenses with the multiple rings, like uh -huh. you got a multifocal, you got rings from centered all the way going out. So should there be a change in your plan for YAG opening posterior capsule in a monofocal versus a multifocal? Actually, I've not done a you know, YAG personally for the last so many decades. Okay. But uh, recently I got YAG done for a, one of the you know, trifocal lenses. Right. And uh, it, I, then I went to the uh, 58 room number where the laser is being done. And the person who was doing it, I did ask them because he had done around 100 YAG uh, caslotomies. So his idea was, you know, if you have a multifocal uh, lenses, 
you have to be a little careful not to hit the lens because your uh, those uh, deflective things can be damaged. Yeah. So he focused little posteriorly in these cases. While in the spherical lenses, he said, "Okay, I focus right onto the capsule." Yeah, but uh, what I'm saying is that the size has to be a little bigger for incorporating yeah. all yeah. the uh, rings outside. So it has to be about three, three point five. Whereas in a, in, a, in a monofocal, you can just make a two spots, it will retract open to 2, 2.5, that's good enough. Whereas in a multifocal, you have to have the, at least four to five rings coming in the opening. So that's you're, absolutely correct. Yeah, absolutely so correct. Of course, for all the YAGs, you have to be a little offset posterior. Uh, yeah. of, you're not supposed to make pits onto the Brad Pitt. No, not Brad Pitt, uh, lens pit. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sir, one more question was that, uh, do you use trifocal lenses only or you prefer EDOF lenses in pure pure cases? No, uh, we use uh, all types of lenses. Uh, and, uh, we, our experience, you know, started from the, you know, simple monofocal lenses to a toric, then we had a bifocal in between, then we had these uh, refractive, then diffractive combinations. Now, in the recent past, we are uh, using, you know, either uh, uh, enhanced monofocal lenses, which is also gives a very nice intermediate vision as well as a good clear distance vision. We shifted to a, a now trifocal lenses. There also we have an opportunity to of have a use synergy type of lenses where a combination of uh, EDOF plus the uh, diffractive areas. So all sort of lenses we use. The uh, quality of vision for these lenses are very good with your generation lenses. A patient acceptance is quite good. As far as uh, newer trifocals are concerned, we do have around uh, 10 percent of patients complaining the uh, photoptic symptoms. But even in those 10 percent cases, no patient has a disabling uh, uh, symptoms. So that's a good sign with these uh, cases. In fact, uh, recently all uh, cases who desire, patient who desire a good multifocality, I put trifocal lens for all of them. Yeah, I think he's absolutely right, you, because sir. what we had earlier was bio biofocals, in which there was earlier they had a plus four ad, meaning <coughs> that your near vision was fixed at about 20 centimeters. So that is clear at 20 centimeter and six by six. In between, you couldn't see a dam. So what happened, they started putting the near vision a little further away, regressing it backwards. So they came with a three and a 2.5 finally. So okay, I'll join you down. Yeah, sure, please come. Thank you very much and great surgery. <laughs> so what has happened is now all these trifocals actually, the Alcon, which we saw panoptic is the quad focus. So you have zero order, first order, second order, third order. Every time the waves go and when they have summation, tip to tip it adds on. Uh, you guys are coming to, okay. I'm <laughs> going out. Okay, all right. Gee. Get some team for me also, please. So what happens is, now what they've done is, that first order, second order, and third and fourth they put together. So the intermediate is becoming important. So all these people who are at 60 to 80, uh, if it's a driver, Near vision is good, distance is good. Intermediate, he can't see the dashboards. Same, same for the computer workers. And all these people on computer, you have a keyboard, you have the screen. So you have to have 60 to 80 as well. So that's why all these one has come. So since the multifocals have come, they have actually taken away the bifocal. So bifocal should not be put at all. And as long as possible, you should try to do both eye surgeries as close to each other because that's what the adaptation is all about. So neuroadaptation will take place. Certain patients will have dysphotopic uh, symptoms, as Dr. Titial was saying, but then there are very few now, and with the finer, newer lenses, the, what has happened is that technology to cut the lenses, the marks on the lenses with the lathe has improved in tremendously. Earlier, it used to make big, big ridges and small, uh, highs, and they used to cut off the tips called epodized. I think all know about the epodized lenses. Now, that technology has improved so much that these lenses hardly has any dysphotopic symptoms. Even if the patient has it for some time, it settles on over a period. And especially we've done both eyes. Majority of the patient which we've done by, uh, both eyes, uh, these lenses, they're doing very good. And uh, all the faculty doctors who are retiring and almost about to retire, majority of them are actually going for multifocal and they're happy with that. Okay, any questions you people have? Okay, yeah, sure, please give out a mic. First, tell yourself who you are and where you're from, and then we'll see if the question is worth answering. I mean, of course, we'll answer still. <laughs> Sir, I'm Dr. Nisha from Yamuna Nagar, okay. Haryana. Yeah, please. I've recently joined a private practice. I did my SR shift from Marayu, Kolkata. Sir. Okay, perfect. Tell me. Uh, sir, uh, when Sir was doing posterior polar cataract, he did a step where he was uh, inside, uh, he was with Faco Pro, and yeah. sidewise he took an aspiration. Yeah. 
So I want to know how he did okay, that. Okay, so that you. is basically a called uh, a hybrid. Tubing yeah, is I'll just say. To the FACO. No, I'm just telling you that only. So see, your FACO handpiece has two. One is the infusion. One is the suction, right? So what they do is the tube. You hold the piece inside the eye. The fluid is still going through the handpiece. You take out the one which is an aspiration port and put it to a biomanual aspiration. While the fluid is still going on, the chamber is still formed. All right, so you're not lo losing the chamber. It's called the hybrid technique, which Dr. Tushar, I, I gave him a little help only, majority of his work only. So if you're doing a surgery and you don't have a third handpiece uh, side port made, if you don't have two side ports, you can keep the incision, the probe in the middle only, and the side port on the left side you can use for a aspiration. Okay, so it's called hybrid, in which you've got a bimanual as well as a coaxial both. And this is an old technique, and I think you people should know about this, because otherwise, if you plan to do bimanual and you don't have a third incision, we have to create one after filling the viscoelastic in the chamber. Otherwise, if the chamber is shallow, you might damage the RS. So with this one, because the sleeve is still holding into the incision and causing the fluid to go in, it's, it's locked in, right? And the chamber is formed, so you can come with the side. So sub-incisional, especially if they get stuck, you can change over left hand and do it. Thank okay. You, sir. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I think you were very observant, very good. So that means she's doing. Which who who may be joined in practice? Your own practice. Senior surgeon. He has got a name. As you don't want to say that. He does he know your hair? Okay, that's why. Then forget it. Okay. <laughs> I think it's not senior junior, it's the experience which counts at the, at the end of the day. See, the, what you people do in practice, maybe we'll not be able to uh, replicate that here because some things which they do that's so daring, I mean, they don't use viscoelastic, but they still charge the patient for heel on GVs and all, and lenses also. So let's not go there. So let's stick to the quality of the surgery and technologies. Okay, any other question you have? No, 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 my name is not there. Next session, uh, I think there's the next session. Oh, my name is still there. Okay, so you'll take out the next session then. Uh, number, th she's gone out. Dr. Radhika, would you like to talk about elastic flaps? Yeah, we can finish it off. So next is going to be a complication how it could have been avoided in management. It's a video-based uh, 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 session. And uh, Dr. Tushar uh, Lomi, you can come up here. And Manpreet must be there with Dr. Titial. Okay, so mm -hmm. fine. So first, uh, we can take a talk from Dr. Radhika, she'll be talking about elastic fold, flap fold. So when you're doing the elastic surgery, is it, is it that there's no complication which can happen when you switch over the blade? Blade cuts had its own problem, elastic has its own set of problem. So we'll be discussing and f after that, okay. So uh, uh, she going to be telling us about elastic flap folds, how, when and how you should avoid these ones. And uh, I think that's very important because if you've done a very good uh, elastic procedure and everything has gone well, and you have strias on the next day, which puts in a cylinder in the eye and the, uh, the power goes out of, out of uh, sync. And these patients, you actually have to take out entire epithelium and uh, cut it out and put BCLs and do all the hot fluid washes and it still never goes away. So best thing to check the flap is immediately after the surgery before the patient goes out, you bring the patient out, put the patient on slit clamp under high magnification and scan the entire cornea. If you have a speck of some foreign body behind the flap or there's a fold on the flap, please go right inside and do and pick it up and wash it again because that's the only time you have. So please see this patient immediately. Uh, whenever you're ready, Radhika. You ready? Yes, switch over. Okay, thank you, sir. Radhika. Good morning, everyone. Uh, is the mic audible? Am I audible? Yes. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about flap folds. When we're talking about flap folds or striae, there are small wrinkles or, or folds in the flap as a result of elastic surgery. The classification, there are several classifications. Practically, they're largely the most common classification. epithelial or stromal and the thickness whether they lose epithelial or pseudo stri and then also a simple classification based on intervention that is whether you're required to do something or they can just be left as they are. Now coming to the most common classification and practical classification, micro stri, if you really see pure and simple, they are fine microscopic 
superficial wrinkles. They involve the Bowman's layer or the epithelial basement membrane and they are generally asymptomatic. The macrostri are larger, more easily visible. Their full thickness of the flap, not full thickness of the cornea, but largely full thickness of the flap. There is a noticeable visual impairment and they usually require surgical intervention depending upon the uh, case and the patient's uh, 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 sort of uh, acceptance, etc. Now, just in a few important considerations, as Professor Coker said uh, right in the beginning, it's better to have a knowledge of these beforehand and be preemptive in every method during your LASIK procedure because actually the key is to prevent them rather than struggle with their treatment later on. Now, what is basically happening is the flap is kind of slipping or wrinkling. It's not nicely falling back into place in the normal contour that is expected because there's an uneven alignment of the flap edge with the epithelial ring. Now, what are we doing during LASIK? We're lifting the flap and then we are changing the contour of the cornea to correct the refractive error. So there is a misalignment or a mismatch between the posterior contour of the flap, which was the pristine cornea, and the newly altered stromal bed. So there is a natural tendency for flap, but usually the cornea is quite forgiving and usually it falls into place. So the step of hydration, when you're hydrating under the flap and putting the flap down, that is important. So you're floating the flap down and letting it naturally fall into position. Don't sort of mechanically force the flap anywhere. And uh, that, that's one thing to, to, uh, to sort of neutralize this tenting effect. And of course, there is a positive correlation between the magnitude of ablation and the incidence. You need to be extra careful in cases where the refractive error is higher and a greater amount of treatment is done. And again, early detection. So obviously, when you see the patient on the slit lamp and you do see it right on the first, I mean, right after surgery, don't hesitate to take the patient back there and then because that is the easiest time. You just need to float it back and just, you know, um, put it back in place. Although, um, and of course, if it's seen after the first day itself, which come the first post-op day, then you assess the nature and the extent. Don't be overly, overly vigorous if it is not affecting the vision. So you may see a few folds, which may be, because it, it is an inherent part of the procedure in a, in a way. Um, so you could have cons considered conservative, but if there is a requirement for surgical intervention and early intervention is advisable, you have to lift the flap, hydrate it, stretch it and then reposition and if there's a resistant to stretching as was mentioned earlier you may actually have to debride the epithelium because the longer you've left it the epithelium has remodeled in the new and that is now uh, holding the flap back from a sort of it's a mechanically tethering and preventing the flap from getting stretched as you would like to and if it's very late intervention for example the patient may have been operated elsewhere and has now come to you and you, you have to take care of it, then you will have to lift it. You may actu actually have to suture it. And the last resort is you may have to consider a surface ablation. So I do not have an example of a flap stri per se, which was managed, but I have a similar kind of a case. And a lot of the principles remain the same. So I'm going to share this um, presentation. A 27-year-old male had presented for refractive surgery for cosmetic reasons in January. This was um, sort of just before the pandemic hit India. It was an IT employee. He had a history of use of glasses for 10 years. Last change of power was two years before that. He had a history of contact lens use occasionally, which he had worn three years before. And he had no systemic illness, no previous history of refractive surgery, no history of contact sports on any acne medication. This was his UCVA. BCVA was 6 by 6 and his power was a spherical correction and his anterior chamber lens was all fine, tear film assessment, everything was fine, fundus was fine and this was his uh, refractive findings. So uh, these were his parameters on the pentacam, the pachymetry was adequate, these were his maps and the bad map also screening was all fine. So there were certain cal calculations were made for the refractive surgery, which were done. The surgery was done. The primary surgery was femtosecond LASIK done on 12th of March in 2022. This was the optic zone, the diameter and the thickness. Now, during the right eye, there was a suction loss and an incomplete flap was created. So the surgery had to be aborted and the left eye surgery went uneventful. 
So the left eye patient was fine and uh, he had vision of 6-6 six, six uncorrected and he was counseled that his right eye surgery could be done after a few weeks but then there was a knockdown due to COVID and patient was lost to follow up and then the patient came back um, several months later and a complete refractive surgery was done to consider for re-surgery and here we decided to go for a PRK. These are his clinical photographs, this were the parameters and this was the findings on examination. Here is you can see the um, pentacam and the corvus was also uh, 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 within the normal range. ASOCT showed a um, uh, incomplete flap. The surgical decision was uh, the uh, femtosecond LASIK surgery was planned as the flap had completely healed. Otherwise, uh, if it had not, one would have considered a PRK. No scar or margin could, could be appreciated and surgery went un uneventful. And I'll just go over the surgical video for you. Resurgery. Okay, so it's not uh, the surgical video is not showing. So basically, just to show that you ha may have resurgery, you may have to relift the flap, you may have to go for reoperation of a case of uh, femtosecond surgery. It's very important to counsel the patient right in the beginning when they come for workup, so they're they're prepared for these further interventions later on. Okay? Right. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you. So she said rightly, a stitch in time will save you nine. So. Please put the patient on the stretch time next uh, hour and do it. So thank you. And now I can, I'll ask Prafulla to take over and the rest three talks are all smile. So we can have together and we have a join of smile here. So we can discuss them later on. Prafulla, you got your five minutes. And what Dr. Radhika has showed. Okay, seven minutes. Okay. Two for the noodles. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, so what Dr. Radhika has said that strias can happen. Micro strias you can ignore. But if the patient knows that there's strias in the eye, if somebody talks in front of the patient, it's going to be in his mind also. So please be very careful what you talk to the patient when you talk, because these are all local topical surgeries. So you've got to be very careful. You might get into trouble with 6665 vision with a little strias. He can take you to the court. So please be careful. Refractive patients are the ones in which you are offering them. Uh, don't overpromise and underdeliver, please. Uh, Profil, all yours. I think very important point. Uh, yesterday only I had one referral, you know, from a patient who had failed in an army because he had a few micro uh, stria in the yeah. periphery, yeah. and vision was six six, and uh, those can happen in a thin flap uh, surgery sometimes, yeah. and we should be very very careful tackling no, those patients. No, no, no. They do have ha no, no, not with the thickness of the flap. It's a technique per se. You can have with 120 also, with 140 also we've seen strias. So a thin flaps also, also if you do it in high myopes because there is a tenting kind of a thing and so it has to Whenever you do a high refractive correction, you are taking the uh, the uh, the stroma away. So lens, the fi these fibers will, the capsule will, uh, the anterior, sorry, cap has to fall back and make get the contour. So you can have strias, but that are mostly in the periphery as Dr. Tital was telling. So in the central, we don't get much. But yes, if you have in the center, Please pick it up immediately within an hour of the surgery when the patient is about to be discharged, sent back. Bring him back, float it. And the other thing which I want to say is, Radhika, if you, if you have these flaps, you f take them to the OT again immediately and put lots of fluid under it. They get edematous. So once they get edematous, then they take the contour very well. And later, later on, the, uh, the edema will resolve slowly and they become more amenable to fitting down into the slits. That's one trick which we tried doing and it worked. Namrata. No, I agree with you. The only problem is when they are long standing, then they yeah, are yeah. really bad. I mean, if it comes the next day, you already lost the battle. So you have to see all the patient on slit lamp before the patient goes from the LASIK lab. Even if you're doing 100 cases in a day or 150 or 200, you have to see this patient right there before they go out. Okay? Profil, yours. PCR. I think now it's good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be speaking on interoperative PCR. It's good morning, Profil. Why are you? Okay, again, good morning. <laughs> So the session is basically how you could have avoided and what you should do. So uh, my first video will be discussing all the aspects of PCR. Then I'll subsequently go through a few uh, cases to just to highlight those points that we'll be discussing here. So this was a case of hypermature senile cataract. You saw a nice surgery by Dr. Banpit today morning. So here also Rex is of adequate size, but there was some difficulty in chopping the nucleus. This do happen when your nucleus is a uh, little bit on brownish side, you find it difficult to chop and uh, you just see here that now the nucleus which is moving freely is not moving and now there is a... How 
can you pause this? Okay, so the question is what's going on? What happened? What was the problem that led to this? Why there is tilting of one pool? What's going on actually? <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. No, this is by design you're trying to show or this is a default? No, no, this is... Oh, this is a, by default. AV team also wants to <laughs> play a part in this. Sudden deepening. So, nucleus is tilting like the words are tilting like your nucleus. So in the yeah. meantime, they they make it right. <laughs> any suggestion why that happened? Why there was tilting of the pole? Anybody? Doctor, oh, answer this. Why tilt? Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> There is likely uh, rent there, so the nucleus started uh, going down, so it was tilting in that side. Uh, while chopping in periphery, there might have. No, this is a total cataract, so can't you guess? There might be zonular. No, no, total cataract, what can't you see? Posterior. cataract or defect or a post bitter retina surgery, you have a PC uh, already been touched by somebody. So that can happen. But other other option could have been, you know, if the rexus was torn anterior, uh, which extended to posterior side. Or? Yeah, no, no, no. This or it can be so. sort of a genital dialysis. One area, the entire genital has broken because of a very heavy rotation. Then you can have a tilting happening. Vitreous will push that area. Okay. So we can, can we go to next uh, talk if there's some difficulty? No. Because everything is still dead here. DMD or Namarta, please. I think I can continue now. So now uh, okay, it's come, it's come, it's come. Yeah, please. So these are the signs, right? One of the uh, in in this patient, we had this tilting of one pole. Why? Because if you would have noticed carefully, the last attempt to make a chop was quite deeper into the posterior plate directly and that was a blind chop. So that led to that PCR. So once this happens, what next? So I'm not going to pause anymore because my PPD also gets... So once this happens, the most important step is you have to isolate the nucleus to a safer area. So inject some viscoelastic, viscote followed by helon or viscodispersive followed by viscocohesive and bring the nucleus to a safer area and then you can continue uh, to decide what to do about. So this is viscoat, you all know, this is the viscoat dispersive. First coat the PC and then uh, inject some helon or something like that. For beginner, this is a very important point. Remember, if you are dealing with a case where the FECO has just started or you have a big chunk of nucleus left or the rent has occurred during hydro dissection uh, or if the nucleus that is whatever lemon is remaining is a very brown, brunish and hard part, then it's always better to convert into an ECC. If you decide to go for ECC, then few points you have to remember here, as I have highlighted here. If there are no vitreous, then you can easily enlarge the wound and deliver the nucleus. However, if there is vitreous, then you have to do a good vitrectomy and then isolate the nucleus to a safer place and then you can enlarge the wound and deliver the nucleus. So this is what being done in this patient also, you, if you will see. So the nucleus isolated into enter chamber, the wound was extended with scissor. Now again there is a point, few of you may be preferring corneal scissor to extend the wound, few may be keratom, that could be a point of discussion later on. Now this is how the nucleus was delivered and I will show you both clips, one was this and the other was using a vectus. So which is the best, I think most of us would agree the ideal way is to take out the nucleus using a vectus. Please don't do pressure counter pressure technique. In PCR, uh, there are few things that you should always remember. One of the most important part is never try pressure counter pressure technique while removing the uh, nucleus. If you do that, then you will lead to more vitreous prolapse. Once the nucleus is out, then you can do a vitrectomy using either one scissor at the wound and then subsequently take your cutter inside. You can use Simco cannula or bimanual irrigation aspiration to remove any remaining cortical matter. So this is a vitrectomy cutter I am using. So always start with a cut IMO. 
because if you start with IA cut more, then you may uh, create traction. Once the vitreous that is there in the AC is removed, then you can go for uh, IA cut mode. IOL depending on the support system, but please don't put IOL like this. One half take in sulcus, one in vitreous. Always put in sulcus appropriately. And you can see in this patient, the IOL was put in sulcus because there was a good 360 degree rim. And in the last, you have to close the wound. Remember, always try to get a watertight closure. And before uh, completing the surgery, always put pilocarpine. Check if there are any vitreous tweaks. And then, if you are still doubtful, you can inject a tricot to check for any vitreous strand. If that is there, please remove all the vitreous and then close your surgery. It's always to put suture and close it. So these are other few cases. Here I will just go through the important aspects. Here you can see uh, the there was a rent while doing the last part, and also the assistant come contributed to, to that usually by making the cornea absolutely dry so that surgeon couldn't see, and then. As usual, you have to do a good vitrectomy and the support was good. So somebody, the surgeon could put a three, uh, I think 6.5 let's yes, into the circus here. This is the another case where you can see the, in this case, everything was managed perfectly. The PCR occurred during the early parts as uh, I showed you in the first case. Immediately after making two parts, the surgeon realized that. Then inject viscote and helon and isolate the nucleus to a safer area, convert it. Here the surgeon is using a 5.2 blade. You can use either scissor or 5.2 blade and then uh, take it out using a vectis instead of uh, doing that pressure counter pressure technique. And then you can put a 6.5 IOL in the sulcus. Now this is a video I am showing this for the third time. Each time I show uh, this video there are some hypotheses why this happened. So far the hypothesis is that because the rexis was small and bolus of fluid was injected and the enter chamber was completely filled with helon. So the moment you injected the PC rupture and in all such cases whenever this things occurs early it's always better to convert instead of continuing with FECO as you can see in this the FECO was tried to be uh, attempted and ultimately there was a nucleus drop. So I'll skip few of the videos because I think uh, my time is over. So last part is uh, sir was highlighting in the live surgery even during insertion of IOL also you can have a PCR. So as you can see here while inserting the IOL the, there was a PC rupture. Various factor could be either your IOL was too tight and you are pushing it to the force or your entire bag is was filled with helon. So the capsule has very much stress, very stressed and stressed so that could have led to this rupture. So be careful, don't be relaxed in postopolar cataract. I think live surgeries have already showed you how to attempt such cases. One point that I would like, like to highlight, even if your OCD suggests there are no defect, please take all the precautions that you would like to take for the postopolar cataract, just like sir did. And these are IOL implantation and I have already told you, please don't put IOL like this. If you are in any doubt, then keep it for a second stage. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. I think uh, PCR is one uh, problem we uh, do face every time, you know. Sorry, my something is running. And it has to be, as rightly pointed out, it has to be picked up in the beginning before uh, it goes to a difficult situation and managed appropriately. And your operation theater team, operation systems has to be geared up for uh, any complication. And uh, that PCR can relate to a change in a surgical uh, scenario totally. Instead of a multifocal, you may have to put a monofocal lens in those cases. The patient counseling has to be important. Or you may have a nucleus drop. Then again, you require a bit of retina setup for these cases. Every case has to be assessed on the table properly. Never do things which you can't handle. So maybe you can just leave the case, tell somebody to have a look, some senior person. Or give it to other person to handle that who will be in a better mind and mindset at that time and do comfortably uh, things in a proper manner. So those are very important tips and uh, normally they can be a morphological uh, cases which predispose the uh, posterior capsular dehiscence or rupture or they can be atrogenic uh, posterior capsular damage happening during your procedure. So both has to be handled in an appropriate manner. As the idea was to uh, put in your mind that it can happen and why it has happened has to be thought about. So you see your videos again and again in the evening, see why this happened, 
how I could have avoided this in this particular case. Next case, you do it in that manner. So always you have a complication, you have done a good, you feel you have done a beautiful surgery, see your videos again, again and again, you realize some points maybe can be improved also, some point you may be doing very good, some point may be difficult, change that. Difficult situations, complications, must see them multiple times, maybe you can get reviewed by other, another person, he or she will point it out, okay, this was not correct, okay, thank you. Dr. Namrata, please. So I'll be talking to you about uh, desmet membrane detachment. I will be in fact showing you videos of management of desmet membrane detachment, how you can cause them and how you should manage them both. So uh, uh, just to see some of the videos, there's a small DMD which is here, which also can be seen on the intraop OCT microscope. So when this happens, uh, uh, then you have to, uh, at the end of the surgery, instill air and see that the correct uh, side is uh, getting attached and it is not uh, it is not becoming a, a flap sort of a thing now this is yet another case in which the desmets membrane detachment was there at the wound side can we have the lights off otherwise it will become how did you get it uh, f so far away op opposite the quadrant uh, dmd there was no incision there okay so uh, there is a there is a DMD which you can see here, which also can be seen here. Catch. Not all of them. They were my cases, so I wouldn't let you. I wouldn't know how it caused. Okay. So uh, then, uh, just to say that you should inject air bubble in these cases at the end of the surgery. Now this was another case, but here it's a on-site uh, wound site DMD, which is appreciable here. But when you get that, don't leave it at that. Hydrate the wound first then put the air bubble and then subsequently you can also uh, pilocarpenize the pupil if it is required. Uh, just if you put the air bubble that itself is good enough. In some of the cases I will be showing you, you might have to inject gas but in this case only the air bubble is instilled and this is just to see all the cross section where you see that there is no uh, desmets membrane attachment. Then there is a small loose sort of a desmets membrane again uh, over here which can be highlighted here and again at the end of the surgery you put air bubble there so that the desmets membrane gets attached. So uh, this was about the intraop. Now if you get post-op cases also you get which we get referred from uh, other places and in all those cases we like to do anterior segment OCT. This was one such case. So it is important to go from an area which is relatively clear. You, this is a 26 gauge needle being used but I like to use a 30 gauge needle. Get a single bolus single bolus and then keep that for good five to seven minutes just like we do for DSEC grafts and you will see on the table itself even if you don't have an intraop OCT microscope this will begin to clear. If it doesn't you can do a little bit of external massage also there. So when you keep that for five minutes and then when you take it out one can uh, put a little bit of pressure here so the uh, air doesn't come out with the needle itself. Now this is again a desmets membrane detachment which was referred then notice that you've Put the air bubble and you think you are done but you are not and again notice this is hazy this is not quite clear so when you keep that thing pressure for good four to five minutes and uh, also do a little bit of external massage this will begin to clear up and this will begin to uh, attach and uh, if it does not even if you leave it up like this uh, it will attach in the post-op period but because the IOCT was there and there was still shallow detachment we saw that uh, we tried to address that now this is a little taut one, if it is taut then it gets very difficult to attach and you have to do that external massage for a prolonged period of time there and uh, if it is very long standing it may not clear on the table also and sometimes in these taut desmet membrane attachments you may even have to do a desmetotomy. Now this was uh, yet another case uh, which was referred uh, with a desmet membrane detachment and uh, again in this the air bubble and it was uh, referred on the uh, second day itself and uh, in this the bubble was instilled uh, so that now the desmets membrane is pretty much attached but this case was to highlight that you may have to do repeat kind of injections so this did not respond to a single injection because when the desmets membrane becomes detached then it kind of becomes loose also and with the uh, uh, with the uh, fact that it remains so it's it's still there that little bit is still there in the post operative period 
So I won't wait for it. I would go and uh, do it again till the time that it is uh, attached and it gets a little clear. So this we had to inject twice. Now sometimes you may have to put a suture because uh, the edges of the Desmet's membrane are so taut that they are not opposing. And this is also a repeat uh, uh, surgery which is being done by first installation of C3F8 gas, it did not attach. So uh, again, you put the pressure on for good five minutes there and then while the pressure is on, your assistant is actually uh, with a positive pressure pu pushing the bubble, you put the suture. And after putting the suture, this needle is taken out and there can be two ways of doing it. One is you can use the swap stick and Dr. Tetyal sir has also described use of viscoelastic blob. But on the table itself, most of them would clear up. And uh, this was a case of phaco emulsification following uh, DALC because it was an intumescent cataract. And uh, this got again detached. So there is a gap which is uh, present over there. And uh, even after putting air bubble, it's not attached. So now you have to put, give stab incisions, very much like the stab incisions that we give for DSEC surgery. And once you give the stab incisions, you can actually see the fluid which comes out and then put in the air bubble again. And then when you put in the air bubble, uh, the C3F8 gas again, uh, then it becomes pretty much attached uh, and remains so. Now this was a case in which the desmet membrane detachment was noticed while doing the maneuvers itself and notice it's a, it's a, not a small wound side detachment, but a detachment which is going still further. So when this happens, it is important you put viscoelastic first, get it to attach and then uh, do uh, irrigation aspiration very gently and then uh, the intraocular lens has been implanted and again at the end of the surgery notice that this has now become loose and uh, uh, the iris is also coming out at the same time and so again it is important to address this and uh, the after putting the iris back uh, again uh, air was instilled in this but ideally SF6 gas can be instilled and once it becomes loose it is uh, it, it loses its uh, uh, elasticity uh, which is there and then uh, it can create a problem. Now this was a post dal case again in which uh, external massage and installation of SF6 or C3F8 gas will cause it to attach and if you do external massage for quite some time it does uh, attach over a period of time. Now uh, this what is this? This is also a Desmet's membrane which is there. But if you notice that this is going right up to the graft hose junction. So it is the retained Desmet's membrane of the host. It is not the Desmet's membrane of the recipient. And when you are doing in post keratoplasty cases, you need to understand that. And this, of course, we have described this technique. We use Tripan blue dye in this case to stain it. And then subsequently, uh, we had to excise this because this is the retained desmet membrane of the host and uh, not of the uh, donor. So uh, it is important to do a good uh, in AS OCT, uh, anterior segment OCT or intraop OCT to know from where this uh, detachment is emanating. Is it emanating from the donor cornea or is it coming from beyond the graft hose junction as was uh, seen in this case and there were some remnants which actually did not come out. So with the help of the vitrector probe, they have also been cut, but this is the uh, end of the case. So uh, if you have DMDs, you may need air, SF6 gas or C3F8 injection. External massage is useful in these cases. Repeat injections may be required. When the Desmet's membrane is taut, you may even have to do desmetotomy with the help of the uh, MVR blade. Suture may be required, stab incisions may be required. And when you do uh, see an intraoperative uh, desmet membrane detachment while you are doing phaco maneuvers, which is large, first thing is you put a dispersive viscoelastic, cause it to attach, lower your parameters, put pilocapine at the end of the surgery and inject air. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Namrata, for highlighting the various ways and various types of uh, desmet membrane detachment seen in uh, our patients. And in the meantime, Manpreet can put up your uh, presentation. I think uh, it is very important to know uh, in a phaco cataract surgery complications and DMD is you know uh, is the largest number of uh, complication which can happen in a cataract surgery. It may not be significant, it may be significant. Mostly it is very insignificant, especially wound side desmet detachment. So there are situations where you can have a DMD in your cases. So you have a 
patient himself or herself that is a morphological feature in the patient which can predispose patient for a desmoronic detachment but disease patient may be suffering then you have a iatrogenic production that is your surgical steps so there are various surgical st steps which can enhance the desmoronic detachment happening in your cases so let me ask few of you uh, if they can tell us what are those clinical disease or disorders where we can have more dmd let's have somebody raise the hand who can answer this clinical disease which can in increase the chance of desmoronic in other person not him yes any anybody uh, delegates okay give it to him then now nobody else then which are those <laughs> clinical situation you can have more chance of dmd the older age of patient one is older age uh, fuchs dystrophy fuchs dystrophy then uh, uh, pseudo exfoliation may have um Okay, anything where your endothelial function is poorer, okay. so you can have more chances of a desmoronic detachment happening uh, in towards the you know during the any surgical procedure. Rightly pointed out. Uh, then the anatomical feature wise, which are those cases where you have more chances of wound getting you know manhandled? Uh, if there is shallow anterior chamber. Shallow anterior chamber. Uh, pass. If there are deep pass, set eyes. Deep set uh, eyes. Small aperture. Uh, old patients. Whether your entire orbital fat is uh, not there, so these are very difficult situation. Hazy cornea or difficult to visualize, poor microscopes. Okay, those are things. Okay, anybody else? Uh, uh, surgical step wise. Hyperopic patient. Okay, Dr. Sudarshan wants to say something. Please, uh, Anushka, give the mic. But these are very small, small things which are very important to realize. Once uh, you've done a pre-op and you think the patient is normal and still have it. The chances are that you caused it, and uh, could be anything, starting from the incision to the probe to the tubing size. The tube is this old uh, tubing on the top. Your needle goes in, tube stays back, and every time you push it again, it will cause. So any surgical procedure and clear corneal incision are the cause of DMD. Let's be very clear. Earlier, good old days, ICC, ECC, IOLs, we were all at the limbal. Right. So please, when you want to go to the clear cornea, this is a thing you have to be very careful. You're actually inducing it. So your probe, the sleeve have to be tightly fit. There shouldn't be loose sleeve. Incision has to be same as the. It shouldn't be too tight incision. And hyperopic eyes will have more, and because the chambers are shallow, and you go again and again. Any time you do multiple uh, manipulation going into the chamber, I think that's why then it happens more. So okay. you have to be very careful about that. I think a nice point, like uh, Dr. Manpi did publish uh, the you know incision uh, types. And its variety and its association with the you know DMD in those cases, and Dr. Sudarshan nicely pointed out anything limbal, you have lesser chances. More corneal, more chances. If you use a ragged uh, incision, your blades are very poor, then you have more chances because you already disrupt the you know desmoid attachment in these cases. A clean wound, like suppose you use a diamond or a lasers, you may have lesser chances of a wound side desmoid detachment. So it is how you create the incision is the most important part to either avoid or to produce DMD in your case. The incision you have to be very very careful. That is the main incision. So you have to make an incision, main incision in a manner where you have a normal intraocular pressure, normal anatomy. Do that incision which will be better off. Sometimes what happens? People do a you know side port entry. They in inject viscoelastic. The pressure is very high and you have an abrupt entry. So it is always better to do a main port sometimes with the Normal anatomy of patient, and you can manipulate ni very nicely because there is no other opening in these cases. So incision is the one which is the most important, uh, what you call uh, factor, or a, uh, which is going to give you what is going to happen to your patient uh, at every step, right from the your incision, your manipulation, hydro dissection, your phaco emulsification, coming out, coming going, and irrigation aspirin, IOL injection, any time, and most classically. The visibility or enhancement or desmoid detachment happens during the step of the hydration of the wound. So you have to be very careful hydrating your wound where you already seen the the frill of desmoid membrane in those cases. I would rather put a suture if you have a very difficult, then try to push the pressure from the sides. Yes, Sudarshan. We're getting lots of DMDs in IFC patient now. I don't know what's wrong with the anatomy. We're doing a study on that. So if we done about a fifty in the last couple of years. 
DMD was seen at least in 40 to 50 percent of these patients, smaller wound site, but always in IFC, I'm always particular. So I started making scleral endoscopy. Yeah, that could be one of the parameters, but yeah, that's the patient in which you've got to be careful because X, Y, and Z all are reduced. So your all the dimensions are reduced and the chamber is shallow. So be a little careful about that, in the, those patients. And because the eye is small, you tend to not use a bigger incision to put the probe. I think the incisions have to be the same for yeah. all these surgeries, despite the size of the eye. Yeah, thank you. I think the one uh, uh, case Namrata showed was patient came after a few weeks of surgery. We like to avoid that situation. You have to pick up that in, on the table and try to manage there. Don't wait for the next day where cornea totally white because desmoid membrane detachment will increase and you have a difficult situation. Yeah. Where we looked at cases of corneal edema which came to us and there were 100 plus cases and this is published. Out of which 60% of the cases had corneal edema because of DMD. And uh, if you address it, and the cases that were taken were within eight weeks. So that is to say that, of course, if you recognize it, you should handle it immediately. But even if within eight weeks you get a case which is referred to you, always go to do a AISOCT and put a gas there because then uh, you will save a endothelial keratoplasty. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Manpreet, uh, now uh, get back to our refractive surgery uh, problems. Uh, smile, yes. Thank you, sir. A very good afternoon to all of you. So my talk is on suction loss and smile, no financial disclosures. So smile has a learning curve which is much more as compared to the conventional corneal ablative procedures and suction loss is significantly higher for novice surgeons. Incidence ranges from 0.8 to 11 percent and in our experience there was around 2 percent suction loss in the initial learning curve. The pathophysiology is related to the docking mechanism. It's a soft docking that curvates rather than applanates the cornea. So there's a low pressure suction cone of 35 millimeter uh, mercury at the interface and longer suction times which are now decreased with the newer platforms. So these predispose to suction loss. So how do you manage first identify the underlying cause and identify the stage of suction loss. Of course, if the patient is uncooperative, moving, you have not docked properly, you have to take care of that. Then if suction loss occurs at less than 10% of the lenticule cut, you have to re you can redock and restart the procedure de novo. From more than 10% of the lenticule cut, you have to convert to surface ablation or LASIK at the same sitting and late or later date and a repeat smile is generally not feasible at this stage. Lenticule side cut, cap cut or cap side cut, you can restart the procedure in rescue mode from the point at which suction loss occurred. You can redock and repeat from that uh, stage itself and you have to re decrease the lenticule diameter slightly, recenter using the infrared light and the clear central bubble and if it occurs during cap side cut, reduce the cap diameter slightly so that you are in the correct, the correct planes are reached. So I'll just give a few case examples. In this there was entrapped conjunctiva and we had uh, initi initiated the suction. So what was done was suction was released and patient was counseled again and redocked and the surgery could be done uneventfully. Now this was the second case in which excessive eye movements by the patient led to suction loss after 2.81 mm of the lenticule cut had been completed. So as you can see here, there is a loss of suction initially only while we are initiating the laser delivery. So this is a challenging stage to have suction loss at because you cannot restart and complete smile at this stage. So what we did was surgery was abandoned, smile was not performed in this case and retreated after stabilization after three months with a large diameter LASIK. Now this is a controversial stage. When suction loss occurs during lenticule cut, what is the procedure of choice? So there are two approaches, either you convert to surface ablation LASIK at the later date, same sitting has also been described as an increased risk of higher order aberration, visual quality is impacted. Then a few surgeons have described a repeat smile at a different plane, 10 to 12 micro, 20 microns apart, there is a potential risk of multiple interfaces, interface irregularity and increased HOA. So our preferred technique is to convert to surface ablation or LASIK at a later date. Now this is another case. So it was docked uneventfully, laser delivery was started and while the lenticule cut is going on there is no issue, it's smooth but however there is a suction loss when the cap cut starts. 
So at this stage, you can re uh, restart the procedure in the rescue mode, redock, alter the parameters a bit, and you can use this opaque bubble layer as a reference to center again. So we restart, we clean the interface, of course, the patient interface, redock, and this green light helped aid fixation, the centration, and you use this uniform bubble layer to get a rough idea of where the centration should be while docking. Of course, there will be increased microadhesions when you are doing the lenticule dissection subsequently, but more or less the outcomes are very good, and there is no great challenge in extracting the lenticule if you do it properly. So lenticule dissection and extraction was uneventful. Of course, a few microadhesions were there, but otherwise it was smooth. Now, redocking and smile in the same setting. Bubble layer helps guide previous centration. There is a significant in larger mesopic pupil size because pupil center may be unstable. So, immediate redocking the bubble layer helps. However, it may also adversely impact the laser energy. And undercorrection of up to two diopters also has been described in some studies. So, some also advocate delaying the repeat procedure for one to two hours after initial suction loss. It ensures the disappearance of the gas bubbles and corneal edema. Is there better centration during the repeat procedure? We can't be sure. So good visual outcomes have been demonstrated by both the approaches by different authors. Predictability lower for immediate than for uneventful smile. This is another case in which the suction loss, the lenticule cut went smoothly. So there is a mild blinking movement that you can appreciate. However, the laser is going. So at the site of the cap side cut, if you see again, there was a suction loss at this point. Looks okay, but when we started with lenticule dissection, we realized that the cap side cut had not completed. So what was done was that manually, there was a one site where we can possibly enter the instrument. And through that site only, we could manage to initiate the delineation of the lenticule edge. And then the subsequent procedure was uneventful. So when this occurs, there is you can either read or restart. We didn't anticipate if it will open or not open. It was dicey, so we went ahead. And in this case, there was a double peripheral suction loss due to micro movements of the eye. However, the planes were formed completely and the full thickness uh, laser was complete. So we could proceed with lenticule dissection and extraction uneventfully. Just to sum up, suction loss in smile is more common than in LASIK because it is a low, a low suction pressure system. So management is based on the stage of suction loss. You have options of transepithelial PRK, repeat smile, immediate or delayed, with or without adjustment of laser parameters, conversion to femtosecond LASIK, and refractive lenticule extraction or pseudo smile can also be done in some cases. Favorable visual and refractive outcomes have been described if managed properly. I would like to acknowledge Professor Jeevan Estetyal and thank you so much. Thank you, <coughs> Manpreet. Uh, I think you showed all the you know uh, types of suction loss which can happen in a smile patient. But how do we avoid this situation coming? Which are those critical points we should uh, you know tell to patient or tell to yourself when you are doing surgery and achieve that so that suction loss chances go down? One, two, three, four. So first, of course, is patient counseling. Always counsel the patient yourself on the table while you're draping and initiating the procedure. Tell them that they have to fixate on the central green light. When the, and tell them that the, uh, from the to, uh, time point of suction on to suction off, there are 15 to 20 seconds in which they should not move the eye, even if the green light disappears. Because once the laser starts firing, the green light may not be that clearly visible. And if you observe peripheral suction loss, uh, do stop firing the laser rather than miss firing it because the rescue mode, especially during lenticule cut, less than 10% you can restart. But if you think that you'll be able to do it but the suction loss is significant, you may end up in more than 10% lenticule cut, which is the stage where you really do not want to have a suction loss. And Okay. I think few points are important. The first suction loss I had was a patient started jumping. I, I can't see the light. I can't see the light. In between, he got up. Because we didn't explain him that green light will be off after some time. So he was looking for green light and suddenly he jumped and suction loss happened in the, those cases. I think the most important part as we discussed in the life, uh, near life surgery also, the cornea should be moist, but the sac, conjunctival sac has to be absolutely dry. If there's a fluid there, the fluid will come into interface and you have a very high chance of a 
with a little micro movement you have, will have a suction loss so that is one important point to learn second is your speculum should be nicely away eyelashes should not be there drapes should not come into the uh, any area when you are putting suction because that's going to put a pressure onto the eye apart from the patient being explained and actually when you are starting the laser you should not uh, disrupt the patient's mindset you should not speak you know the patient will start listening and suddenly jerk so normally i say only one word do you have to listen to a ready sound and suction off and in between light will go off so he or she will wait till the suction off sound and patient should not move towards the end also if patient blinks towards the end also your entire uh, opaque bubble layer goes in a different side and you have a very difficult time also so all is better to have a patient fixated till the suction off sound yes sir what i'm saying is that uh, one we are blaming the patient yeah but on the other hand when we are beginner surgeons we are very anxious any time there is a suction loss we create a panic and we keep firing first thing is please undock take the suction off you can take the suction off and dock it again what happens if you do it again the patient is still not gone more than 10% if it's gone beyond then you are in trouble so that's first second is the last one which is showed in which the side cut was not formed so we had one patient which the side cut was not there then we did a we did a circle in that one so what a circle is that you cut as like a flap but what we did was entire thing was a hinge a small part was left to be fired so by a circle with a hinge of about a 270 degree was there so the cutting edge was only the hinge so that one was cut again and then we could go into the same again so that is one thing you can add on if you want i can give you a video to complete your set and that can work well and then we have a doin of a smile <laughs> <laughs> Then people have used a blade also to make a side cut. But sometimes it doesn't work. That can make you a difficult, you know, depth dissection, and things can be very difficult also. And circle, what Sudarshan is saying, is a, a beautiful way to handle these cases. And uh, in this particular case, I could, I thought I have a one space where I could enter my, you know, this thing. I, it did went through no, that. This was okay. This was yeah. pretty okay. And, and it the, went to a posterior plane. And other thing you could done is you could have. push the obl towards the incision and it actually demarcates yeah. the opening where it is there the bubble is coming out you can go in from there would have made it easier okay can i have the uh, my slide there yeah so this is one uh, second complication uh, apart from the suction loss which is the disaster sometimes in you know, managing the patient but this can also make you, you know feel uncomfortable during your procedure but as you grow you know in your experience this is a very uh, you can say less difficult situation for you to the in the beginning when i had first case uh, then i had to think uh, various ways to diagnose this i had patient taken patient to anti second oct then uh, done a various uh, ways to look into ioct microscopes but it's very simple and i'll tell you how to handle this case so this is what uh, dr manpreet showed we do have a difficult situation coming up in the beginning so this is our first 50 eyes around 16% right from the suction loss to a cap side cut tears but in next 50 i it came down to 2% in fact uh, now we don't have a suction loss at all we have understood understood how to avoid suction loss in these patients it is basically our apprehension to start with you don't soak the uh, you know congenital sac you don't tell the patient properly sometimes your assistants are laughing or doing something some jokes patient start you know re responding to those jokes so things should be little <laughs> Definitely manage in a smile patients. It's not like LASIK patient where suction is 150 millimeter mercury. Even you do like this, suction will not go off. So let let's see how uh, we appreciate around you know zero uh, to nine percent is the incidence uh, in these patients. We described anterior segment OCT to look into uh, where exactly the lenticular is attached towards a cap or towards a stomal side. We use a Sinsky hook uh, device to you know delineate the uh, cap lenticular additions. and ioct microscope with dr namrata has beautifully described in these cases so any complication in any surgery holds true for a refractive surgery also going to make a patient's rehabilitation little difficult your post op outcome may be little prolonged to get a 66 vision in these patients and just to show here this is one video where uh, you can see a very nice orientation so this is the you know cap this is a lenticular cut both are beautifully visible and this is a very uniform obl so this is a very nice you know you can say application of laser so what we do we start with the incision opening first then we we'll go to anterior 
So once you have anterior dissection, then you go to posterior. So normally, this is the 2 millimeter incision. If you do a 4 millimeter or 3 millimeter, you should open two areas. So one for anterior, one for posterior. So that you are in a two different area, you know that you are in a different planes. But this is being a 2 millimeter, you have no scope. We'll in first do a anterior, then go posterior. So just see here. So this is one of case I was doing, and I entered. So I thought this is the anterior opening. Then I'll normally use a spatula like this and do anterior dissections. So this is my experience. I knew that I'm in a different plane. But a beginner's wind may not realize this. So how do we know that I'm in a different plane? Can anybody say, uh, Dr. Lomi? Sorry, you do refractive surgery? No, there's somebody else. Let's give it to uh, our senior resident, Piche. Anushka, do you so you can see there now this frill and you will see the frill again. So you see the frill again here. So this will only be seen and the prominence of this risk, uh, ring will be seen if you are on the posterior plane. So if you don't realize that you are on the posterior, uh, already gone to posterior plane, you keep looking for another posterior plane. In that process you keep damaging the stroma there. You might use a sharper instrument, you might use the same blade. And you create a, another, you know, false facets, which is not desirable. So this is a case I had, you know, entered posteriorly. So how do we, uh, how could have we avoided this situation? So this is, this is what I'm going to show. How do we avoid cap lenticular addition? These are two very, very important points you should know. And this is what I'm doing. Same technique here. I go anterior first. This is a two millimeter pocket been created. Then I'll go posterior. And I'll create another pocket here. So this is, there are, this is what we see, a crescent sign. So this will be only visible if you have a two plane dissection. If you a single plane, difficult to see crescent to begin with. So now this is a, another patient. I'll make an anterior dissection. Go a little, it's not very, very thick. It's a hardly 50 micron. Don't think you have to go very deep. It is quite thin. So many people make a, this is a stop sign. So once I have dissected, it's very difficult to go beyond this. So this tells you that you are on a proper plane. So crescent sign and stop two signs which makes that you are in a proper plane. So once you have a cap lenticular addition, which I showed in my case, now what to do now? So this is a sharper instrument we take here. So first we described a Sinsky hook. So what I did, I took a Sinsky hook right up to here. I lifted this, you know, crescent and this is a test also. It is attached to a cap or attached to the stoma. So if I nudge this, the frill will be seen, that means it, there's a cap lenticular addition. If you don't see the frill, you still have to dissect posteriorly. So again, try and you'll get to a, ni a nice position there. So this is a very nice test to <laughs> decide what is the actual position of a lenticule. So I started doing this. So once I made this uh, no frill, then I took a, uh, uh, the forceps and tried to tear. In that process, I had an extension of a tear because it's very difficult to rotate the entire flap. The idea here is to, this meniscus should come right up to here, so that I can proceed like a normal case. You can see I've got a meniscus up to the central area. So this is the area of concern now, the large area. So I can take my dissector over that without geopardy damaging the incision site. So see, I've gone anterior. In this case, I have dissected completely the uh, left hand side. The flap goes to one side. So this is what I was telling people not to Dissect the entire one half. Leave a little attachment so the dissection becomes simpler. Now I, I can pull it this and it comes out. So very simple. There are two uh, ways to look into uh, you know incision area. Should be dissected first, then go to the anterior posterior dissection. Don't try to go right from the incision to an anterior area because in that process you may not be sure which plane you are dealing with. And if you realize a little crescentic flap, you are in a proper plane. And if you have a nice dissection. Anyway, anterior or posterior, you can still manage, very simply. Thank you for kind listening. So, yeah, please. Alternatively, if you can't make out where the flap is or which side is, and if you inject a little bit of air, then the air delineates the edge of the flap. Yeah. Then also that helps you to uh, discern what your uh, morphology is. You know, there are various ways to uh, look into that. Uh, this is the routine procedure uh, manipulation you do 
before going to other ways to look into these areas. I think the little bit of uh, nudging is what is important in these cases that makes things very simple. Okay. Describe that air injection as edge sign yeah. and it is going to be published. So, Sarat, uh, you want to comment uh, what difficulty you face as a beginner in terms of a dissection or a starting the smile? Sir, out of the four smiles I did, one I went into the anterior plane, others were fine. Entry is all right, that's a way to enter. No, sir. I went into the anterior plane instead of uh, into the posterior plane instead of the anterior plane in one case. Okay. Other cases were fine. When one case I had too much of fluid inside, which had a difficulty in uh, this action. So that is one. Too much of fluid also, not entire your visibility goes down. And very difficult to dissect out. In that situation, either you, you know take out the fluid uh, by you know uh, massaging, and again do it. And if you have a dissection, prolonged dissection. The cap gets edematous and things again become very difficult in those cases. As you showed in a second case, sometimes your dissector has a fluid. Sister has a habit in putting this and giving to you. So you have to be careful not to yeah. give yeah, fluid, you know. Dry. Absolutely dry because. Yeah. So that has a sort of a negative section. The fluid will be seeped inside because there is a negative pressure in that uh, inside the dis cap uh, lenticule. Ah, Diksha, come again. Okay, next. What is next? Actually, uh, in my initial cases, like first case, I had a problem in dissecting. Like I was not familiar with the amount of force we need to apply. And there was traction on the conjunctiva, and I could not complete the dissection. Uh, in one of the cases, like while going posteriorly, I went to posterior, and posterior, and there was a small false track into the stroma. These are the problems that okay. I had. One video, no, if possible. Can you connect my laptop there? Ni <laughs> aega. Ni aero. Ni yo ha kya hai? Sidhe usse video se. Aega aega. I got it. 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 So, this is one uh, beautiful case of uh, doing PECO in a proper manner. So I am doing a good rexis uh, of around 5 millimeter. And you can see uh, this is around grade uh, 3 to grade 4 nucleus. Good dissection. The FACO is doing uh, completely. This is how we do a normal uh, FACO. The nucleus is rotated. You know, anything little uh, to us, I normally do a little trench so that I can hold deeper, then chop it. You can see uh, IOP 55 is, you know, I think that now I've shifted to 50 IOP in all my cases. So uh, you can see during chopping, there's no FACO power. You can see the side one. I'll hold it with the FACO, then no FACO. The so hold is important for uh, chopping your nucleus piece. The so entire thing is taken away. So this is a uh, beauty of a newer generation FACO machines. They emulsify nucleus as, as far as possible, uh, large size, small size, hard, soft. So I'm almost now two third uh, part has been taken care of. So you can see now this is the second last piece. So this is the piece now, larger piece which I thought I'll hold with the uh, FACO itself in the peripheral area and do it and see what happens here. The PC has got open. So can somebody tell what has happened in this? 
which the pc uh, so this is the piece i'm doing a wrong thing here so this is a piece uh, i'm pulling and going to the peripheral part which is thinner and the bulk is in the proximal part so this will tilt immediately you can see now in the high magnification this will tilt and my phaco uh, tip is exposed and which is hit the posterior capsule and there is a because the tilt the posterior capsule has lifted like this yeah so this is uh -huh. so this is what happens so how do you avoid that situation so this is a similar case sorry it will go for another minute or so this is a comfortable multi chop technique for a slightly harder 3 3 to 4 nucleus as mantri talked about don't take out the nucleus pieces otherwise tilting will happen take this you get this to central get everything to the central area and the piece should be nicely that uh, the if you have a pie the point should should be towards your side the bulk should be away from you like this now you can take out so this is a better way to handle those we don't try to pull that what mistake i did in my patient so this is how you complete an epicortical cushion is intact till the end this cushion will protect your posterior capsule in that patient because i ate the entire chunk there was no epicortical cushion left in that patient the so epicortical cushion rotation to your visible area of your axis important now how do you manage this patient now the large nucleus chunk is there i have used my uh, second hand dispersive viscoelastic being injected push the nucleus to one side so i have a tear this is the right in the center which is uh, been now plugged with the dispersive viscoelastic so vitreous will not come up so what i will be doing next uh, dr nupur so i will lodge in the incision putting a three piece lens as a scaffold yeah, in this patient so this will go beneath the uh, nucleus which i shifted to one side and the everything is plugged with a dispersive viscoelastic so this will act like a new posterior capsule now so this piece will be brought to the center over the iol and we have a cover of dispersive viscoelastic to hold the endothelium in a proper shape and you can now emulsify that so this is how you manage without having to fear into a having a vitreous coming in this patient so because this patient i could easily implant a three piece lens because this was a spherical iol there was a question somebody put if trifocal lens be put in a sulcus because trifocal lenses which have nowadays they are a single piece lenses so haptic cannot be put in a sulcus so what normally we do we put the lens haptic is inside the rexis and optic is captured so that is called reverse capture in these cases so that can be done if your anterior rexis is intact so this is the end of surgery thank you next session So the next session we have what next and I invite the chairpersons Professor Jeevan S. Tithyal, Professor Radhika Tandon, Professor Tushar Agarwal and Dr. Prapul on the dais. Tushar Bajaj. 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 Tushar Okay. So when you do multiple chops, does it ensure a multi-piece lens? I mean I was just wondering because multiple chops and multiple pieces so multiple piece does not mean it's a, to avoid a multi piece lens in the eye right so if you do multiple pieces you don't need multiple multi piece lens in the eye dr detail is smiling away okay so i've been given a task to talk about on table dialysis okay so okay i'll sh show some video it's not a very good quality this one first one but maybe next one so normally it happens more during the time of ia because you taken the nucleus out and you're happy and that's when the okay now all right here we now see what has happened. What happened? It was a cortical plate and suddenly there's a, too much of a clearing. You see there's no duality. This side you have cortex, that side is absolutely clear. So what happened? You pulled on the rexis. You pulled the rexis. Are you delegate? Uh, delegates, please. Achha, anybody? Are you, it's obvious. Please tell. You must have it seen it so many times. <laughs> Nobody? Are you, are you, are you.
the unit 4 guy yeah. uh, ie probe has hold the interior margin of the oh, axis okay so it's come in so what happens it's come in and with these machines as uh, you can always take the piece off and you can do the surge it will go away but it has happened so whatever you do you have to make sure that you cover up this area when you do a, a for the management okay so here we go oh sorry we gone to the Yeah, that's a spatula, flat spatula. Okay, so it's gone, and then I came out, and I put viscoat inside, a helon inside the bag, and viscoat on the top. Helon in the bag, we need to have a space, so need anything which has got higher molecular weight. So this is where you use a visco cohesive viscoelastic, right? So it will give you a space, and then the CTR goes in, and the CTR is going, and it's going to take, but it will buttress the strength from the intact zonules. And I will not do this for a muffins or some other patient because they are 360 degree all a week. In this one because I, we have created it ourselves, so we should handle it ourselves. So once it goes in, you see I am doing a bimanual now. I switch over from the coaxial because I want my infusion and aspiration separately because my infusion cannula can actually support the bag and I can aspirate then. So I have two separate, so I do not want them at the same place. And I could take the cortex at the end where it was stuck early. So it was a cortex which was stuck. This patient was a capsule lenticular adhesion in which the phaco went well but this one was attached. So it can happen with anybody. So and now this is the second situation now. Now see what happens. There is a dialysis here also. But this is a very old video at that time. This patient was not uh, actually affording. So what we did different was here. We enlarged the section and we put in a three piece. Uh, it was a PMMA lens. All PMMA. So this was I think about a 20 years old but at that time also we used to get dialysis, we will have it in the future also, we will have it in the premium lenses also. So you should know how to manage that and CTRs should be always available to you on your table. So once this, this has been put and we just saw the video uh, with the vitreous coming, so we cut the vitreous and then we went with the cutter. By the time the sister got the cutter ready, we had we cut it with the scissors, that is what we used to do earlier, that is what was taught to us by the good old faculty that time and put a dash of pilo pupil constricts and everything is good. The patient hardly does anything. This was a, a, a grandfather of one of the faculty, uh, junior faculty joined. So everything was going fine, it was very sticky cataract and suddenly we realized there is a rent there. And suddenly the clearing is here, it is an opening clearing up there but the rex's margin you could see. So that was basically a opening or a rent there. So a rent can also have a dialysis. Now this has caused a dialysis here. I will just play this bit again because this is important for you guys. So you can see entire thing coming and now you got a cortex away from the, so you have an opening and you got a dialysis also. Well, you can't ask for more. And this is topical surgery. All right, now you can see the bag very well. So we went with a CTR in this patient because this was intact so we thought we will just put it in and the frill was still there. So we went in there and CTR actually helped us holding the, uh, the bag in the place. Now the choice was whether to put a lens right now, of course the choice was the multi-piece lens only or do it later. So then once we did a vitrectomy, we realized that the, lens, the bag is stable and then you put a three-piece lens in the sulcus. And this is what how you put a three piece lens making sure the orientations are proper and the lens goes in and it twists on your hand and your lens is dialed in. Now see although the anterior margin is intact, there is a rent at the back and there is a dialysis inferiorly which has been supported. Now this is patient first day was 6-5 vision, did not have to be told anything actually. So uh, if you have a PCR, uh, what uh, you know, precaution will take for putting CTR in those cases? Yeah. So Sometimes first thing, yeah, first thing is you have to go as wide as possible and inflate your bag with viscoelastic if you have helon with you, and that still that's tricky. So if you can actually manage to open up one end, or the other thing is in these patients you can go for a CTS. If a CTS was there, this was a better option because CTS you can put with a PC rent also without any problem because that part of the uh, posterior capsule is intact. So how did it help me? And this is what it how it works. So what did we do? We, what we did was nothing, we actually created a tampolin. So what happens? Now that's your intact bag and you see the pieces jumping on that and what happens? There's a broke break there and there's a zonule dialysis. I mean you're not lucky to have zonules. You can ask the patient to get some zonules and re replace them. Can you? No. So what you need to do is you have to open it from inside out and that's where the CTR works. It opens the bag and doesn't let the trampolin furl inside. So this is what we're trying to do. So depending on the hardness you can put hooks and do it away or 
this is uh, okay. Now this again on the table, you see what I am doing, I am putting a CTR, it goes in and that's that's a vitreous which is showing up at the back. So if the patient lens is stable, there is nothing there, you can leave it alone. So is it as simple as that? Okay now, again there is a dialysis here, you see, so we thought we will do the same procedure. So you have to be careful that there is no nick in your anterior capsule. You can still put in this posterior opening a little bit if it is there, you can still manage, but if there is a nick in the anterior capsule, this is what happens now. This looks good, we fill in the bag, everything is fine, we put in helon inside. Now see what happens when I put a CTR and this is the last slide, I will just take a 30 seconds more on this. And I am using this by manual because you can have the, uh, the loaded one also which is coming for 900, this comes for 600 uh, and uh, you can try any of the systems and see what happens here. Now see, so it is gone, so this is not going to be effective in this anymore. So before putting in your CTR, please ensure your excess is good and the bag is filled properly. And uh, I think with that I will close, we are open to discussion. Yeah. It's a good idea to put hooks like in the case that you showed, yeah. whether dialysis was there, I mean immediately you could have hooked it and then done the hmm. rest of the surgery. Yeah, the, the hooks it can work well. Work, yeah. If you think you are, uh, see once I aspirated hooks the… Hooks alone will also work well even if you don't during do the, the CTR yeah. during the surgery. During the surgery you can support yourself with hooks which uh, I did not show you the video. You, if you have a bigger dialysis, you can go for three. I, should I run that video also? I think might as well. I still have uh, four minutes to go, is it? Oh, it's four minutes over. <laughs> okay, it's over. So let me see if it's there. You know, we have ten minutes from the previous session. Okay. So that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. And we have many other presentations. Achha, have we? Okay. I think I have shown it here at the end of this one. All right. So I thought I will save time, but okay. So this will decide. If your hardness of the cataract and amount of luxation, you can have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, okay, any, any, one, any much you want, whatever makes your bag stable. Okay, so it, it will run. It's not running. Hang over here. Yeah, it's hang. Are you for? I will do it again. So I have shown you how to put hooks properly. Actually, you have to remove the parallax. You have to make sure that both the edges are cancelled. Okay. I'll go. I know you guys are very good at it. I am not. Okay, so I think I'll go to this video straight away and go here. Okay, and I'll come to this place somewhere here. Maybe here. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll get there. Yeah, I did that. No, no, chal raha tha bhi yaar. It's just the same system. Okay, okay, okay. So hooks bath with the Okay, so you can have hooks and you can actually do the surgery. Kar sakte ho? He thinks he can do it. So video looks any gall though, but you see which one do? Now we now forward gun is alright, but uh, then it will take another time. Okay, so I will just come to that. So hooks should be always, edge should be U shaped, not a V shaped. If it is a V shaped, that means you are already using it too often. So that it has to be U, it should go, so, so look at the hooks here. Hooks should be U shaped always. Ah, so and the, this is two hooks and this is a huge amount of dialysis, right? We still manage this one. And after this, you can put a CTR as Sony, whatever you want to do. But it is possible to manage them if it's this kind of dialysis also. So depending on that, four, five, six hooks, whatever you can do it. So uh, we'll talk with hooks some other time. I think my time is already up. Thank you very much for hearing me out. Thank you. Thank you, Sudarshan. Um, I think you you hook the audience with your videos. <laughs> we have uh, Professor Namrata Sharma. She's going to. No, take us through the you no know, visibility uh, through the hazy corneas. She does all sort of tricks to see through the hazy corneas also. And uh, how do we handle those cases with nuclear uh, emulsification once you have a hazy cornea or the visibility gets poor? Because sometimes it's a challenge for us to do cataract surgery in these patients also. So many patients may not uh, be fit for a keratoplasty sometimes. You still have to do a cataract surgery to give them some sort of a workable vision. Yeah, Dr. Namrata. 
so again these are cases video uh, surgical videos of how you would manage them now you may have a corneal opacity such as this and this actually doesn't bother you because you know where you have to place your axis the rexes also can be done i didn't edit this a little bit just to show that if you leave the edge of the rexes there underneath the opacity it gets very difficult so never leave it there and always double fold your rexes because that will improve the contrast especially if it is stained and then you will be able to see it better now this has been fast forwarded because there's really actually nothing much to it it looks like a normal fake only except that this part you cannot see but 3/4 of the cornea is so clear that it allows you to do fake always remember to put your retro illumination on because if you don't put your retro illumination on then it will get difficult and as you uh, do fake in c2 that means you fake eat it fake eat it so your red glow will be there and these grayish fragments will become clear uh, in the contrast of the red glow so uh, uh, if the opacity is that localized if it is that leucomatous and small then you can uh, get away even uh, even uh, just like a normal fake emulsification without actually having to uh, do any maneuver or use any aid now this of course is my most favorite video because this highlights all the steps of doing fake emulsification in a case which has a leuco leucomatous corneal scar patient was one eyed didn't want corneal transplantation uh, because had undergone infection after corneal transplantation in the fellow eye and so only fake emulsification was done notice that we have done a eccentric rexis here and we will also do a eccentric crater because optical iridectomy is there that is the area where you can see that is also the area where the patient will see so this is eccentric crater you can't do it centrally only thing is one has to be careful and this is a hard cataract again put your retro illumination on if your retro illumination is on the grayish fragments uh, will be fakeoed and fake in c2 so fake, uh, chop and eat chop and eat at the same time to get your red reflex so these uh, uh, fragments which are camouflaged underneath the opacity have to be lollipopped uh, into the fake probe or into the irrigation aspiration uh, probe and then subsequently uh, you can put a foldable intraocular lens still in the back because your rexis is eccentric and you can see the edge of the rexis there so the patient won't get 66 but if the patient is 624 618 that is also good enough for this one eyed patient now this is uh, when you have a central yeah, opacity uh, now just over. hold on yeah. yes sir so sir uh, would would you have handled this case differently the previous case so, so alternatively you can put a nylon hook there to right. improve your visibility because the inferior half is to sir i'm talking yes, sir, yes, sir. the inferior half is quite clear the opacity in the superior half yes sir would you have thought about some different techniques so one is the 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 orientation if you can normally for such patients first i i before starting the case i i uh, uh, sit without washing up and see from which angle i can approach the best yeah yeah all yeah patient yeah. yeah so yeah. So, so if i can somehow uh, position myself so that the opacity comes in the in the proximal half then the inferior half becomes uh, better but obviously if it is nasally situated it's not possible and uh, other than that sir oh, at least uh, yeah so at least one half of the cornea should be case, there yeah. Yeah. yeah and and preferably it should be in the inferior half uh, no, no, she did a, a fantastic job because the area of uh, emulsification would, is yeah, clear yeah one can uh, one can think of removing little more iris tissue probably from the uh periphery with the vitrector and and release that adherence basically because in any case if we are not planning a keratoplasty it's so already oy hai na nahi nahi sir the nahi nahi from the adherence acha from the end in this the intra opacity yeah. microscope yeah, is I not there but it's a old case so okay yeah i was thinking you would have thought in like auto rotation no auto rotation line yeah, no sir sir, sir adherent we actually this similar case was there on the last round so in adherence we generally uh, avoid uh, auto, avoid uh, auto, auto rotation okay. if, if it's a uh, non adherent then then one can plan what uh, he is talking about you know sometimes if you are just a opacity you can rotate the you know same cornea in a you know manner where the opacity gets to a un you know optical axis area and patient vision improves not for a cataract surgery but as such improving the vision in this case sorry namrata yes sir so the case like this although the haze appears to be less is more difficult to do because it's a nebulo macular kind of haze and more importantly it is central so your working area cannot be one half and like i said earlier you have to double up the rexes 
to see it better and your rexes has to be larger in this plus your hydro maneuvers also have to be more vigorous in this because that will cause the softening of the nucleus and will help you in the disassembly of the lens then whenever it gets blurry put viscoelastic as was done in this case and it you can do a central chop if you can't do a central chop then in these cases you can even do peripheral chops of course very carefully that you don't uh, damage the uh, underlying posterior capsule and when you do the peripheral chops uh, simultaneously uh, in all the uh, in all the meridians then what happens is the nucleus doesn't become that springy if you don't do it and if you try to then flip it then it becomes springy it tends to go back again so if you do peripheral chops all around uh, it 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 becomes less uh, springy and then you can sort of just flip flip it up and then uh, do a nuclear emulsification and uh, notice again in this irrigation aspiration has been done and intraocular lens implantation is being done now it appears a lot more clear than the previous case but this is more tricky to do as compared to the previous case so uh, central uh, ne nebulo macular corneal haze can get difficult now in this case the synechia was present and then this synechia was released as is also seen on the intraop ocd microscope so this is a white and a black cornea because this has been tattooed and nylon hooks are being used to uh, uh, to uh, enlarge your area of visualization again rexes is being done and again don't lose the edge of the rexes although intraop ocd microscope does help you to relocate it in case you lose it underneath underneath the haze and do a relatively larger rexes as large as you can because this helps again notice our insertion is temporal because this half is the area where you will be working retro illumination is on again and then this is not a very hard cataract so this is a relatively simpler case to do this is followed by foldable intraocular lens implantation and uh, optical uh, vitrector probe which tushar was also saying can be used here and i like to do what is called as the pilocarpine test in the end that is you uh, put the air bubble put pilocarpine and see what is actually going to be remaining in the post op period for the patient to see now this of course uh, is a case where uh, for nuclear emulsification the endo eliminator is being used inside so if you don't use this you can't see at what level you are chopping so it does help you uh, to know the level of chopping where your chopper is where your phaco probe is and now it is being used outside to see where the margin of the rexes is and how you can place the intraocular lens now this was a difficult case in fact this case had corneal haze so epithelial debridement was done uh, in this case to improve the area of visualization but again it was not visualized that well so subsequently trocar cannula is being uh, used because we uh, thought we'll put a, a chandelier in this and in, when you do it, this also had a retro corneal membrane which you can see the pigmented membrane which is there and but the chandelier does allow you to see the uh, uh, the not not very well but whatever visualization is there it does allow you to uh, chop your area and to do irrigation aspiration uh, with the help of the uh, uh, chandelier illumination and the placement of the intraocular lens and uh, this is how it looks uh, without the uh, chandelier very difficult to otherwise do the various maneuvers and this like i said had a retroconeal membrane also so this retroconeal membrane was also cut in the uh, uh, under the uh, chandelier and subsequently uh, although i have edited that part out but we also did a dissec subsequently in the same setting for that patient so this is how it will look but then you can still get away doing a cataract surgery and uh, putting in a intraocular lens Uh, doing an intraocular lens implantation if you use chandelier so uh, the prerequisites for doing nuclear emulsification especially in corneal haze is that the retro illumination has to be on don't forget to put that on incision placement has to be done so you have to work through the clear area even if you have half the cornea which is clear or one third you can still do it central rexes should be done for central corneal opacities but they should be large it has to be eccentric if it is a eccentric opacity or with the optical idecme aids like nylon hooks stripan blue dye endo illuminator chandelier trocar cannula and ovd are important hydro procedure should be done vigorously because that softens the nucleus central crater and chop can be done or peripheral chops can be done and you can cog wheel the nucleus and emulsify or eccentric phaco can be done for paracentral opacities and always phaco in c2 so you chop and you eat and you chop and you eat thank you so much for your kind attention Thank you, Namrata, for uh, 
giving a nice you know teaching tips for a difficult situation of a hazy cornea and uh, most of the things were very clearly uh, demonstrated now we invite uh, professor tushar agarwal who will take us through the you know uh, sticky so, epicortical so, so, should i do both the talk ha ha both you can do in in uh, given a time yes sir <laughs> isme pehle तो बोलो इन दिस डिफिकल्ट हेजी कॉर्नियर्स विच यू शोड सो मेनी वीडियोस डिड यू हैव एनी कॉम्प्लिकेशंस बिकॉज दीज आर केसेस विच आर प्रोन फॉर हाई कॉम्प्लिकेशन लाइक नॉर्मल इट इफ हैपेंस हाउ डू यू मैनेज सच केस सो देयर आर कॉम्प्लिकेशंस व्हिच कैन अकर लाइक वी हैव हैड जोनुलर डायलिसिस इन अ कपल ऑफ केसेस then even posterior capsular rent uh, in uh, three or four cases but in those cases then you defer putting a intraocular lens at at that setting and then uh, plan it on a later day if again after uh, seeing the status whether you can really put it or not so that is the only step which would be uh, different uh, as compared to what you do normally i think that's a very important point you know uh, especially i have i used to get so worried uh, handling these patients suppose nucleus drop happens then uh, they have to do a endoscopic uh, uh, emulsification of these because the cornea is as is hazy but they may still be able to do it because they can use the lighting system but uh, as we understand these cases have a higher chances of getting you know difficulties complications and people who are really experienced should be handling these cases otherwise some people like to do a simple sics in these cases also and take the entire nucleus out without uh, going through the all the difficulties but as dr namrata showed those cases they all have a you know sometimes ocular surface disease conjunctivitis also involved large incision can again create a problem so many people like to do a small incision surgery like this yeah tushar so I'll, i'll be speaking on two things uh, first is the hybrid uh, bimanual ia a uh, lot of videos you have seen so i'll just sort of clarify uh, the exact steps to do it and why to do it uh, coaxial uh, ia is always preferable as the 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 fluidics are much more stable and the main uh, incision remains sealed uh, however if you have to take care of uh, uh, sub incisional cortex or somewhere if there is a dialysis or something then you need to separate the irrigation and the aspiration cannula but if you do it with the traditional method the the main issue is that the main incision remains leaky and the and and these are cases where you want the chamber to be especially deep for example if you have a dialysis and vitreous sweeping through so that's why the hybrid bimanual uh, technique uh, uh, comes into play where the the thing is that you it's 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 a form of bimanual technique where the irrigation and the aspiration uh, ports are separated but instead of using the the normal irrigation cannula you use the uh, coaxial uh, uh, probe for the irrigation purposes so what you have done is that you have just removed the aspiration uh, uh, tubing from the, your routine uh, irrigation cannula uh, the probe and attached it to a, a, a bimanual part of the the aspiration uh, probe and use this through the main port the advantage is that uh, the 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 fluid going into the eye is is uh, of the normal level so the fluid is better uh, more importantly the main incision remains sealed uh, as in a coaxial uh, by uh, ia and uh, so so the the that shallowing of the ac is not there the only the only potential issues are that the actual sub incisional area is is uh, uh, impinged by the uh, coaxial probe so to avoid that uh, there are a couple of tricks which i'll i'll show you and so so we use it uh, so so this was this was a case where you can see the pupil is moderately you know dilated and you have this uh, sticky uh, cortex uh, slash epicortex and and uh, it's not uh, ready to come out so okay. 
So despite my best effort, it's not coming out. So then, then we shift to the hybrid biomanual. So I'd like to point out this uh, trick here. Okay. So in the in this uh, in the coaxial probe, you in in this particular instance, you don't need the aspiration port uh, to be exposed because the aspiration port you are going to be using from the left side. So what you can do is you can under the microscope you can advance the sleeve so that it actually protrudes beyond the metal tip. So a it makes the the this uh, uh, the likelihood of injuring the PC with the steel tip uh, lesser. Your irrigation ports are still on. But more importantly, what it does is that if you don't advance this, you will have you get an, an additional about a millimeter and a half uh, by which you can keep the probe back. Otherwise, if if this sleeve were to be here, then you will have to insert the probe little more. So by advancing the silicone uh, sleeve ahead of the steel tip, you actually get to keep this irrigation. This is essentially an irrigation uh, cannula now. So you can put it much uh, closer to the incision. So your sub incisional area gets uh, exposed. So that's the uh, trick which I wanted to highlight here. So uh, this technique is quite useful where you have things like small smaller pupil where the rex's margin is not visible, or where uh, like for example white cataracts where the cortex is not uh, the, it comes in frills and individual fibers rather than coming in sheets. Um, in in cases of intraop dialysis or pre existing dialysis where you don't want to put extra stress on the on the zonules. So as you can see, the the I can keep this probe quite away from the incision. If my if my sleeve were uh, at the, in the normal position, I would have to keep the probe somewhere here, and the whole purpose of this gets uh, defeated. And you can always uh, switch hands, and but you will have to be adept at holding the main probe with the left hand, and you can always go in with the right hand. So, this is a similar case uh, uh, where the, so as I was saying, uh, this is especially useful if you have uh, small fibers left behind where they probably the hydro dissection was not proper or in cases of white cataract where the, the cortex is not well formed and does not come out in sheets. So in the in the in all these areas, uh, uh, the cortex can be quite easily removed uh, with the help of uh, hybrid biomanual. <coughs> so again, I have I have advanced my sleeve beyond the steel tip, and I just uh, take the uh, biomanual cannula to aspirate it out, and uh, that's about it. I'll go to my second uh, case. So this was a case of intraop uh, meiosis. So in fact, uh, so this is a series of two cases. The first eye, one eye of the patient, and the second eye of the same patient. So it has, for me, it was a very uh, good uh, learning experience. So I like to share the same with you. So. We, some, uh, a lot of times we see these cases where the pupil is sort of mid dilated and, and we feel that you know maybe with intracameral adrenaline or something you know we will be able to get away or viscodilation will be able to get away. So this is one of those pupils. Of course I have learnt uh, that uh, you know the, the better option now. So as you can see the pupil keeps on getting progressively smaller. In fact harder cataracts are little better to handle these pupils because you can, you can just chop in the centre. So in any case, uh, this became unmanageable. So I decided to put uh, iris hooks, and uh, although I think I was quite uh, uh, being quite careful so that I don't engage the rex's margin, but unfortunately that is what uh, happened here in the on the left hook. And I should have taken the clue, uh, sir. That 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 the the, the 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 important parts I have uh, slowed down where the where the PCR happens. So. This is the full case actually. So I have forwarded the the, the non-essential things. So one clue was that the the if you can see on the on the upper upper left corner, the iris is is not uh, coming properly to the incision site compared to the other side. That should have been the first clue that the the it's not the iris which is engaged primarily. It is the rex's margin uh, which, is, which is engaged. <laughs> Uh, 
Actually, I was told three minutes, sir. So, no, uh, no. So, so then I I realized that there is a rent here, and one of the causes probably also was that when you pull the bag with the rexes, the entire thing is lifted anteriorly. So whatever plane you have in mind is actually not there. It's it's shifted anteriorly, and that was also I think one of the contributory causes of the. Uh, PC tear there, and so it was managed. Then accordingly, uh, anterior vitrectomy was done, and finally a three-piece uh, lens was uh, implanted in the in the sulcus. As sir showed, you first uh, turn it on the right side, and then on the left side your hand, so that the both the haptics in a three-piece lens they open uh, properly. And. Sir, it was Floppy multiple. Iris. It was multiple. So uh, 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 this BPH, BPH patient along with diabetes. So. Uh, but you I, use phenocaine plus, which is there nowadays. Older one. Five six older. years old. So, so I, I'll share my uh, my my learning with it. So this was the second. I so so one thing I've realized that in these mid dilated pupils, especially if the if there's a male patient who's who's had a history of BPH and and add on added added on diabetes, it's not really good to uh, have it have uh, this at a go at the surgery without full dilatation because even if you manage to do it, you still end up with a smaller rexus than desired. So that that it's by itself is an indication for me now to use pupillary expansion devices in such cases. And secondly, of course, uh, the impending IFIS. So in this, in the second eye, there's the person. Okay. So, so, it, so you can see it behaves almost in a similar fashion. There is hardly any 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 dilatation. So I, in this case, I was a little wiser, and le having learned from my previous experience, and I put the iris hooks. Um, I use four hooks. Some people use five also, one below the incision. But I normally tend to use four hooks. So you can ha have a much better rexus size. That that I think is also an important part uh, with, with these mid dilated pupils. You might be able to do a phaco, but your rexus won't be of an appropriate size because there is simply no way to get a good rexus below the pupil. You can get a rexus, but not a very good sized uh, rexus. And 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 this was th and this like, went on like a uh, routine case. <coughs> You you put the lens and then you remove the. Uh, so this is routine. So okay. And so so the, as I said, I learned many things from this. A if you encounter any problem due to some anatomical issue in the first eye of a patient, always expect the a similar problem is most likely coming in the second eye. So I always now make a note. If I have an uh, anatomical issue with with one of the eyes or any complications due to an anatomical issue, I always make a note in the patient's card so that whenever I'm, if I get a chance to do a second eye or her second eye, I can always take uh, appropriate precautions. Second, uh, if if I get these now mid dilated pupils with the history of BPH and diabetes, I preemptively put iris hooks. I don't depend on my skills solely to get through the case. And third, intraoperatively, some even even after taking a lot of precautions, still I get into a situation where I have to put um, the rexis, the capsular hooks after the rexis. So I always make sure to a restain the uh, capsule, capsular margin, so, they, so it's very nicely visible while putting the iris hooks. B, I always now elevate it properly. And ensure that I can see the rexes below the iris. So I elevate it with the viscoat generally now, um, the iris, so that when I am putting the iris hooks, I don't end up engaging the the rexes uh, margin with the iris hooks. So these were my learnings with this. I hope you gain something from it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tushar. Uh, wonderful tips in the uh, difficult situation. Uh, we request uh, Dr. Sri Devi to put up the presentation. इसके पावर लगाओ। तुषार, in your hybrid technique, you know, one you talked about the coaxial area, the difficulties. Yes, sir. Suppose we have a cortical fiber towards the, you know, your aspiration port. Yes, sir. How do you handle that? Yes, sir. So, 
you, you, I, I showed so, so you that my I, life. Uh, I am glad that you asked. So, so when I teach uh, IA, first thing I tell them is that you always take care of your sub site port area first because once you have taken that, you know, three clock hour area, rest all is amenable to this hybrid. But that when you use hybrid, that that itself becomes a sub incisional uh, area. Although you could, I saw that you were able to uh, remove it, but then it was a sub incisional cortex. So, so, so the other thing is that you can use what I said that you can use, but you will have to be able to uh, hold the the irrigation cannula, the 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 coaxial probe with your left hand, and then you go with your aspiration probe from the right side. So then it becomes opposite. Third thing is that uh, if everything else is not there, then you I I give a trial for a normal bimanual IA once only. If if I find that the AC is extremely shallow, I put one temporary suture, if at all required, and then you can do it. So it takes care of that shallowing of the AC. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Sri Devi. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be discussing the case of anterior excess extension, and I think anterior capsular excess is most challenging in the white cataracts, and was beautifully demonstrated by Dr. Manpreet today in the live surgery. So here we again have an intumescent white cataract. It is a type 2 kind of uh, white cataract as per the IOST classification. So one important thing here is to stain the anterior capsule with trepan blue because that increases your visibility. Then you inject a cohesive viscoelastic to flatten your capsule. And then when, when you make the first snick here, you can see that there is no fluid release. Sorry. Yeah. So if you see the nick, there is no fluid release here. So that points towards a type 2 uh, White, white cataract which again you know like tells us that it's going to be a difficult rexus now so we proceed with it we start with the spiral technique a small rexus to start with and so we can feel the traction because of the raised intraventricular pressure there is still no release of fluid and we're proceeding so here we can feel the rexus running out as we are ex in increasing the size of the spiral so at this point it seems to be difficult with the needle, so we'll shift to a forceps. So we use inject some visco dispersive here, so that it makes the capsule flat again, and then we hold it with an ILM forceps. So ideally, a micro forceps would be a better instrument if you have one. And then now, so we're trying to pull it in. We go and so here it's already extended at this point. So this is the extension of your excess here. So because in the mid periphery area there was a raised uh, intraventricular pressure and there was no fluid release and despite the fact that we did go and try to hold the capsule near the root of the uh, tear it still extended. So I would just like to ask anybody from the house so what would be the next step what next in this if you are faced with such a situation. <laughs> because you were going quite uh, smoothly. Yes. And that was the area where, you know, your, uh, this particular type of fossil is not uh, good yes. uh, for uh, this yeah. position. Yes. Your angle is not good. So yes. You are not uh, able to rotate your fossil here. You are pulling with the fossil. Yes. yes. That's why it has gone to periphery. Yes. So, so you should have gone to a normal fossil yes. and mm -hmm. taken that, you know. Or yes. you could have used the same, uh, you know, cystitome and pulled the, you know, rexes which you are doing. doing yes. So they, these long intravitreal fossils are not meant for, for anti chamber use. Yes, so that is the first. This is okay answer. for a post implantation uh, rexus tearing because rexus. you have a deeper chamber. Yes. But this situation is very difficult. Yes. And uh, I saw I saw that you are injecting viscoelastic correctly when uh, you refill the viscoelastic in the peripheral area. What precaution uh, we should take is you know you should not inject viscoelastic from center to periphery. It yeah. should be periphery to center Same. so that uh, is a bit normally what mistake people do. They start injecting from center and the pressure goes uh, backwards and tear extends. Yes, so reverse Argentinian flag, yes, so that is. Yes, yeah. want to say something? Yeah. So yeah, initially so it was a cohesive, but then later on to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So cohesive will help you more. Right, sir. Right. General rule of pulling is that if you are pulling it from that side where it has extended, hmm. it should be bang on opposite plus two. Yes. So actually, it should have been a little more yes, towards the angle. Side. Yes. Yes. It's because of a forceps only. Yes. Okay. What next now? Yeah. So anybody from the house would like. What will we do? Tell the surgeons. We should. Uh, the, where there is an arrow, we should make a neck and. 
कम्प्लीट द रेक्सेस एंड लीव दैट टू एक्सटेंडेड पार्ट लिक्विड बाहर नहीं आया ना फोर्सेप्स को बाहर भी तो आना पड़ेगा उसके बाद फोर्सेप्स बाहर आ गया उसके बाद नहीं अभी आया नहीं है पहले विस्को इलास्टिक डालोगे तो आएगा ना वो बाहर एंड वो फिर नेक्स्ट आ जाएगा जो हो गया सो व्हाट इज इट आई डोंट ओके नाउ लेट्स सी हाउ यू हैव मैनेज या सो ओके कुछ देयर इज नहीं नहीं आएगा मैम द वीडियो इज हैंग हो गया थी हैंग भी करा दिया अनी ऑफ दैट दिस द क्लैरिटी इज सो गुड इन दिस पर्टिकुलर वीडियो इट इज यू नो uh sort of a heart pinching that it has gone to periphery <laughs> <laughs> i can understand if dr namrata's videos were quite mm-hmm. so heavy anything can happen there but this case uh, should have been a clear cut but yes once you have a raised internal ventricular pressure where your anterior pressure on the capsule is not enough to push the posterior curve, uh, pressure down then this is going to happen so better would have been a small access to begin with which is 1 1.5 mm and then aspirate the entire uh, you know hydrated cortical fibers then your access would have been ideally done so she is already gone to mid periphery you know this is again a mid periphery see this area you pull so she is pulling the yeah, this, this. Yeah. yeah so this is what has happened so this pull was the uh, you know uh, challenging situation here so in such situation this fo- this island peeling force is not a good idea as such now so what uh, let's see what uh, surgeon had done subsequently So, so when you take out the instrument, the viscoelastic should come from the side. Come from the. Yeah. Okay. Now. So that is one thing. Again, when we are bringing the forcep out before that, the viscoelastic should be idly injected. It's difficult at this stage. Yeah. From the side port. From the side. Not from. So we take an intravitreal scissor, right, to create a new this thing. Slightly peripheral, but it's still visible, no? No, no, sir. It's it's fully out. It's fully no, out. No, it's gone at the. It's fully out. So now again. we trying to res- rescue the rexes and again and it will again go out no, no, again, you're... again it will go out again this force is not a good for that particular <laughs> yes. area again yeah. uh-huh. see this it has to be closer to the tearing yeah. edge no it Bull cannot be that yes. far from the tearing edge so this should edge. have been from the if you use this force yes. you should have used for a main port so that your access yes. is better so that is the tear. learning point yes yeah yeah yes so the regular forceps ha you try to Yes. So from the main incision, yes, sir, that's the learning point in that. So normally, if, uh, I use this fossil for last, you know, more than a uh, decade or so. Mm-hmm. I'll do it from the main port at this area. If I have to mm-hmm. go left hand side, main yes, port. Main port. Right hand side, side port. Yes. So that's what I wanted to highlight. That so that was the other mistake in that step. So did you do hydro or not in this patient? Uh, so just very gentle. So just not really did not inject fluid. Just to. Again, because it was a soft out, to put viscosity yes yes so at again that is one more this thing so both times when we come out with the probe and before we put the lens you have to stabilize the bag and put viscosity why that is important because otherwise it might
and another uh, i was stuck in the wound okay okay Probably. just hold on hold on there hold on ha batao kya problem is mein just somebody kisi ko kisi kisi ko mic de de beta carpet ka just hold on aaj ko do ek hmm what is cartridge has uh, not in the wound as it it was receding back cartridge matlab जरी once you withdraw the lens is already played then again it will go to the right area so when we are using a plunger make sure plunger is at the base of the eye well not over the eye well so this is what is going to happen so you will be half way into the this thing this is like you know delivery which is stuck overriding has to be avoided so kya karenge ab batao so there are two cases like this so see the surgeon is actually struggling oh. with a sense ki hope it is not be done and ultimately i think the right thing is done uh, it's held with the mcpherson falsers rotated a little and then pulled in so you're lucky that just went inside otherwise very difficult if it is more than 1/3 okay. of course ah, it should be done. this again uh, here also you can see another one where actually the surgeon is successful in nudging it with the cartridge only no man they are not my cases so i went in through She's i think thousand surgeon. of uh, cases some of them are maybe mine Luckily, these lenses you can you know uh, yeah, still amenable to all these areas. Yeah, these are the most popular lenses. So there is a broken haptic. <laughs> so actually, the uh, so the haptic which went in first. So wait a clue. Wait a clue. Wait up. What will we do after this? Tell us. 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 what should we do for this case sir we can try to center the eye well we can see whether it is fixing or not presently and try this to center this is a lying down position with the disc elastic on lens will center with the haptic is chipped you know if it's totally chipped then we can explant this eye and place another one even a half chip you know, lens will never the center in the in a subsequent life yeah it should be ab dekho kya karte hain let's see So this is a community patient, I think, and they have, a, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they have a small chip there, and they removed it and then closed it. I think. You can see the chip also. There, there. The, with the forceps, they just took it out. Okay. Haptic tip, the so leading this, haptic tip. This is a manageable, as you rightly said. Uh, then a broken haptic. This is the uh, trailing haptic, and it's the full haptic is broken. So this will have to be removed. And not a bandage. Not a bandage. So this is the. So for the scaffold, this sec, the lens is put in, and this one will be taken out. Yeah. Okay. Very nicely done. Then a broken cartridge. This is. Oh my God. Eye vision lens. I've seen this blade first time in my life. <laughs> Even I'm seeing for the first time, sir. <laughs> So actually, there is a break in the cartridge. If you see here, yes, it's split. Then, uh, then also the surgeon is trying to put it in, and again it will be tried. I think to put it in. <laughs> Not possible because if there is a suction loss in the cartridge, and then they see that the lens is. Not disrupted, and then they put it through the D cartridge through the notter cert. The problem is with the loading; it goes with the band. Okay. And then, uh, thankfully, the surgeon notices that there is a slight amount of dialysis, and the CTR is placed. Very nice. This is a, just a recent case. The patient sneezed during the rare. This is a 90-year-old lady with a very hard cataract, and some kind of photic reflex she had. 
with the IOL is again out. It's reinserted. Thankfully, this time it will go through. It will be stuck at the wound. It then, without any maneuvers, it just. Which is actually man handling the wound, you know. <laughs> The incision, if feel like you can enlarge the incision and put comfortably, you know. Then we have inverted IOLs, a single piece IOL. Uh, this is no, under. Uh, this elastic cover, it's being rotated back into position. See and another and multi-piece IOL which is placed inverted. So here there are a lot of tips which the surgeon did not follow. The full length actually went in. Ideally, the haptic should have been trailing out. If The next is intact in uh, this posterior <laughs> capsule. <laughs> Tear <laughs> split is there. Actually, I was very happy with the video to show it because so many things happening in this video. I think what uh, Dr. Sudarshan okay, told, you know, how to in inject these uh, multi-piece lenses through the, you know, uh, these hmm. cartridges, which are, uh, which which can, you know, you can re reorient the haptics. So once you inject inside, they see how the haptics are opening, then rotate your hand accordingly. I think first you have to rotate uh, like this, and then like this. First one the right okay. side, and yeah. then. Okay. Can you leave the three-piece lens like? Oh. Oh. I'm just asking. Three-piece lens. And single piece? So no need to. One point five. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, very good afternoon to you all. I'll be speaking on. How much of a broken haptic can you leave? How much of a broken haptic? Like half, one fourth. Supra. So I'll be speaking on fix. Okay. Take. Take. Okay. 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 Uh, we have Dr. Lomi now. Take us through the difficulties in a supra hard cataract. So, what we expect uh, the difficulties doing fecal emulsification in supra hard cataract? One thing is that it's a harder uh, nucleus, and that it will be difficult to chop the fragments. And definitely, it would take a longer time for emulsification. And they are usually the poor, uh, uh, they have a poor insulin because they are usually in older age group. And we usually expect a weaker zonules and also have a high risk of for wound burn. So uh, I'll be showing here the two techniques, uh, the stop and chop technique and a divide and concur technique. So no conflict of, of interest point point of use here. So this is a video of... Uh, Stop and chop technique. Here, uh, for a hard cataract, you usually require a, a, a larger capsular axis. A uh, minimum of five mm is uh, required here. This is followed by a normal hydro dis uh, dissection. A gentle hydro dissection is required because you don't know the posterior uh, capsule, so it should be gentle and it may be gently rotated. And then uh, this is followed by a scalping mode. So scalping mode, we use a higher power of around 80%. This is called continuous torsional. And then aspiration flow rate low and vacuum flow rate, uh, vacuum is low, keep it low, 100 millimeter. So you don't want to pick uh, uh, the, the nucleus chunk on, on opaque tips here. And the depth of uh, this uh, trench should be around 80 to 90% depth. Sometimes you can see if we, you use a, ret a, retro a retro elimination, you can see a reddish reflex. So after that, you, you, you can do a, 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 chop in set, a chop setting. That, that chop setting should be uh, off uh, torsional, zero torsional with longitudinal. And you can use a very, uh, around 50% 50 power, 50 power is, is adequate. You need a higher vacuum to hold on the uh, 
the, uh, the fragments on the phagotypes. And, and, and after holding this, uh, the, phaco, uh, the, the nucleus fragment on the tip, that the second instrument should be st will stabilize the nucleus and then you can do the chopping. This should be gentle enough, not that, uh, and then it should be winting the visibility of, uh, of uh, visibility of the frame. And this is followed by a, a, a quad setting. Uh, a lower quad setting, many, many times for hard cutting, you, you think that your power should be very much higher, but it's not always true. You need a higher vacuum and, uh, and then uh, aspiration flow rate. And the power of around uh, with continuous torsional, 50% is adequate. And then you can uh, subsequently complete this, uh, uh, this quadrant removal. And we expect that we should have a manual turbulence and a minimal chatter. Next uh, technique is uh, uh, this divide and conquer technique. Here also uh, you make a sculpting, a trench, a deeper trench of uh, making into four quadrants. Here similarly around 80-90% uh, depth is adequate here. And it is made on the four quadrant again. And using a, a low vacuum and a low aspiration uh, flow rate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I said there's a setting called IP in this one. So once the longitude, this uh, torsional gets blocked, then the, the longitude will kicks in on its own. There's a fourth step, stepping of the foot yeah. pedal. So uh -huh. once the 90% suction is there, so if you put IP in this, then the chances of your zonal analysis goes down and you can actually make smoother thing, which is hard not possible uh, alone torsional in hard cat. Yeah. Okay. And for chopping, the, we uh, usually avoid the, uh, the torsional. And this is followed by a deeper plane of emulsification. And we would like to do a, a single fragment at the same time. Don't take it all at the same time. And your second instrument should be just above the uh, nucleus fragment to avoid the t t touching of this. Uh, uh, lens on endothelium, and you 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 ex should have a minimal turbulence and minimal uh, lens shutters uh, in this case. Uh, slowly and gently, and be patient that this will be can be completed very well. Even for this uh, harder nucleus cataract, usually uh, it's better to do under a peribubble block only for the beginners, and like others. Uh, you, you remove particular lens matter, then lens uh, insertion is done, and then you remove the disco. <coughs> That's the end of the surgery. So to summarize, uh, larger capsular access is uh, very important here, and uh, to have a deeper trench, a deeper placement of the instrument, uh, and use of visco dispersive protective uh, coating, and um, you have a minimum turbulence, a minimum lens shutter, and most importantly, uh, uh, the deeper plane of emulsion, and the most importantly, is the balancing of this power, uh, aspiration flow rate, and vacuum. Your food control should be very much uh, controlled, and high and eye and hand food coordination should be always be uh, always be there. Okay, Thank just you. hold it on, keep it there only. Yeah, I think you nicely summarized. One is the larger capsular axis. That means uh, not beyond six millimeter, yes, but around five point five will be the ideal in these cases, yes. and uh, that will give you a chopping easier. Sometimes in these cases, you can chop the rexus margin in a difficult situation also. Mm -hmm. So if you have a stained capsule, all is better. Hard cartridge, you should have a stained capsule so that you visualize what is happening. So even you have a nick, you can mani ma manage that nick also. You can make it to a, you know, tear to a complete rexus there also. So your visibility of a rexus margin should be also important part in a, any emulsification, but more so in a hard cartridge also. Deep trend tears, if you are doing a crater and ten, uh, chop, deep trench is important. If you're doing a uh, trench and chop, you, you have to deep bulk the central area, which is the hardest part of the nucleus. If you're doing other technique, people have a different techniques also. People do a direct chop, people do a peripheral chop with a terminator type of thing. People do a you know, uh, Nagahara chop technique where they use the uh, pre-choppers. Many things are there, but which is comfortable in your hands should be used in difficult situation like this. So basically, as far as we are concerned, it is always better if you have super hard cataract, better to deep bulk the central area. Leave the at least one millimeter periphery, which is 
nice to hold and chop it because for chopping you require a good hold. So if you are deep bulk the periphery area also, chopping will be very difficult, holding will not be possible. And Dr. Sudarshan has a nice uh, concept of uh, using the you know, uh, endothelial protection with dispersive viscoelastic. <laughs> if you go across some amount of uh, CD, then he puts the uh, Sudarshan, can you highlight that? Mike, Mike. The CD is at the accumulated dissipated energy or whatever your machine tells you energy. So have a cutoff in your hand. Okay, if it crosses 15, so anytime my CD is 15, my staff gives me a viscoat. So whichever step I am there, I just come out, I put viscoat, and then I reorient my pieces again. Because since I am out, I can always make the pieces amenable to the position where I am comfortable. For example, if I have eaten up my opposite direction and little uh, weakness left on the side, so with squat, I'll put in and I'll rotate with the same cannula to my comfortable zone. And 15 is my cutoff. Earlier people used to say one minute FACO. I remember when we started about 30 years back. But now with all these premium lenses and all VIPs <laughs> landing to, with us, I think it's better to use more with squat than less. Okay? okay thank you. Tushar, uh, any uh, uh, tips for uh, decreasing the chatter in this hard cataract? Because you are the ultimate teacher for our students, you know, in FACO. Uh, sir. One, uh, the chopper, I think, is uh, should be different than the routine cases. You need a slightly longer uh, chopper with a slightly longer uh, tip. Which uh, he was using, no? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that uh, you can go a little deeper with the chopper itself. Second, little bit of a mix of horizontal and vertical chopping also is desirable in these cases. Uh, the other method, I think you mentioned also that if you don't want to debulk the center, you can do a mid-peripheral chop. So you can create multiple mid peripheral chops in such a case probably or 10 or so and the central disc gets uh, separated from the rest of the nucleus that itself either either as a whole or in two pieces it can be removed and then all the peripheral areas are just like a, a, a lotus type of thing which are already pre chopped and you can and you have the space now created in the center and but don't try to feed the nucleus into the into the okay. uh, Yes, I remember Dr. Dada had described petaloid phaco emulsification, mm. which is very much similar to what you have. Yeah, yeah. correct. One thing uh, I just want to add here, sir. Uh, while doing this, uh, this trench in the end, like to, in order to do the chopping, you know, many times I see that it start from center only and go toward the, uh, away from and to, toward the periphery. So it should ideally start from toward your side, from the periphery, toward your side, and then go toward the center. Center is the deepest area, the thickest lens. So, by there, you can get a good good haul of the uh, lens with this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, I think one important point uh, you highlighted also, but like the in these difficult cases, you know, your uh, last piece may be very critical sometimes, and your capsule by that time may be a little floppy also, especially hypermature cataracts. So you have to be very careful handling the last piece. Maybe you can inject the you know dispersive viscoelastic to deepen the uh, posterior capsule away from this thing, then take out. And you modify your you know, uh, parameters also. If I'm using the uh, pulse or uh, IP, I might stop IP at that time sometimes. Because IP one, suppose I have a pre-occlusion, the IP suppose I have a 10 pulses. The 10 pulses will come. So I can't stop that pulse, 10 pulses will come. So that is not desirable sometimes when you are nearer to the posterior capsule. So maybe you shift to a torsional or a longitudinal, whichever you are using, and complete the last piece. or a, Difficult situation, you can do a IOL in injection first, then take out your last piece, which I showed in that uh, PCR patient also. So that's a good way. Normally in hard cataract, uh, I see also sometimes it, the CD is so much 40, 50, 60, and the chunk is still there. So how to avoid this, you know, either the, uh, to the going to posterior capsule, tearing the posterior, implant IOL, take out the simply the last piece without having a you know, jitter in your uh, heartbeat. Okay, now we go into the next talk, important, very important, task versus endothelitis. Sorry? Actually, the question uh, from our uh, this thing, uh, chat box is, in heart cataracts, suppose you're doing emulsification and you have an anterior capsular uh, extension, then can you still do a in the bag emulsification in these cases? So if you have a, a tear which is away from the, your main action areas, then maybe you can still do it. But if it, uh, if you exactly in the same perpendicular area where actually you are doing chopping, 
So best to do a supracapsular emulsification in those cases. Get your nucleus up, fill the bag with uh, either a viscoelastic or a people use intraocular lenses also nowadays, and complete the phaco with the endothelial protection in those cases. Okay, now we go, go into the another talk, which is a talk of uh, this year, 2023, TAS versus endophilitis. I think you should all know this. And uh, uh, we have Dr. Anu Malik. Uh, she has joined us recently as a faculty in RP Center. She has a huge experience. She's, she was uh, associate professor in a Merit Medical College. So she would like to tell us through the important points here. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be discussing a very important topic. Um, TAS. Differences between TAS and endophthalmitis. Imagine doing a, uh, a do, imagine doing a number of uh, sur cataract surgeries yesterday and today morning, po first post-op day. Unit four. <laughs> we find <laughs> poor vision, <laughs> corneal edema, and a hypopion. That is enough to give. Okay, okay. Please. So as you all know, TAS is an acute steroidal inflammatory reaction, also known as acute steroidal anterior segment inflammation or steroidal post-operative endophthalmitis. And endophthalmitis is the inflammation of the inner coats of the eye with the intraocular colonization of the infectious agent with exudation within intraocular fluid. So distinguishing between TAS and endophthalmitis at day one after surgery is very difficult, but Interestingly, very important due to the seriousness of the conditions and divergent treatment strategies. So, TAS is a multifactorial. Uh, uh, TAS, TAS is a multifactorial etiology. It is a reaction against a toxic substance. It can be due to residues left behind by the items used during the surgery, irrigating solutions with incorrect pH, stabilizing agents, denatured OVDs endotoxins, heavy metals, intraocular medications at the toxic, toxic doses, and ointments, and so on. And endophthalmitis can be due to preoperative causes, intraop and postoperative reasons. So the major outbreaks of TAS <clears throat> that have been reported so far are these. And the major reported <coughs> causes of, sorry, of TAS are these. TAS typically presents in 12, 12 to 24 hours and endophthalmitis, although can manifest one day post-operatively. But there are reports which have had TAS-like early presentations. Symptoms like pain, headache, increasing redness, discharge, and photophobia are rarely or mildly present in TAS and endophthalmitis. Usually, they are severe and pain can be seen in more than 75% of the cases. Visual symptoms, we have blurred vision within 12, 12 to 24 hours after the surgery in TAS, and we have profound visual loss in endophthalmitis. We have uh, ocular movements can be reduced or absent in cases of endophthalmitis, like we can have proptosis with pain, which clinically point to the diagnosis of panophthalmitis. Signs like conjunctival and lid reaction are little or mild in cases of TAS and in endophthalmitis, they can be conjunctival or lid injection that can suggest, frankly, towards endophthalmitis. Corneal edema, it is variable and widespread, and there can be diffuse limbus to limbus corneal edema, which is hallmark of TAS, and it can be permanent. In endophthalmitis, corneal edema is more localized and patchy, which tends to improve with inflammatory resolution. Pupil, it is fixed and dilated usually, which can be seen with spotty or diffuse areas of iris atrophy. In endophthalmitis, we have poor or sluggish pupillary reaction. There can be mild to moderate, severe, mild to moderate or severe reaction with cells, flare, hypopion, fibrin reaction on iris in TAS. And in endophthalmitis, we find marked inflammatory response in anterior chamber with hypopion. And we can also find yellowish exudate. I, intraocular pressure is usually elevated between 40 to 60 millimeter of mercury in TAS and, and endophthalmitis. It is usually variable. We can have 
mildly poor or okay glow in fun, uh, in tars and in endophthalmitis the glow is usually poor or absent there is usually no vitreous involvement and it is usually clear in tars and in endophthalmitis there is marked vitreous involvement and there is inflammation of the entire vitreous on ultrasound B scan, we find that the vitreous cavity is usually clear in TARS and in endophthalmitis, there is mild to moderate intensity point echoes in vitreous cavity. There can be retinochoroidal thickening, there can be concomitant retinal detachment or choroidal detachment. <coughs> vitreous gram staining or culture is usually negative in TARS and in, uh, in the cases of endophthalmitis, it is usually positive. TAS shows dramatic improvement with intense topical steroids which have to be started immediately and we can see after a three day course of steroid which can be given half to one hourly. Visual outcomes are usually better with the TAS and the visual acuity usually improves to 6 by 12 to 6 by 9 but the visual outcomes in end off are usually worse. So coming to the treatment of TARS, we start, we immediately start with steroids every one to two hours. Steroids can be given in the form of gels, emulsions, ointments, topical NSAIDs can be started. We have to do active IOP management and in the refractive cases, we have to also give tissue plasminogen activator, irrigation of the anterior chamber, vitrectomy and for endothe endothelial decompensation, we have to go for so once it occurs, stars can be fatal to the cornea and the eye. Therefore, it is best to prevent the syndrome using all possible precautions. We should never use chemical sterilization. We should avoid detergents, enzymatic powders. There should be thorough cleaning of the instrument with distilled water. And if using ultrasonic bath, we should usually change the bath solution for every run, minimize the use of intracameral drugs and use good quality irrigating fluids, viscoelastics and IOLs. So tasks can be decreased through risk reduction strategies only. So we have three scenarios, either the cases are improving or status quo or the worsening. So we need to think quickly and act promptly. So any cases or cluster of cases should be reported to the authorities and a thorough investigation should be performed. So whenever in doubt, it is always better to err on the side of infection. So in ambiguous situation, we should treat empirically as infectious endophthalmitis and until a therapeutic response to top topical steroid is clearly present, endophthalmitis should always be a consideration for us. Thank you. Okay, now we invite uh, Saurabh uh, to highlight the CME part. Uh, Dr. Navata, can you summarize uh, the importance of uh, TAS nowadays? Uh, I think just in a sort of is ready. So recently we had an outbreak of TAS, and I think uh, that is because it can happen due to anything. So many irrigating solution, viscoelastics, etc. That we use, IOLs were blamed for it, especially the hydrophilic intraocular lenses. And if you're using the hydrophilic intraocular lenses, it is important to wash them, take them out from the fluid, but wash them with BSS before you finally implant them. I think th those are few points are important for us, you know, uh, anything which goes inside the eye can have a, you know, a toxic reaction. So that uh, holds true right from the, the draping of the patient to an injection of IOL or an injection of antibiotic. Even the uh, beta in which we are using in these cases should be properly washed. It should not be left, uh, yeah, that can be sucked inside and and other important areas, as Dr. Namata rightly pointed out, the IUL is culprit sometimes. It, sh it should be washed clean, especially hydrophilic lenses. And the injectors should also be washed because they can also have the particles and all those. And third important thing is uh, the fluids which we use. It may be your uh, BSS or ringer lactate that should also be uh, sterile, not having the inflammatory things. Plus the other the, the things go inside, like we talked about intracamera, adenarine, phenocaine, viscoelastics, they all have implications. So it is a responsibility of surgeon to make sure that things are correct. Because it is what uh, we are using. So 
the user is the ultimate uh, no person to be blamed we can't say the company was at fault company has given us but it is it was our duty to see that things were correct so take all precautions in your cases so you don't land up with these type of situations okay i think the other important part is you know cme which never discuss in the cataract uh, workshops i think we like to have dr shara who is our retina consultant briefly tell us now what are the causes and how do we detect how do we manage them in 3 minutes uh, good afternoon everybody i'll be dis uh, discussing about cystoid macular edema in post cataract surgery um, so what is cme it is the presence of cystic fluid spaces in fovea which is there because of extracellular fluid accumulation in the outer plexiform and inner nuclear layers which in turn is occurring because of disruption of the either retinal barrier so it is basically a macular retinal vascular edema in response to anterior segment inflammation in the post operative period however you can differentiate it from uveitis by paucity of a robust cellular response in either the anterior or posterior segment and a relatively good vision with good surgical techniques and low surgical time we have a clinical incidence of about 2% however if you do ffa studies in these patients up to 20% of the patients actually show some amount of perifoveal leak so that is called an angiographic positive cme the most important risk factor of a post operative cme is presence of a fakia or a posterior capsular rupture of course if a patient has uveitis diabetic retinopathy epiretinal membranes or retinitis pigmentosa these are the patients who are at a high risk of developing cme there is a variant called autosomal dominant cme the patients become uh, evident in the third or fifth decade and this entity is known to be highly resistant to all forms of treatment the most important thing that we have to know about is there are certain drugs which we routinely use in our practice which are known to increase cme prostaglandins are one such drugs intraocular use of vancomycin or epinephrine during cataract surgery is known to induce cme ritonavir rifabutin and sidofovir which are used in treatment of hiv patients are also known to cause cme tamoxifen used in the treatment of breast cancer nitrofurantoin used in uti treatments and again a lot of patients in 6th or 6th 7th decade they are on multivitamins nicotinic acid or niacin is a very common component of multivitamin tablets and it is also known to cause cme um, usually patients will present with complaint of decreased vision metamorphopsia or decreased contrast in order to clinically diagnose cme you have to have a very high index of suspicion because indirect ophthalmoscopic examination would be largely normal just there will be a dull foveal reflex and it has to be specified that, that a dull foveal reflex after fourth decade is quite common without any intraocular disease so just a dull foveal reflex doesn't account for an indication for getting an oct um of course if you do a detailed slit lamp biomicroscopic examination you can see cystic spaces at fovea thickening of fovea and an altered foveal reflex the most important investigative modality that we have is an oct it is a non invasive technique gives direct evidence of presence of cystic spaces we can estimate retinal thickness which can correlate with visual acuity it can also demonstrate if there is any vitromacular attraction and can be done in small people and media eyes so again as i said a patient of post cataract cme if you do an indirect ophthalmoscopic examination fundus is mostly unremarkable just presence of a dull foveal reflex however when you do an oct you will be able to see cyst in and around fovea and this is an on fast image which shows a very beautiful honeycomb appearance which actually you know kind of confirms its presence if you do a fluorescein angiography you will be able to see a petaloid pattern of hyperfluorescence with pooling in the cystoid spaces however most of the times you don't actually need to do it in today's scenario so here there's a patient of post cataract cme you can actually see some leakage in the perifoveal area but the patient's vision was unaffected it was 6 by 6 so no need, treatment needs to be given of course you have to know about any coexisting conditions such as diabetic macular edema because then your treatment does differ you have to know about the nature of leak it can be either focal or diffuse in case of diabetic macular edema oct can also help us in ruling out presence of any physical traction over retina which is causing this cme so you have to rule out all these things such as erm a vitromacular traction or a thick dot posterior haloid so this was a patient who was referred to us with complaint of diminution of vision around 2 to 3 weeks after cataract surgery if you see the first image you see some amount of perifoveal leak and you can think okay probably this is cme but if you see the second image in the inferior half of the retina there is leakage around the vessels which shows that it is actually a case of early vasculitis and not post cataract cme uh, coming to the treatment if vision is good something on the lines of 6 by 6 partial or 6 by 9 then probably you can just give an nsaid 
if vision is less than equal to 6 by 12, probably the most cost-effective treatment that we have is a PSD injection. It comes in a concentration of around 40 mg per ml, and you can use either 0.5 ml or 1 ml injection. You can also use trimcinolone acetonide as an intravitreal injection. And of course, if there is any contraindication to PSD, such as scleral thinning or patient is predisposed to glaucoma, then you can use these sustained release devices such as Ozodix. Uh, we have to stop any CME-inducing drug. Again, I have to specify prostaglandins. They are very commonly being used nowadays. And often you are treating these patients and, the, uh, and it is the prostaglandin which is causing CME. So you have to stop these medications. If a patient is a known case of retinitis pigmentosa, you have to give oral acetazolamide. And of course, if there is any surgical uh, need, we have to do it accordingly. Of course, uh, we know if there is a coexisting DME or a uveitis, we have to treat it in appropriate fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Saurav, for our going so fast. Just tell us for a cataract surgeon, you know, uh, what would be the uh, uh, suspicion for us to say, oh, this patient may have CME, apart from the people who have a high risk, diabetic, UVI, it is. So the most important thing to focus on is that the vision is not six by six. I would when, not uh, to begin with or not to begin with after the cataract surgery. Of course, before cataract surgery, we are oh, attributing post some sort of vision loss oh, because post-op period. Post-op period. In, uh, in the post-op period. Within uh, first three months. In the first three months, if the vision is not six by six, hmm. then you can probably get an OCT done uh, and look for the presence of any cystoid spaces. No, no, that will come later. Uh, like you, you can have a simple, you know, macular edema. Some patients or a macular thickness. Or you may have a clinical, uh, clinically significant uh, CME in those so cases. Until unless there is some decrease in vision, there is no point of giving okay. them any treatment. So what about uh, prophylaxis, which we all talk about uh, so after cataract surgery? So if a patient is a known case of diabetic macular edema, you obviously have to treat diabetic macular edema first. You have to reduce all amount of edema and then proceed with cataract surgery. If there is, uh, the, if the patient is a known case of uveitis, of course you have to maintain a period of. Uh, disease inactivity for around three months, and then the patient has to be uh, treated under steroid cover. You can use or both oral steroids and topical steroids around three to four days before the surgery, and it has to be continued at least for a week, even if there is no inflammation in the postoperative period. Uh, again, patients of retinitis pigmentosa, you can give them oral acetazolamide to begin with, even in the preoperative period. But uh, yeah, what is your suggestion? Like we always tell our uh, no people. If you are using a premium IOL, use, you know, uh, anti-inflammatory medications like napafenic or brofenic to cover up these patients for a longer period, you know, routine cases. Sir, from a retinal point of view, we would not recommend <laughs> to NSAIDs to be used in every, each and every patient because, uh, quite honestly, there's also a question of permeability in the posterior segment. Most of the studies do say that these NSAIDs permeate in the anterior one-third or anterior half of the vitreous. So giving them in all the cases, irrespective of uh, presence or absence of any so you, you, you think the prophylactic use is not required in these cases? Uh, prophylactic use, it, it's being done, but quite honestly from a retinal no, point of view. It's all teaching to everybody, like use your premium manual, you must use this, you know. Little bit of macular change, your vision can get disrupted. So today, uh, he's saying we should not be using regularly as such. It's uh, for a high risk patient. Yes. Thank you, uh, Krishna. Just for a house, uh, what could be the various reasons for a patient getting unhappy after IOL surgery? Name one or two. Anybody? Yeah. No, no reasons for a patient being unhappy? Sorry? What is he saying? No, no, we have put the wrong, the correct IOL surgery done beautifully. <laughs> Desired. <laughs> no, no, we have put the right correct lenses, desired multifocal, and we have put multifocal. What are the various common reasons for high a expectancy? Expectancy. Anybody? Pre existing Young dry eye disease. Dry eye disease. Anything else? Are yeah, sabse important the photopic symptoms of the IUL kebab. Major concern is the patient seeing rings, halos, poor contrast, these are, and the residual refractive error. And most importantly, as somebody tried to say, I can't see now near, I can see distance. So that is an important part. So just in a th three minutes, take out some important points. Last, last.
So as Sarjah said, the most uh, common causes of patient dissatisfaction after multifocal IL implantation is uh, photic phenomena or blurred vision. And they can be because of dry eye, any residual mild astigmatism or emetropia, structural issues such as IL decentration or a PCO, poor neuro, neuro adaptation and any missed retinal pathology such as uh, ERM macular edema or vitreo macular traction. So in these patients, it's important to perform a very thorough clinical evaluation with the visual acuity. Okay, okay. Next, next. Dry eye evaluation and abrometry and angle alpha. So here we have a case example where a 32-year-old male patient had a multifocal eye in C2 and he complained of glare and halos more while driving at night. His vision both near and distance uncorrected was 66 and N6 and with not any significant refractive error. So as you can see here, there is a mild PCO which is nearly encroaching the 3mm zone and a slight decentration of the eye oil temporally. But on uh, eye trace, we saw that there were raised higher order aberrations internally, but the coma was not that high. So which possibly points out that the decentration is not causing the symptoms per se. Since it's more in the night, it could be the pupil which is causing the glare and halos while he was driving. So we decided to manage the patient conservatively and give him topical bromonitin and he did show improvement. So we decided against uh, yak cap in this case. So photic symptoms are fairly common mostly due to the superimposition of an unfocused image over out of focus image over the focused image in these IOLs and they can be because of the inherent IOL design, lens edge effect, any angle kappa, uh, large angle alpha or kappa, PCO, PC wrinkling, a decentered IOL and of course posterior segment pathology. The incidence is relatively okay, low okay, next, next. with less than 10% and next, it depends next, next. on the type of IOL. So the management should be first step should be observation and the majority of them they resolve in 6 to 12 months. In case if it's pupil related, the meiotics might be a good option. In cases of decentration, if they are resistant to a, a treatment, then you might need to plan a repositioning or an exchange. And intrinsic IL problems, again, you should observe for some time. If the patient is uh, having intractable symptoms, then you may need to undergo an exchange. For PCO, of course, you do need to do a yak cap. Before doing a yak cap, be sure that the symptoms are due to the PCO itself and not due to the lens. Because once you do a yak cap, performing an IL exchange becomes very challenging. So this just, just for a query, how, how do we know that it is halo? Is it, it is, how do we differentiate the halos from the glare? So, so we can ask the patient. So one is that there are... Yeah, what will be there? No symptom. How, yes, how would they present so, to us? Uh, so mostly in the night. So if the patient says that around, around, he can see the headlight and then a ring of light around that, that's more suggestive of halos. Whereas in glare, he'll see a headlight which is just, you know, stretched in to in a, this thing. So that is more suggestive of glare. Also, you have a lot of online simulators. So if you see, there is a glare and halo calculator online. It's a German, com uh, this thing, I think. So there the patient can actually tell you the grade. So we'll tell you this is what it seems to me and you can grade it. You can grade the halos, grade the glare and that gives you a more objective way of uh, assessing it. And then later on, you can see if your treatment is helping it. So there is a glare and halo calculator online okay. available. That's, That's good case. Yeah. So this is a 55-year-old female patient, again, two weeks post uh, multifocal eye implantation. She had a reasonably good near uh, distance and uh, near vision, but she complained of poor visual quality and blurred vision. The eye was well-centered, a nicely done surgery. But if you look at the ocular surface, there is this patchy staining, which is suggestive of dry eye disease. Again, on eye trace, you can see raised corneal uh, higher order aberrations and a raised increased uh, point spread function. So we treated the patient on topical lubricants. And six weeks uh, post-treatment, the surface stabilized. There was a reduction in the aberration and PSF as well as the patient's symptoms. So this is one more scenario where there was a 42-year-old pseudophagic patient with a toric multifocal IL in C2. Now, if you look, the patient uh, had a residual cylinder of minus 0.75 diopter and he complained of blurred vision with contrast and glare. So this patient with a monofocal IL may not have been so symptomatic. And see, the eye trace is uh, asking for a 29-degree rotation with a 0.5-degree which might have been ignored in case of a monofocal IL. But in case of a multifocal IL, the patients, they do not tolerate any amount of residual astigmatism mostly. And in this case, you can consider rotation since you see the cylindrical error is much more than the spherical equivalent. So it might be, uh, you know, respond, uh, responsive to a rotation. So it's a common cause and one of the papers published from our center have found that image-guided surgery provided a better visual quality as opposed to manual marking for toric IOLs. So other management options for residual amyotropia or astigmatism include corneal-based procedures and lens-based such as IL exchange or piggyback IOLs. So to summarize, so multifocal IOLs are generally associated with a very high degree of patient satisfaction and most of them are amenable to conservative management. Very few may require IOL exchange which is just 3 to 7% of the dissatisfied patients as per literature. 
So what is important is a meticulous preoperative workup such that you don't create a uh, unsat uh, dissatisfied patient. So treat any pre uh, OSD, ocular surface disease, do an accurate biometry, aggressive astigmatism control in multifocal eye cases and provide adequate chair time to the patient where you counsel him regarding the possible side effects after surgery. Intraoperatively, a meticulous surgical technique and postoperatively, you should focus on finding out the cause by doing a thorough workup for the patient. Thank you. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Sri Devi. Uh, I think we, what we thought, it, she covered all those areas. One of the important things is a residual refractive error. That is the major cause of a blur vision for many, many patients. And toric eye will, you may have option of a rotation or you may have to do a patch up in a cornea also sometimes to get rid of a little cylinder in these patients. But classically in the Indian scenario, we are not looking for dry eyes. The age group uh, which patients are undergoing cataract surgery may have dry eye as such in more than 50% of cases. And that will increase subsequently after surgery, in the beginning also and towards, uh, towards the later half of our follow-up also. If we take care of a dry eye in these patients, majority of patients will be quite comfortable. In fact, we don't check that. We don't ask questions of dry eye related things to our patient. Then subsequently blame the surgery for a increase in their symptoms. So that part you have to look into. Uh, always must stain your ocular surface for every cataract patient. So that will give you so much of details. Not after surgery, before surgery. And other things he nicely covered. Uh, one thing I would like to ask, you know, uh, maybe Parful or Namata can answer. Like what about that, you know, uh, anterior, what do you call, reverse capture of IOL, is it practicable in our scenario? And what about the uh, innovative ring, uh, which uh, uh, Prakhyat had uh, devised? Number three, please. Andy Ring uh, did give good results and he is going to publish that paper very soon, which was his innovation, which is, which is a ring, which, which is actually open in the center. So all you do it, you put it inside and it kind of shortens up the capsule. So the edge defect which causes the photic phenomena that is taken care of. Okay. People also do YAG for this, uh, the I peripheral edge. Yeah, correct. Actually, that negative photoptic uh, things, it doesn't go off, you know. Positive may, you know, slowly, slowly patient can get adapted to. A negative is basically the edge of a lens which is getting, you know, uh, the light getting uh, scattered, the image getting distorted from there. And this is more true for a 360 degree square edge lenses. The square edge is, even in a optic haptic junction, you have a square edge also, which is the modern day lenses. And these are definitely, yes, they prevent the cellular migration, but they have a higher chances of uh, uh, having this uh, uh, photoptic symptoms. That's why people have said, if you shift the lens little anterior, the symptoms might go off. Or people have devised various rings, which can decrease this scattering happening from this peripheral area of uh, uh, refraction happening to the edge of uh, lens in these cases. Yeah, capsulotomy may or may not be answer because that may not uh, take away the symptom patient have in these cases. And there's a debate going on of an anterior capsular polishing also. So people like to uh, leave a, some sort of a fibrotic area in an axis that is three nine o'clock axis, which is the major area of uh, having these images coming from. If that is fibrous, maybe the light uh, doesn't get you know reflected that much in these cases. But uh, difficult to say which patient have will have symptom, which patient may not have symptom, and sometimes patients psychologically you know they perceive these things, which is the importance of uh, pre-op uh, counseling these patients. We keep telling multifocal lens, you'll definitely see the you know rings and halos, and they have that in mind, and immediately post up they look for that and they start seeing that. So if you <laughs> Like there was a time in you know, 80s and 90s, uh, counseling for patients for IOL was so difficult. They said, no, 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 I'll not get IOL done because they used to think it will create a complication. Today, we don't have to say anything. Patient, we also think the surgery for cataract is IOL. The same things would happen with these multifocal lenses. We should not say them this is going to be associated with these problems. Therefore, the lens design should improve so much, these symptoms become a very minimal for patients. You don't have to tell them, okay, you'll have this. So mentally, you are, uh, you know that nothing will happen to you. Okay. Any questions before we uh, break for the lunch? So the lunch ke baad hoga na, So we have the you know wet lab session for a people who are interested to do a 
wet lab training in a uh, goat side and uh, people, people can have there. We have the people to support you there also. That will open after the lunch. So you can go by batch by batch, have a discussion. We can have a discussion there also. And uh, if possible, some of the videos can be run and you can see the videos again and each point can be discussed. And uh, Dr. Amar is our uh, main person handling that area. Where is he, Amar? He'll be there. But our SRs and uh, the, the faculty will assist all of you. Okay, thank you again for uh, being uh, in this uh, session of uh, refractive and cataract session. Hope that you have learned some points from our uh, people who have presented uh, today's thing. And we are always open for discussion. You can uh, give us a query, questions, and come to our wet lab. Those people who have registered today, they can come to our wet lab some other time also. Okay, uh, just sit, we'll take a photo. Photographer, can you get a photo? Thank you, we will wait Can our senior residents and faculty and our old alumni please come for a photograph? Thank you. 